was. I'm waiting for Michelle to sit down. <laughs> All right, board members, it is time to get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Tuesday, October 18th work session here today. We will um, begin our talk with strategic planning. That will go from 10 to 1230. We will have a break from 1230 to 1. And then we will have our committee reports from 1 till 4 this afternoon. Uh, I appreciate you all being here in person. And before I begin, um, Ms. Keys Gamara has submitted a written request to virtually attend today's work session. Are those all those in favor of approving this request? All right, and that is unanimous from everyone here at the table. So Dr. Reed is going to lead us through this first work session. If you have questions, please uh, look at me and I will take those down. So as we proceed, um, I can manage uh, the workflow for her in that way. Good morning, Dr. Reed. Good morning, Ms. Darnat Kovacs. And I was just realizing I don't have the fuzzy thing on my microphone, so it looked like a little different. You know how like you normally touch the fuzzy thing? I don't know if it's changing my voice, but I think we're okay. I'm sorry for answering. You sound I good. Think, I think it works. Um, anyhow, so uh, it is my real pleasure this morning to have a session or start our morning on the strategic plan. Um, and really, this is going to be about framing the work plan and making sure that as we launch, because this is really our last opportunity to look at framing dates, calendar, um, and kind of the approach we're taking to the strategic plan. And then we're starting to move. And it's going to be really exciting, I think. So um, I have asked uh, Marcy Neal to join us. She's uh, working with our project manager on this, as well as coordinating with Mutu and his team for data and so forth. So um, at this point, I think in your blue uh, folder that I provided you, um, Exhibit A, which is, or Attachment A, or however you want to characterize that, um, is going to be the PowerPoint Mutu is going to be speaking from. And um, in an effort to be um, cost effective, we decided that for an hour this morning, Mutu would zoom in rather than be here in person from Oakland. So anyhow, I'm going to turn it over to Mutu. So if, and Kenneth Jones is here to join us as well. Good morning, Kenneth. Um, and Lisa Williams had a conflict this morning, is not able to join us. But Kenneth is joining us from uh, Little Rock, right, Kenneth? Correct. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, Mutu, why don't you go ahead and start? And then, Ms. Darnat Kovacs, if you want to uh, facilitate any kind of questions that the board might have for Mutu, um, and then we'll work um, kind of through that. So, absolutely. Thank you. All right, Mutu, it's yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all again virtually. Uh, I want to begin by just really giving kudos to the uh, division folks we've worked with so far. We've probably interacted with about you know, 20, 30 different folks fairly regularly in the past month. They come from uh, different parts of the division, different organization. But one thing that I can say with uh, absolute certainty is that uh, each one of them has been really stellar. Um, you know, it's you, you hire well, you have really, really great folks, and it's been a pleasure working with all of them. I want to give a special sh shout out to uh, Marcy. So if there's one person that's been, you know, uh, Grand Central Station for the work at this point, I would say it's, it's Marcy, and I want to just publicly commend, commend her. My team is having a lot of fun, and I really believe that we can do, we all of us can do some really great things together. 
the strategic planning is not just a paper exercise. It's not about, you know, fancy what's on paper. It's there's a, what I call a, a, a spirit, uh, a heart to the uh, real intent behind strategic planning. And uh, we've enjoyed it so far, really being on the same page with you about how you see this work uh, and the way my team happens to see it also. So if I could share my screen, the, uh, please, let's see, is this disabled? Okay, what do I need to do to share my screen, please? We are working on it this second, Mutu. Oh, got it, we got it now. Okay, thank you. So the, this should take no more than an hour, but if it needs to, that'll be fine also. They asked, uh, Dr. Reed mentioned, we've at a point now in the process where we have a path forward and it's a calendar that really brings that into a uh, sharp focus. So we wanna spend some time uh, taking you through how we're thinking about engaging diverse voices and perspectives, and then what we have in mind around the uh, calendar. There are a couple of areas where we will need direct feedback from you. We've, uh, we're planning about, I think it's a total of 15 community forums, and we want to hear from the board members how you would like how you would like those to proceed. So that's a very specific ask we have of you today. So I'm, the second slide in your uh, packet is one we'd like to talk about, the what's in a circle. And it's always putting our role in perspective, my team's role. We pride ourselves on being facilitator. Uh, what a, a facilitator does is to guide, not to command or control. Uh, it wouldn't work anyway. But uh, a facilitator also does direct, leaving it up to you to choose to follow or not. So as we build the relationship with the division, it's very important for you to keep in mind that you are in the driver's seat. Ultimately, you make the final determination. What we ask for is the latitude or the freedom to suggest things as we see it. But in, uh, at the end of the day, it's what makes sense to our client that carries the day. Uh, today, we're going to, uh, I always put back my slide about, you know, how the children uh, just like to have, have each one of you take a few seconds to, uh, you know, re reflect on that. And then also, how's the rest of the organization doing? So today, the first two parts, would be stuff you've seen before, as they are calling our context setting um, slides. The real work today is item number three, that's the planning calendar. And then we have some path forward, some milestones for October and November. And again, that's just FYI, but we, we can, we'll be more than happy to take your questions or suggestions for us. So as you may recall, we said last time when we met in September that planning is about alignment. It's about getting all those arrows going in the same direction towards common goals. No arrow has to give up its essence. It just needs to align itself with all the other arrows. So we're not asking people through this process to make sacrifices, but rather for all of us, you know, people with good intentions to come to the table with the sole purpose of um, articulating a vision and a roadmap for ensuring success for every student without exception. And that is certainly something that's within uh, uh, power to influence and control. Uh, at least that's what we believe. There are uh, seven stages, seven phases to the uh, planning process. We currently at phase, we're doing phase one and phase two concurrently. Uh, phase one is about making sure we get up to all the touch points, get folks involved, communicate with the stakeholders, you know, basically just mobilize the entire community internally and externally. And Dr. Reed and Marcy might be able to speak to some of the things going on there. Uh, phase two, it's the assessment of current state. A lot of work going on around collecting data about student learning and achievement. And we also plan some surveys of students, which I will speak to 
a little a little later on. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you can see the dates we have, the approximate dates we have in mind in the last column on this slide. The goal is still to have something that's ready for the board to take action on by May 9th. And there's no, nothing has come up yet to make us feel that we cannot meet that deadline. If things change, we'll let you know, but we feel fairly confident that by May 9th, we'll have the plan ready. We, all of us, will have it ready. The two organizing uh, frameworks, well, uh, graphic organizers for the planning process. This is the overarching one. We, the process asks four questions. What data do we have? What does the data say? Why does the data look that way? And what are we going to do about it? So it's really this that we take every group through. Uh, every stakeholder group that participates in our process experiences all four, but they experience them at different levels of detail. You know, certainly someone who only puts in, only has a chance to attend a two hour community forum wouldn't get as deeply involved as someone on the core planning team who puts five days into it. But every group gets to experience the, the four phases. The, the last phase, the solution phase, if you were to blow that out, this is the essence of the plan. So when we're done, those bullets on the far right will be things I will have addressed. It's not uncommon as we go through the work with the clients for the client to choose to move things around, call them by different names and so on. So we're not stuck. Uh, we, we're not going to insist that you use the same terminology as long as we're clear about the, the meaning of each one of those ideas. So we start with circle number one. It's always about the kids first. And with circle number one, we don't care about what the adults have to do, how the adults feel, not yet. It's all about outcomes for students or student experiences. And that begins with clarifying equity principles, um, what we call a promise. And I think of the promise as a, a short, highly focused uh, sense of the mission, the vision, and our core values. If you were to distill those three ideas into something no more than 25 words, what would that be? And we want to express it in terms of a promise that we, the adults, are making to all the uh, students in the division. The portrait of a graduate, it's already done. It's here for reference. And then we'll do the goals and the measures of student progress. And after the strategic plan is completed, we'll come back, or the superintendent will come back and uh, propose some specific performance benchmarks. Sometimes we call those excellence targets. So that's circle number one, all about student learning. Circle number two and circle number three are really both about what the adults have to do well in order for us to get all the students home. But we separate, we put circle two a little bit ahead of everything else, all the other adults, because the real magic happens when student, teacher, and content come together. In other words, it's the quality of teaching, it's the quality of instruction, that is the strongest driver of the student learning emphasis that we'll have. So that's why we, we pull it out. Uh, I look at ahead of circle number three, which is about the infrastructure to support instruction so that we can get all kids home. So the order of these three circles is really very key. Um, and that's what we, we mean when we talk about keeping the ends and means in proper sequence. The only end that really matter with circle number one, what happens for and two kids and everything else are means to that end. And it's important to always keep the, uh, the two in proper sequence. So what do we have in terms of engaging uh, stakeholders? The, uh, Dr. Reed made this statement in passing um, many, many weeks ago, and it, it really stuck with me. And it's one thing one we're adhering to. How do we cast a really wide net, but have a really tight process? Uh, I'm not at a point yet to say we nailed it down 100 percent. The jury's still out, but it's it's a principle, it's it's a it's a guiding principle that we keep in mind. 
engaging, I mean, literally tens of thousands of people in this, in this process, but make, making it not look sloppy, make it really, uh, really, really tight. And so far, you know, I think we're working our way through it. No major concerns, but it's, it's, a, it's a nice sentiment to keep in mind. So we about the um, set of different planning teams. As I said a few moments ago, everyone really gets to participate in every part of the graphic organizer, but they do so at different levels. So in that sense, there's no hierarchy in terms of what any of these teams can be exposed to. There's no team that's higher than or that will be doing something that is hidden or kept away from any other group. Everybody will have access to everything that's going on. Again, it's the intensity of, uh, of the effort that varies from different groups. And the model that we use tries to move all of these pieces along at the same time so that nobody has to wait forever before they know what the answer is or what the real plan is. And so the construction of the teams begins with what we call a core planning team that could have uh, 80 to 200 people. We don't quite know that yet. And maybe I'll ask uh, Marcy to speak to that later on, but that's the largest, uh, probably the largest team and the core planning team is the one that will make sure that all the pieces come together. Sometimes the core planning team is the original, the originator of what we take out. Other times it's an integrator of what, what comes back from the other groups. Then uh, roughly at a 12 o'clock position, we have the student voice. The students in this case actually get to participate in three way at three levels. And by the time we're done, I would say at least 100,000 of the 187,000 students in the district will have had a, a very direct chance to tell us what they think. And again, I'll say more about that later on. So we have the student voice team. Um, I think it was um, Ms. McLaughlin that suggested this last time with the concurrence of our colleagues. We've never had a separate family team before. We've always thought about the family team as part of the community forum, but you all made a compelling case that we should have a strand just for families. And so we've built that into it and we actually have four, four sessions planned. Again, I'll say more, more about the uh, details on the next slide. Now, all the work we do will be going to every school and department in the district long before the plan is done. So that's a reality check. The alignment team, I uh, refer to them tongue in cheek as the movers and shakers. So these are your external partners uh, that vary from the you know, local government to the homeowners association, to the military, to the equity groups. So think of these as, think of the alignment team as the partners we need to make things happen. So they're both they're mostly external partners. And the, uh, we also highly recommend that at least one board member be a member of the alignment team. Uh, this one with the faith community is also a, a new one. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Reed to maybe say a few words about the central, why, why you feel that this is central. Thanks, Mutu. Um, I'm pulling together a group of faith leaders across the community, honestly, um, and they have, um, I think, a unique perspective as well as a large group of um, uh, people from which they interact. And we just feel like uh, in the past, it's a group I have added, and it's added a really um, interesting, I think, um, and another perspective. We've at times... Um, as we, because sometimes we also check progress with our external community stakeholder groups, and we've occasionally put uh, different leaders within alignment, um, but we find that we, because of the size in this division, it would be an unwieldy group to be representative of all perspectives, even though we would want perspectives from each, of, from example, for example, from the faith groups in alignment and in the um, 
core team. So they're not um, exclusive, but it's an opportunity to have more voices at the table. Um, and I know, uh, yeah, so that's our thinking early on. But again, that's the purpose of this morning's meeting is to make sure that this structure works for everyone around the table. Uh, because as I said, once we launch, we launch. So um, Lisa, did you want to add anything? I asked Dr. King and Ms. Hall to join us at the table as well because they've been working closely on the community engagement um, ideas and gathering lists of community groups um, and making sure we're really grounded in our um, justice-centered approach to not just the outcome of our strategic planning, but also how we process our strategic plan needs to be really justice-centered. So I don't know if either of you have a comment on the addition of that group. So can if it's green, we can hear you. It is and if it's close green. to you, it is now green. Um, so we are continuing to build that list out of uh, community organizations. You all saw the initial um, list of groups, and I think uh, we also invited board members to contribute to that list uh, wherever they saw holes, whether it's in their uh, magisterial district or throughout the, the region. Um, we are also building a list of faith-based uh, community leaders um, and I think Nardis is, is your, I think your team is working as well on this. Yes, you know, in this role, I've been dealing um, or communicating and working with a lot of faith-based leaders. They have, a, like Dr. Reed said, a unique um, perspective and an important one to our community. And so I'm glad that we've given them their own affinity group to uh, bring their voices loud and proud to this process. And so one question that I wanted to ask the board today, we had originally asked the board for, um, as part of the feedback form um, to the last retreat to give us additional suggestions for um, organizations and, and additions for the list. And I think it may have gotten lost, you know, in the translation. And so I don't know if we want to finish the presentation for now and then we revisit in the question and answer portion of, um, of this time together. But I'd like to work out with the board how we can collect your feedback of different um, organizations and, and additions to the list and we develop a process of collecting the information for the board. Because we recognize that this is not a complete list and we want to collect your suggestions and feedback. But I don't think now is the time we want to finish the presentation right. I, first. I, I agree, Dr. Ivy, and I think because you can hear there's there's lots of conversation because I think that was lost, and that's very important for us to figure out the best way to do that because it is a it's a big comprehensive list and which how can we play a role? So yes, board members, if we'll just I'm assuming a, a list right now of questions, and I'm sure that will garner many. All right, please go ahead. Thank you. Then the, we, we meet weekly with the superintendent's leadership team uh, for about a half hour. And what that provides us, it's making sure that all the key uh, leaders and managers in the division uh, up to speed. We, we met yesterday for the update. The community forum is one I would like to spend some time on with the board because we see you all as you know, helping make that happen. About 15, a total of 15 are planned. There's some specific questions that I'd like to ask you uh, a little bit later on. The uh, Mutu, board. Mutu, can I just pause you just for a quick second? The, the superintendent leadership team, just for the board's knowledge, is really the cabinet. So it's all those that are direct reports to me. And we've added our regional assistant superintendents so that um, everybody, like there's a division-wide perspective and look at that. So that group is much larger than the few people that are here. I've asked a few people here at the table because they've done really the lion's share of a lot of the connecting with Mutu on this. So I feel I can help with that, so. Great, thank you. And but of course, the board updates, we anticipate that will be ongoing also. Uh, there are eight 
meetings uh, between now and end of May. And uh, our hope is that at each one of those meetings, uh, whether it's for five minutes or for two and a half hours, there'll be an update to the board. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Reed again to talk about uh, the engagement of uh, principals and, and administrators that actually came about uh, yesterday. Uh, typically, we take them along, um, but there's a, a special effort that's been made for this next, next Monday around how to engage them uh, with the process. Uh, Dr. Reed? Yes, we are taking advantage of the um, work day Monday morning at 8 o'clock. We're going to meet with principals to outline the process. And we are so excited, honestly, about our principal leadership in this work. We recognize the key role our principals have. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about the survey windows. And then there will be subsequent training for principals to facilitate um, both staff and student focus groups at their site, with our intent being that every student grades 3 through 12 and every staff member in the division will have an opportunity to weigh in on the strategic plan regardless of their role as an employee in the division. So um, we also have heard from several uh, stakeholders how important it is to have students take the survey at school. Um, it's, we've made it as tight as possible. I know Marcy and the team and Mutu's team, uh, Dr. Ivy, folks have really worked in Gotham, Sethi, have really worked hard to create like a tight, I think 10 minutes is what we're talking about for the student survey. There have been a lot of eyes on that so that uh, the intent, again, wide net tight process. So um, principles will be key to the success of this work. Thanks, Mutu. Thank you. And then the last thing to touch on is the instructional focus team. Uh, in the past, the I'm, I'm smiling because the, this is the third thing that's really unique to um, the division. And so we're learning a lot from really working with all of you. Uh, traditionally, we've, the instructional focus team for us has always been about the uh, teachers, coaches, ed services types, and so on. But I recall from last month's board meeting, uh, some of you made the case for having not just the educators, but also the non-educators as part of the instructional focus team. And we think that's a really fresh way to go. Uh, so the majority of the folks on that team will still be teachers, coaches, facilitators, and so on. But we're excited about what, how the conversa conversation will evolve if we have parents or caregivers, if we have some of your educational partners, maybe some of the higher ed people uh, as part of that instruction focus team. So that's a, an enhancement to the experience for us. And I'm looking forward to see how that shapes up. So as you can see, uh, there's everyone in every uh, resident of the area that the division covers will have at least one uh, two, some may have two or three or four opportunities to engage uh, in the process. And we remain open to, you know, sometimes say, you know, shift happens, you know, that's an F there. You know, the best laid plans sometimes need to be adjusted. Um, our process really, allow, it's flexible enough that if we need to pivot or make some changes along the way, we're more than happy to do that. No. Mutu, so we'll, let me, can yes, we go please. back to that slide for a quick second? I just want um, the board to know we have, for each of those committees, there's a champion that sits on cabinet that's going to be the point back to the hub. So if you think about um, the hub, <laughs> um, that core planning team and also cabinet. So um, in each area, for example, the core planning team, I think Francis, we were thinking about Francis, obviously, as being a champion, and I know Marcy, we've reviewed it, is speaking to each of the champions. We're um, identifying they're all different. No one is championing two, uh, because we really need that focus on that part of the planning, and then they're responsible to come back and deliver on timelines, deadlines, and they're part of the key piece that you saw in the project plan in the Monday letter. So just want to be clear that those are not disconnected groups. They all come back to the whole every week, 
Monday at one o'clock for a half hour touch base with the team. So nothing will get off the rails. Um, it's designed to keep the process tight weekly uh, moving forward till we're complete. Thanks, Machu. Thank you. I'm gonna ask um, Marcy in a few moments to say more about the principal-led conversation and the, uh, the survey, just give us more updates. The, uh, we call this levels of stakeholder engagement. For the students, there'll be three touch points, at least three opportunities. One will be at each school, the principal will lead a conversation. It's a structured conversation with, the, uh, with all their students. If you're interested in what, what that looks like, I can go into more detail later on. So each school will get a chance to engage in this series of three questions and a focus group led by the principal. Uh, some schools are thinking of having more than just one group of students participate in those conversations. Then all students, except those who opt out, of course, in grades three through 12, will get a chance to complete the online survey. It, won't, it wouldn't take more than 15 minutes uh, for them to get that done. And then we will also convene uh, a division-wide team of students who will stay with the process from beginning in January all the way to May. The school level conversation and the survey will all be done next month. They, be, they should be done by the first week in November. But the division-wide team, uh, think of those as a group of 20, maybe 30 students who will have their hands and their feet and their eyes on the whole process. So everything that the adults are generating or going through, the students get a chance to weigh in as well. But we will keep them as an affinity group. Uh, just the kids giving us feedback on, on the work. And we're planning about four to six sessions. We don't have all the dates picked yet, but we'll meet with those students about four to six times. The core planning team will, uh, when it's done, we'll end up spending five full day sessions. The first one, it's a two day, two consecutive days on November 30th and December 1st. So just about six, seven weeks away. And as you recall, it's a very diverse group of, of anywhere between 80, possibly as many as uh, a couple of hundred people. The instructional focus team will be four full days and they too start with two consecutive days. Well, they're not, I guess they are cons consecutive. It'll be a Friday and a Monday. December 2nd is their first meeting and December 5th is the second uh, meeting. Uh, family team, we've planned uh, four three-hour sessions uh, in order to have, you know, equity of, of voice and participation. We feel that we should uh, schedule those meetings as a mix of weekday and Saturday meetings. Now, we don't want anyone to be uh, structurally excluded from participating by insisting that they come during the weekday. So what we're thinking about is, is again, a mix, a mix of our maybe three hour sessions on some weekday and a couple of Saturdays. Uh, we've touched on the schools and departments already and the administration team. The alignment team, those people that I call movers and shakers, we have four meetings scheduled each two hours. Those will be evening meetings. Uh, the board will be monthly status update. Community forums, um, we're planning, we're proposing nine of the 15 to be by magisterial district and six to be at large. Again, I'll say more in a few moments. And uh, then for the fifth community, we, we've added two and then we meet weekly with the superintendency. So uh, these could change, that could evolve as we, uh, you know, as we go through and we open to adjusting to those changes. I'm going to ask Marcy now to just share a little bit more about the uh, principal-led piece and the survey. Uh, Marcy? Thanks, Mutu. I'll um, start with the survey. So you should have received an update in the Monday letter on the survey timelines. There'll be information going out um, in FCPS News and FCPS this week so we can um, make sure our community and our teachers are aware of the forthcoming survey. 
Um, there'll be an e-notify that goes out centrally to all of our families to give them directions about um, opting out. They'll have access to the survey, translated versions of the survey that's all being built onto our website um, that will be um, posted by tomorrow. Um, so the opt-out the um, opt -out notification and the survey information will go out on Friday, this Friday, October 21st, and the window um, for survey administration will be November 2nd through November 18th. So we've asked principals to identify a time during the day that they can administer the 10 to 15 minute survey. Um, we've recommended to secondary schools that they consider looking at their advisory periods as an opportunity to do that. And the elementary schools can look at what the best window of time would be for their students. And our parents will have the opportunity if they choose to opt out of the survey to do that either through um, SIS or through paper if they want to return that um, paper opt out option. The principal facilitated discussion, we'll be talking with the principals at, um, about that on Monday at their kickoff meeting. Um, that's an activity they'll be engaging in um, between the beginning of November and by no later than December 2nd. So they have some flexibility in determining what day works best for their school. It will be some something between a 45 minute to a 90 minute structured conversation that they'll have with um, somewhere between 15 and 20 students in their school um, that represent the diversity of their student body. And we're working with Mutu's team on some loose type parameters to help principals. Um, so some principals may choose to have three smaller focus groups with five kids each. Some principals may choose to have all the students in together. So um, we're creating those loose type parameters right now. And then we'll have some training for principals, likely the first week of November. We're confirming those dates as well. Mutu, did I miss anything? Nope, that was great. That's great, thank you. Okay. All right, so the calendar. We have, um, have you know, th three slides. It just shows you the layout for- Mutu, Mutu if you wanna yes. hold for just a minute, it's attachment B in your blue folder. Thank you, Carl. Um, or if you've already put it in your notebook, it's attachment B. I just wanna make sure they have the page that you're speaking from, Mutu. Yes. Um, can you see my screen still? Yes. Okay, it's a, in my PowerPoint, it's slide 16 in the PowerPoint. Um, but I, do you, do you're, you also you're right, have, Mutu, just, that's what we have in our packet. It's slides 16, 17, and 18. And 18, yeah, okay, that's correct, great. I can, you can see for many of these, we have, uh, you know, from dates and time already proposed. And the, uh, no major questions uh, on these yet. This is where we need the board to uh, weigh in the highlighted ones uh, for the community forums. As with every other group, we feel it's important to get every stakeholder group engaged at the front end of the process, long before we've too far down the chute. And then to come back at some point, mid process or like two thirds of the way home to do what we call the reality check, you know, phase four, where we ask the question, is everyone still with us? Remember phase one is, is everyone ready to go? And then phase four, is everyone still with us? So we're looking for, we're proposing two uh, opportunities for interactions with a larger community. Again, one very close to the December, January timeframe. And then the second one, probably around late February, March, uh, no, no, no later than late March. So as you look at these dates, you see that uh, we have January 30th and the 31st and February uh, 2nd for, we're proposing those for the magisterial districts. And then we don't have firm dates yet, partly because of the structure of the, um, the partly because of the nature of the at large, but I will need three dates for at large early in the process also. So the TBD for the at large will be, uh, needs to be early enough in the process. Okay. Now they, we've thought about maybe doing some of the at large, uh, like having just say one session, one of those three will be for Spanish speaking uh, families, for example, since they make up about a third of our student body. Or maybe we just have some other kind of configuration. Again, this is where we, we need to hear from you about what you think works best. Works best. 
We also would like to hear from you about how, what you feel makes sense uh, at the magisterial level and also at large. Is it virtual meetings? Is it on-site? Uh, either of those options is fair game. Then the, the second uh, touch point for the community forum, we're proposing just three at large, and those will happen sometime in mid to late March. So a set of dates early in the process, and then a set of dates um, like two thirds of the way through. So I'm, I'm going to pause there for your questions and comments, please. Do you want the questions and comments in general or just on this calendar right now, Mutu? On the calendar right now, please. Okay. So how do board members feel about the, um, I, uh, the idea of community forums by magisterial district? And have you, you have a, a preference for virtual versus on-site? And any other questions? you have about the calendar. Okay, I'm getting some board members now putting their hands up. I have um, Mr. Frisch, followed by Dr. Anderson, followed by Ms. McLaughlin, and then Ms. Corbett Sanders. All right, Mr. Frisch. Thank you. Um, how will we make sure that the magisterial town halls are focused on community members from those magisterial districts? And what will we do to make sure that the six at large town halls are not the same people um, each time they erupt together? So um, I think that's a great question, Mr. Frisch. One of the, and I'll share with you that um, when we started the community conversation scheduling with all the pyramids, uh, initially we talked about just sending an email or text to the families in that pyramid. But then we began to hear from families that they couldn't make that night, right, like that one night. So we then began to just send the pyramid invitations to everybody in the division, although we said it was like the Madison pyramid. But I have found that I, there are people, we'd rather have them come for a night than not come because they couldn't hit that one night. So I think for the magisterial meetings, that's a conversation I think we could um, I know globally, and I asked Helen to join us around those um, sort of more technical details around how do we, because that's where we started, I know Helen, when we talked about the pyramid meetings, I think we could, we have the technology to send those sort of targeted emails to your individual magisterial districts, if that's a preference. Um, and I just wonder, we also ended up deciding to put a web presence of all, like the calendar of all the meetings, so somebody could go on and go, oh, you know, I've got a soccer game this night or a concert that night, but I could go this night. And it's been interesting, I was looking at Ms. Corbett Sanders, we actually had a parent one, at the, one of the pyramids we attend, one of the meetings that were talking about a different pyramid, um, and a parent popped up in the back saying, well, I'm from that pyramid. So it turned into kind of a little bit of a, a moment. But that's, we can do that in a direct note, and, but there's a pro and con to that. So I think that's something I would, I, but that's why we're talking about it this morning. What's your preference? I never turn my microphone off. <laughs> I feel like with with uh, the number of at-large town halls, that that kind of negates the need for opening the magisterials up to anybody who wants to attend. I would hate to dilute the voices of Providence community members mm -hmm. with people who don't live in Providence, especially knowing that there are six other opportunities for people to participate um, in other town halls. My preference would be that the registration process for the magisterials um, require residency in or students who attend schools in mm -hmm. that magisterial. We have that data. It should not be yeah. difficult to do. Um, as for the at-large town halls, I'd be interested to know how we can shape those conversations so that they're not being monopolized by the same voices mm -hmm. meeting over meeting over meeting. Because if a family is, you know, struggling to find a time to go, um, it would be unfortunate if the time that they have to participate in the in the function mm -hmm. is monopolized by people who have already participated either in their magisterial or their magisterial and three of the other at-large meetings. I To Mr. Frisch's point, I think that makes a lot of sense because we didn't, for the community conversations, we didn't have at-large groups. So I think that, and I think our plan is three in person and three virtual. 
or something along those lines. We're going to discuss that further. But the one question I have, so I think that I would agree with that. The question I have is how do we better communicate to our non-parents? Because for the community conversations, I, you know, I, I was really looking for student parent staff voice and the community that was aware, but I, I don't know what ideas we have for your magisterial, right? Like how do we get emails out to business owners, uh, people who are here without children, or do you know what I'm saying? Like Sounds just like the a, community. I know that Helen has done work on that around uh, renovation projects, for example. Yes. For a school board member, it's a perfect opportunity to work with our counterparts on the Board of Supervisors to Great get idea. to the HOAs and, and uh, business groups and uh, community organizations, uh, knowing, of course, that that misses a lot of people anyways, but it's a starting point. Yeah, and if, so thank you. If I could just add as well, Mr. Frisch. So, um, Absolutely, working with your counterparts is going to be critical on this. They have their list for their newsletters, and so it's really important that we put our content out in their newsletters, and it's collaborative in that process. The other option is that, you know, with the with the postcard option, with the superintendent conversations, we were a little late to the game, and also it was kind of be going to be um, probably a, a little less um, value in terms of what we were going to get back. But a strategic plan is really touches every single person across this county. Um, whether you're a business owner, whether you're just a taxpayer, whether you, you know, every single person needs to be involved in that strategic plan because schools have so much of an impact on the county and its economics. So, you know, I think that probably in this situation, we might want to look for that postcard option too. We have the time before those community sessions. I think that's one thing. The other thing I really want to talk about is our increased multilingual engagement so that we are reaching these families. So, this week, last week, last week, we launched a Korean Facebook page, for example. Within, um, within 24 hours, I think we had 285 subscribers. We've been out in, um, in stores, in, in supermarkets, in, um, in libraries and in rec centers with our flyers, uh, dropping the, the, the note in Korean for this uh, Facebook page as well. And our Spanish uh, language team as well, although it's not translation, remember, it's just, a, it's just outreach, Spanish outreach team are phenomenal. And they've also been doing similar work, um, which has seen our engagement levels increase exponentially since they came on board in January, thanks to ESSA funding. Um, one of those, um, one of the, the uh, community meetings we're looking to do potentially, and I have, I'm not sure about the confirmation this yet, but potentially only in, like leading in Spanish. So you have your session in Spanish. You hold it in Spanish with English interpretation, right? So you're doing it in reverse. So you're making sure that our community, which we have around 17% um, of, our, of our community prefer to get their communications in Spanish, which is huge for us. And we particularly, we look at our, our demographics of our students too, but that language preference is really critical. That says that unless we're communicating directly in Spanish, we're not actually reaching those communities. So that is going to be another way that we'll do it. And then obviously we'll look at that Korean piece as well, but uh, particularly in Spanish, that's where our outreach has, has gone. So. <laughs> I would also advocate that the magisterial meetings should be hybrid in their approach, if at all possible, for people who cannot attend um, in person. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Dr. Anderson. Um, thank you. I definitely want to echo what Mr. Frisch just shared, that the magisterial um, meetings be targeted and really focused, uh, because I am concerned about those voices being dampened. Um, particularly in, in my district of Mason. And I also want to echo that I think we should have virtual and in-person opportunities. And you kind of got ahead of me a little bit. I was going to ask, is there a possibility to have those meetings in those native languages and then have the translation be in English? It just serves a slightly different purpose. And we've had some of our PTOs and PTAs in Mason who've done this, and they've had really great results. Um, 
I want to make sure that we are hitting the top languages of those magisterial districts. I know in Mason District, it's Spanish, it's Arabic, it's Korean, it's Vietnamese. Um, I, I know that data exists because I have it someplace for my little slice of Fairfax County. So I would make sure that we are being strategic in the languages in which we are translating as well as the languages that we are offering the meetings in. Um, very excited to hear about what you just talked about with the Korean Facebook page. I imagine we already have the Spanish Facebook page, and you'll be launching an Arabic Facebook page very shortly. We are looking into <laughs> it. And Vietnamese, I'm going to throw that back in. What I didn't hear um, is how are we using the family liaisons who do engage so meaningfully with the families that we are trying to reach. So that's one. The second piece that I didn't hear, because we want to not have anyone be excluded by all of the variables that Mutu shared, I didn't hear how we were going to communicate the importance of this work and the opportunities for participation in ways that were not just written. It's a great question. Yes, it is a great question. Okay, so let me address the family liaisons first. Firstly, we collaborate cl really closely with the family liaisons and, that, and their team. We work with, uh, through Renee and her team to make sure that we create toolkits for the family liaisons where every, all the content is already pre-translated. You've got your video clips done into multiple languages so that you're not having to create the content yourself. And then Renee helps us get that message out about what is important and how, it's, how the importance of that in her communications when she connects with them. So we provide the content for them. Renee adds that weight of importance and that ask um, because it's obviously her team, right? But the collaboration is really, really important and we're see already seeing it, it work differently. Um, what, I, what I would say is that when we look at a, say for a magisterial district or a school, um, like I know we, we touched on Glasgow recently, we look at the demographics of that district or of that school and we make sure that we are getting to that community in the ways that they need to connect. And that is something that, thanks again to ESSA funding, we are doing very differently uh, with our team, which is really much more 360 at the moment, um, more creative and able to, um, to, really, to really look at those needs and, um, and, and to address them. I'm gonna give you a quick example. So um, last week, we did a training session for the um, family liaisons and the people that are doing some of the newsletter content in schools. Um, this is our multilingual engagement team did. And they just gave them some ideas around how they could create their content in, um, in different languages through video, right? Through video content, recording of maybe the content that they've got in their newsletters and then posting it out in different languages because they're the ones that know their communities and know, and know how they need to reach them. We looked at one of that, those newsletter contents this morning in our morning, in our manager's meeting, and um, we already had 2.4, so 2,400 views within 18 hours of one of those newsletter uh, videos from those schools. So that just tells you there's a need, and it tells you that, you know, while we can't create content, a video content for all of the schools, our role is to create that web and that network of training so that schools know how to do it themselves and get our support and our platforms for how to do it. And that the family liaisons also know what content they're creating, what they're sharing, and then how they can also share it as well. And my second question, yeah. um, when Marcy talked about all of the efforts to communicate, I did not hear how we were going to engage folks who the written word is not the most appropriate way to reach them. So again, we, we're we looking at creative ways. You always need eight to 10 touches for whoever you're engaging with. So it won't be a one stop, okay? I'm not gonna say a video is gonna reach everybody. There is video content. That video content is, is it might be in a Facebook post. It might be a, uh, it might be a, a written Facebook post, right? It might be, um, a text message that takes you to a video. I, we're also looking, and I, I know, um, Dr. Anderson, that you have a, a vested interest in um, making sure that our website has a recorded translation, auto um, translation into multiple languages, and we are collaborating very closely. Our web development specialists are working very closely. In fact, we actually saw a write-up for the, um, the, the spec 
um, for that. Uh, we we finalised that this last week, last week, and that our IT team and our web development specialist that lives in OCCR are working to make sure that we can implement that as quickly as possible, maybe as soon as the next two to three weeks. Thank you. And the last piece that I want to share, the last two pieces, I, I don't want for everybody to feel as if it has to always be a video with a face. Sometimes there's somebody reading the very same content and, you know, with the school's picture. It doesn't have to be complicated. Then you don't have as many takes. And also in terms of meeting people where they are, a tool that I know that many of the um, parent family liaisons have used, I have used that myself and trying to install it in my school board phone is the WhatsApp app because that is a place where you can reach a lot of people who don't necessarily respond to emails, but they will respond to WhatsApp. I'm wondering what is the division's capability to make this a little bit more robust and intentional, because right now it's just people doing it in their little pockets of the world. Um, so I'm not actually sure about WhatsApp, but I do know that we have um, the Talking Points app, which is is coming out and that will help us collaborate and connect with our families. I do know that a lot of our families um, are on WhatsApp um, and that's something that I will look into. I know that um, this is a very much an international tool and so um, I know my own family uses WhatsApp and I don't. So there's that kind of gap in the communication because we're a little slower here with that kind of acceptance of it. But it is definitely a tool that I think a lot of international communities do use um, and that maybe we need to kind of also explore. We d there are a few question marks around it for us. Um, just that we need to go back to legal and to IT to confirm. So it's just kind of a, a few check marks to check on that before we before we actually sort of say yes or no on it. So I'll have to come back to you on that. But there are definitely there's the there's the um, the other apps that we've been looking at as well to bring in. So yes, we're we're definitely looking to connect to uh, two ways and do much more two way feedback. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. So, uh, oh, um, yeah, my, I guess my first thought is uh, where I understand Mr. Frisch's concern, and certainly as a magisterial board member, we always want to maximize where we can the voices coming from our districts. Um, but I'm also just extremely mindful that we live in a county where, you know, many families, all of the adults in the household are working and um, kids have after school activities, practices, evenings. And if this really is about gathering the voices, um, I would say one, we definitely should use the community conversations that Dr. Reed has done as a way of measuring you know, what has been the proclivity of people to go in their own you know, districts or where they're you know, attending another meeting as Dr. Reed shared. Um, you know, how does our registration data help us do that? Because, um, you know, really, uh, I think as, as Helen noted, um, you know, this is our, our entire community that we're trying to hear from. Um, so I, I think it's also important to understand if we are having people register, that will help us understand if we have repeat attendees. So, and that's, that's really more of getting an idea of, is this a, are we hearing from a wide swath, or are we just having some of our most engaged members continuing to come to every meeting available to them? So I, I think a registration can help us with that. Um, and then, you know, I guess the, I definitely like the hybrid approach. Uh, I would just say we want to make sure we understand how we make that meeting meaningful for who's online and who's in person, because um, obviously a huge believer in the in-person engagement. And I, I, just like our teachers told us uh, as we came back from COVID, um, it's hard to you know, meet and engage in two different platforms. So I would wanna see how that gets done. And then um, finally, I think I would just say, um, being mindful of time, I really appreciate that you guys are asking us stuff like this. But I will tell you, as I've said in prior trainings, my biggest focus is the what that we're going to bring to them and ask them to do. And I, I look forward to our opportunity to ask the questions where my concerns are in terms of um, the groupings, because I, I, I 
don't think we've elevated our teachers enough in that prior part of the presentation. So I want to talk to that. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Um, Ms. Corbett Sanders, followed by Ms. Tolan. So given that this is only on the calendar and the engagement piece, I will hold off on some of my other questions about this presentation as well as the project management plan. Um, but I want to remind everybody, this is a strategic plan for the Fairfax County Public School System. It is not for any one magisterial district. And so I think that it's really important to actually keep that in mind as we look at how we best engage the public across the county. And so I would suggest that if the concern is that you want to amplify and create opportunities for everybody who wants to participate in the process, but you don't want to have repeat repetition from uh, people that like to uh, want to have more opportunity to amplify their own voice, then the way to do that would be through your registration process and to do it very similar to how this board handles the public speakers at our board meetings, which is that we keep a record of if you've participated once, then you are not going to be a vocal participate, a participant in the future at another one. So you have your opportunity to speak. But the other piece of it is I want us to be very cognizant throughout this whole process that um, we are transparent and open. And so I don't think we want to forec foreclose participation. It's just making sure that you people know that they have one opportunity to actually be participate in it. Um, secondly, I don't see on your calendar a uh, engagement with the business community. And the business community really are critical to this process on multiple layers. They're critical because they, uh, of our overall economy. They are critical because of the, the important voice in helping us structure the workforce of tomorrow. Uh, they're not listed in that engagement piece. Um, and so I would, I would like to know where we're going to do that. And as far as getting the message out about these meetings, I would suggest not only partnering with the Board of Supervisors, but who are the people who are going to be using our school system in the future are those young families whose kids may not be in school yet and may not be fully engaged. So I think we have to look at the early childhood providers and perhaps even the pediatricians to ask for uh, them to help us get the message out. And finally, the other group would be the Opportunity Neighborhoods organizations, which are um, critical in uh, really reaching communities that may not be as engaged in the day-to-day. -day. And I, my time's out. Any response to Ms. Corbett Sanders' comments? Sure. I think one of the things when Mitu earlier stated that um, the process is learning from Fairfax as much as uh, we're learning uh, from the process, uh, I think that to your point, Ms. Corbett Sanders, um, and I'll talk with Mitu about it right now because here we are, I think we could add a group of just business leaders. Traditionally, we've included them in the alignment team, uh, but I wonder if I don't know, Mutu. I wonder because of the sheer number of businesses um, and chambers if that wouldn't make more sense. So I think that's a really that's a really good suggestion. Um, and I like the other the early childhood and pediatrician sort of our cohort planning model. Um, seems like also a group of people who obviously um, have a high concern um, about that. I know our. IT colleague VJ Rao and his wife just had a baby boy last night. Um, so I saw pictures this morning um, and welcomed him to the class of 2040. So um, I'm sure, I know, sorry. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I think VJ sent eyes back to me, like, you know, big eyes. Um, but we have to think about that. That's, those are our future stakeholders, right? So Mutu, thoughts on a business group? Yeah, it's um, the, the the process again allows for for that 
uh, like you said, Michelle, traditionally the business folks are part of the alignment team. But they, if it makes sense to pull them out, we can treat them the same way we're, we're treating the faith community, which is a new idea, and the family uh, team. So we could set up a circle just for the business folks. Oh, you were alignment. Yeah. Well, I think, and we would want business on alignment too, right? With electeds and so right. forth. Dr. King is lamenting the loss of her <laughs> her group already. Um, yeah, no, you're correct. So you can do that. yeah, okay. We'll take a look at that in the structure in terms of the interest um, from the business community, depending on how many people are willing, it may be a fit on alignment or a, there may be a separate group. I know my time's up, but I get one last piece, and then I don't have to have it go back, which is recent alumni. I will. That's a great idea. I would defer to uh, Helen or Lisa, Marcy, Francis, somebody. Do, you, do we have an alumni list or association for the division? So this would be done through our foundation office. Oh, the foundation okay. has a list of, of alumni, and I'd have to work with um, Elizabeth That's Murphy cool. to make sure that we pull that list. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Tolan. Um, Thank you. Um, I don't have a lot of new things to add. Um, I would really like to investigate the opportunity to do me these meetings in a hybrid fashion. I completely understand that we're going to have to be really careful about how that is, how we do it. Um, but we've done a lot of, of these types of meetings that have been very successful. And um, just having that virtual option just allows so many more people to attend. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there are those that really like to have that face-to-face Contact. So I would like to see that, if possible, investigated. I really, really appreciate the comments um, of Ms. Court Sanders around, um, you know, our preschool um, families and the younger families and ways to reach them. I mean, I really think that we need to make a huge concerted effort that everyone that is involved in any one of these um, groups needs to advertise everything. And, and, you know, with the groups that we have outlined, that will really help us get to a lot of people in the county um, that we might not otherwise always um, reach out to, but those groups can reach out to or those individuals that we have engaged. Um, I uh, want to talk a little bit more, too, on some of the other things in here. I'm looking for the... the um, side of the house, the design and construction, facilities, maintenance, transportation. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't see them anywhere in here. So I want to make, how are we reaching out to those people and making sure that we're hearing um, information from them? Thank you, Ms. Tolan. And uh, leadership in those areas will be part of the core team um, because they're sort of part of the core division departments, if that makes sense. So they would be um, because they're non-instructional, they would be in that core team, whereas all instructional staff would be with Dr. Presidio in that instructional team. So um, it sounds like, based on some of the questions, we probably need to be more explicit about the um, membership, if you will, of those individual teams. So, okay. Are they in the core team? Yeah. So representatives would be on the core team. Okay, I just want to make sure every, those people are heard from. So, you know, the way you're training principals, for example, to do their school-based groups, will, you, will these leaders be trained to go out and do focus groups, small groups throughout their organization? You know, that is a great catch. Um, let's make sure that happens, because we definitely want to hear from our, obviously, our all employees, but have an opportunity to do focus groups with our different departments. Um, we would absolutely need to include them in that training. So thank you for double checking on that. I think that was intended, but let's just make it explicit. Yeah, so. and then I hope that instructional staff includes our central office as well. Actually, yes. I'm, we haven't done the membership of the committees yet. That's um, coming up here in the next couple cabinet meetings. Um, but we just have identified champions so far. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. 
Thank you. Um, I have uh, Ms. Cohen followed by Ms. Bukarski. Um, I guess just a few things. One, definitely, again, add me to the choir of hybrid. Um, what we've done a few times when we do our town halls um, online is that they can dump their comments into a Google form that somebody else is moderating. Again, I don't know what kind of scale we're talking about, but we've had like 200 people More. in a town hall, and it actually worked surprisingly well. I think we anticipated problems, um, and it was fine. Um, another two, when using our supervisors, I guess I would just encourage us to use all of our electeds too, since they're, um, they have each different pockets of our district. Um, one thing I was just going to ask, I see like there's three meetings that go on at the same time, and I was just going to ask that they not be contiguous <laughs> districts. So for example, like Megan and I share and off probably the most, I don't know, maybe Stella and I do, but like don't have Braddock and Springfield at the same time because A, people don't know what district they're in. And so if Braddock was one night, but Springfield was the next, you're gonna get, I mean, because we're like half and half at Lake Braddock. So people really don't know if Megan's their member or if I'm their member. So that's the only thing about the registration system I want us to be careful about because people don't necessarily know who's who. Like I'm the Springfield district member. I have so little of actual Springfield, Virginia that it's laughable. They all are Tammy's. Um, oh yeah, and yours. So. I, I don't know I, I don't know where you were thinking that you might hold some of these because for example if there's a meeting at like West Springfield High School now Tammy Megan and I share that school if it's South County it's mostly Karen but I send a decent chunk so I guess being, I I would be very interested in thoughts about how to resolve we don't know the answer to that because I'm telling you like we we just combat it by like we often do town halls together because people just don't know. So I think one of the things we thought about in responding to that is there are a hundred ways to slice these meetings and we really wanted our magisterial and at large board members to each have opportunities to lead these um, and we'll be providing facilitation support and all of that. But if we're doing hybrid, for example, like I did one last Thursday evening, um, they're not easy. You need extra people, extra hands and we'll need to be staffing that. Um, so I wonder if, and I, Marcy was taking feverish notes, absolutely we cannot put contiguous people in the same night. I think that's really a good idea. I wonder if once a school is decided upon, if those who share it can show up and help each other with the hybrid piece, um, if the board is open to that. That's, I mean, we feel like we want, we're here to make this work for you, right, and the community. So whatever you think is most comfortable, We'll set up and staff. Yeah, and I think a lot of us got into that groove certainly with um, COVID and doing these virtual that we all just started kind of working together to host a lot of these. And some of us, like Karen and I, every month have South County Federation together. So I think we're we're used to tag teaming some of this. So we'd be happy to, if that's yeah. helpful, we, I think we'd be happy to do it. I think it would be fabulous. I think what we're doing, again, when we think about wide net and tight process, we want to hold the magisterial responsible for the timing, the uh, confirmation of details, but then would hope that maybe that magisterial would connect with their partner board directors to make sure that there's support at that school that you're choosing to hold it at. Um, and I know Marcy, again, is the point uh, for all that logistical information, and I think our project manager is in the back. <laughs> Um, and I think our current project management has, what, 46 pages moving out? So it's a, it's a moving, living document. But Marcy, once we know your preference, we'll work with those logistics. I think the other thing I was going to ask, like when I was PTA president, we tried to mix up what was during the day versus at night. And I see these start at 6. But I imagine that there's some reasoning to why we start our board meetings at 7 normally. So I guess I would just argue it is awfully hard to get home and get kids fed and be somewhere yeah. at six. So if we want the engagement of people with young kids, um, how do we work to structure that? So maybe even a few during the day, if we can mix it up a little and just see. It always surprised me as a PTA president, like what different audiences I got when I did that. 
Um, my last question, I know I'm out of time. Will we have an opportunity to come back about the um, community groups included? Yes, and I think um, Dr. Ivey raised a good point. We've received a lot of feedback, but I think we certainly, we want to do this right. This is going to be our future, right? And we want to make sure that we hear all the feedback. And I, I want to encourage all of us to remember, just to take a breath for a minute, and remember this isn't going to be perfect, right? We are not going to do this perfectly, but we're going to do it as well as we can. And we cannot let sort of perfection get in the way of our ability to process information. So I want to encourage us to extend one another grace on this. And if you think of a community group three days after we've finalized the list, please let us know. I mean, I'd rather include people than have a process that we're proud of, right? Because the bottom line is we want to hear from our community and together plan forward so that once we commit and you all commit to this plan in June of 2023, that's our North Star to 2030, right? Like that's our work. So anyhow, Dr. Ivy, did you want to talk just a minute, be responsive to Ms. Cohen's comment? Sure. We very much so can do this by email. I can send the list back out to all of you with it as an attachment so you can have it and review it. My question was um, if you have additional um, organizations you want to send, do you want to send them by email or I, we could set up a Google um, you know, process I understand the last time we did it, you were only able to suggest one suggestion. So we could set it up differently so you could add several. And um, if I don't know if you want Google or if you want to just send in names. We could probably do both. If you can send in names, great. If you can do Google, that's probably simplest. Um, okay. So we'll set up. We'll, we'll do both. All right. I just I want to comment on the time issue, Ms. Cohen, that you raised. Uh, Marcy and I were just sidebarring for a moment. I think one of the other goals of the strategic planning process that I have and Michu and I've worked on before is leadership development as well. There are a lot of people in this division that want to be a part of this process. And so I think the opportunity to hold even a couple breakfast meetings within your magisterial district, we have executive principals, we have regional assistant superintendents, we have um, directors and assistant superintendents in all departments across this region that or across the division that are have an interest in this. Um, we have a lot of different people we can tap. So I, I think the again, the wider the net of opportunity, um, we're open to. So if you're a magisterial board director and you would really like to have a few breakfasts, for example, hosted, uh, ping Marcy and we'll make sure that we can make it happen, right? Like. The idea here is how do we engage um, and keep the information flowing back and forth. That's the key. We don't want to engage and not collect that information. You know, we want to make sure it gets back to the core team because that core team is going to take all of it um, and really work with it. So that's an opportunity. Um, thank you. Uh, and I don't have anything uh, new to add. We were just sidebarring, and I'm glad to hear that you're open to the idea of doing, you know, some type of morning or midday. I mean, the reality is, if we're looking, especially for our families to engage, like I know my kids get off the bus at 4:45, and we're not done till nine, and there is no time on any day, and people are tapped out. But during the day, you know, we see that at schools that that is sometimes. Um, very successful. So I'll just put in a plug in for that. And I do have um, quite a few suggestions. So I'll wait for the community um, partners, however, we want to share that. Uh, but of course, I agree virtual, whatever we can do. I think people, you know, I think from here on out, that is just should be the new normal way for us to engage because it's successful and it creates less stress in people's lives. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bukarski. Ms. Omesh, followed by Ms. Keyes-Gamara. 
Thank you, and thank you for the team's hard work in putting this together. I certainly appreciate a lot of this, and really, we're just tweaking here. Um, so, uh, and I especially appreciate the introduction of faith community. I think it's really an area of trust in the community that we have not tapped into for so long. Um, I did want to ask how we're determining for each of these groups who participates. Are they limited in size, or does it just end up being whoever falls under that umbrella? So, really, my preference, and Mutu knows this, we sometimes fuss with one another about it, is anyone who would like to be there and is committed to working on this work in good faith um, within the guidelines and norms, we should include. Um, and space available facility-wise is really the only deterrent. What I, we also find is that, and I don't know, Helen, we, I'm going to say we get about a third more register for community conversations than show. I mean, that's just human nature. People sign up for something, but then I don't know what your thoughts on that are. Yeah, it's around, around if for, for in-person, it's around 50-50, those that register and those that show. We always follow up, though, to know of another event. They can show up if they missed one because of a, a you know some clash. Uh, when it's... When it's virtual, we end up with a higher attendance rate, um, somewhere between usually like 60, 70% of those that registers actually t uh, come on online and engage with this in some way. So, um, you know, there's definitely a benefit to having that, that virtual opportunity as well. Okay, so in terms of the invite that goes out, is this something that will be sent to the whole school community? You know, how are we reaching? Invite for which? For the various stakeholder groups. So I think, um, I know, Lisa, you've been working on that in particular with Marcy in terms of how we're t addressing the group. So, um, in fact, we just had a conversation about that last night. Um, do you want to share kind of where we our thinking is on that? And I'd like to hear your thinking, Ms. Omesh. And Helen can, Helen can chime in on this as well. I think it's going to be important to make a broad announcement similar to uh, the community conversations with the superintendent uh, and create a space where any, well, we're hearing differently now, but create a space where everyone knows just so that folks understand the process. I think that's going to be important, that transparency. But then, we, you know, we, we specify the different magisterial districts and, and invite specific folks to the magisterial district events. However, be transparent online, et cetera, so that they can see we're doing the work uh, division-wide. In terms of, of invitations, I think you talked about um, postcards, Helen, as well as <laughs> we have all kinds of opportunities. You know, we, we can even do at some point some type of, of audio um, invitation somehow. We can figure that out, whether it's video we, I have to check in with Helen because I know these things are often reserved, uh, but for some type of, of robocall just once to make folks aware in a different way. Um, you know, through faith-based organizations, outreach that way. There are just, there's a multitude of ways that we can reach out and get those invitations out. And I know Helen's going to have a fully, yeah. you know, a full plan soon. This is also an opportunity for us to create new lists. I think that one of the things that I've discovered, I don't know if it's as true here, I haven't been here long enough, but so many of what I would, businesses or groups or advocacy groups or organizations have evolved since the pandemic began, right? Like, and not only in their leadership, but some have folded and some new ones have sprung up that didn't exist, right? And I think as we're dusting off kind of all of our <laughs> patterns of being um, and go-to partnerships, this is a great opportunity for us to sort of re-engage with our community. So um, I think we're really going to have to think about uh, augmenting whatever list we had on you know, had working with, but I know that, anyhow, everything's an opportunity. <laughs> so, it Ellen? Is. That is right. Everything is an opportunity. And if we look at the way that we've done um, uh, the CIP, for example, we're looking at how do we need to reach the communities that we're trying to reach that we have said we're going to reach, right? So, it's not a one-stop shop fits all. It's a 
where, um, for example, if we're trying to reach students and get our student voice here, how are we going to make sure that we're really reaching those students to connect with them versus our faith groups, versus our business groups? Everyone engages in a different way. And so it's almost like you need a micro plan in the same way that you have for the CIP framework. You have a micro plan within each of those. And you have a micro plan for this, for each group and how you're going to engage that group. And so it's not a case of looking at like a formula. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I, I, I like the idea of a robocall. Then I start thinking about languages. You know, it's kind of like a lens that you have to put on everything. And then I know Ms. Tolan brought up last time, again, connecting the loop between all our work, the family engagement survey that showed us texting was a really popular thing, right? So we mentioned that last time. Um, and all kinds of ways, right? Reaching out to these groups is kind of the, the cushion. Like, I see it as the way of helping influencers put, put out the word, but then... What's, how are we answering to every single family having heard somehow? Postcards is a possibility, and I'm sure that's expensive, but go ahead. And I think there's one more thing as well, and, and that I, I forgot to mention, that also in the, within the CIP plan, and that is the empowering others to make sure that they reach their community. So you're identifying the stakeholders, which are really critical to, to that community and are real voices in that community. So, for example... Um, I know that we post our content via the, the Moss website, right? And we do it in a way that they ask us to because it's not a way that we would necessarily think, oh, yeah, that's a, a way that we need to. We connect with them and make sure that we're doing it in a way that works for them and for their audience. And then they help us because they know their audience get the message out there um, much clearer and much better and in a way that resonates for that community. So that's just another example of how... Uh, we're trying to make sure we tailor that outreach and we make it really specific for each audience and we're really thinking about individual audiences as, um, as, as individuals, right, rather than just kind of like en masse. We don't have staff as an audience. We don't have families as an audience because there is no such audience. Yeah, and then thinking, being thoughtful too about who's structurally left out of those decisions. I mean, I know we still have... Is it, at last I checked, was 9%, but I, I totally, don't fact check me on this, of families in Fairfax County who don't have internet or like regular access to internet. That's an example of something where inherently we're leaving a certain population out. So how are we reaching them? And Dr. Anderson's points earlier on the literacy piece, et cetera. So I just want to make sure we're thinking about that. But to that point, for those who follow school board meetings, which certainly, you know, will not, will still leave plenty of people structurally out. Uh, we don't really have a clear, like a business item for this meeting on Thursday. I know it, this came up in retreat last time. I, I think it'd be a great idea for us to present a timeline, just do a brief presentation on what this is and, you know, how people can get involved. With the strategic plan? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think, Ms. Mesh, if I might, um, I think that's a great idea and maybe the board might consider um, a standing item while we go through this process for maybe an update at our regular meetings. So I would defer to Ms. Dernak Kovacs, um, and maybe that's something that chairs could discuss, but that would be keeping things up in the forefront. So thank you for that suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I will talk to uh, Ms. Seismar Heiser. We'll talk about it in chairs, but I think I don't, if we don't get it on tomorrow, I really like the idea of a standing item. I think that that is a very um, excellent opportunity for us to continue to keep the community engaged and mm -hmm. involved. And it's really, it's w our work for the next year. So it is the core of our work. So that should yeah, be included for certain. So thank you for that. No, for sure. And I'd love, you know, in your conversations, I guess, tomorrow or at chairs, um, we, we, were, we were talked at, in retreat about doing some kind of celebratory kickoff kind of idea when we announce to the community what the plan is. I don't know if that can be Thursday. It would be awesome if it can, but otherwise, <laughs> maybe we can identify. There's nothing on new business, so. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so that's uh, that. Um, in terms of the piece on uh, the list, the stakeholder list, I had floated around the idea of engaging our public and being able to help identify this and just sending out a mass email and asking people to bring suggestions. Now. Before we do something like that, we're going to have to define criteria for what um, probably we consider to be a group or what should be added, or I don't know. We have to be thoughtful about how that might be uh, misused. But 
notwithstanding, I mean, not that not being a reason to eliminate this, I really think we can benefit from, I mean, we don't know what we don't know, right? That's the whole problem. We're going to, again, 12 people are going to pontificate about who's out there, but that's never going to be sufficient, and we're already missing the people who we've been missing, <laughs> so we're going to continue missing them. So I think that that's something I really want us to think about. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little crazy, but I think it'll give us the maximum reach that we're looking for. But that's my time, and I'd like to go back. All right. And I'd love to hear their reaction yes, to that. please. So thank you, Ms. Omish. Um, Muchu or Kenneth, I would be interested in your response to um, how we get away from missing the people we miss, right? Like, because we only know what we know. Yeah. And I want to go for us? Oh, yeah, well, uh, I have some overall thoughts that may um, be helpful in this. Um, as I listen to the conversation, let me let me say sometimes, sometimes our our words do not really express um, the overall process in our head and what we're thinking. Um, I, however, I, this process is not a finite process, as as uh, Dr. Reed said. Number one, it's not. It's never going to be perfect. Uh, and um, it, you could also use this as a, as a learning process. And so if you're looking at May being the end of something, I would ask you to keep in mind that that's the commencement. That's the beginning. Um, the development of this quote-unquote plan is the beginning of a, of a, a process that's going to move forward. You know, so when I say about strategy development and implementation, it's not about the, the it's not about having something at the end of this. It's about what you're gonna do when you do have something at the end of this. And so um ideas such as um Lord Member me saying sending out an email. Uh, having some criteria, you know, I think I think that's a good idea. I also want people to realize that you're going to be coming up with good ideas throughout this entire process. And so don't let any of those good ideas derail the process, but continue to think of this as a learning opportunity. So if you can do that, uh, as these, these ideas come up, without derailing the process in Mutu, and tell you much more about the process that um, that you're using and whether something will derail the process or add to it. Um, just keep that in mind that this that the development of this quote unquote plan is the beginning. So don't so just um, yeah and I mean and the more the merrier the more the more uh, voices you can hear that's fine. But again, realize that you're going to be you're, you're going to be learning throughout this. And you're going to be coming up with things all along the way. You're going to be coming up with things in May that you're going to say, oh, man, I wish I thought of this in November. And but that's OK. Um, you know, again, don't let these things do things. Don't let them derail the process. And remember that strategy development and implementation is ongoing. It's if you think of a student graduating at the end of 12 years or whatever, and what do we call that? Commencement. That's the beginning. So in May, don't think you're done. That's the commencement. So continue to learn, continue to add to the process. Uh, but realize where you are in it and what you're creating. So, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, Miss Amish. Your, your question makes me. Uh, you really triggered a thought. You said, uh, "I." Do, well, I'm paraphrasing. How do we make sure we don't continue to miss those groups we've traditionally missed? Which suggests that we know who those groups are that we traditionally missed in the past. So perhaps what we ought to do is to be very intentional about identifying who those groups are and going to them, I mean, literally tomorrow, 
and asking them, you know, what's the best way for us to uh, communicate with them. So that, that, that will let us know uh, how they want us to engage them. And then the second point I want to make is really picking up on a sentiment that uh, uh, Kenneth just mentioned, that we, we stay loose about the, uh, the process. The door is always open. I mean, until we're done on May 9th, we can always pivot. We can always uh, adjust. So uh, put our best foot forward, uh, intentionally identify who those groups are that have usually been left out, have a plan for engaging them, and then stay open throughout the entire process. Just stay open. If something comes up that we haven't talked about or we haven't thought about, uh, the process we, we take you through really is, um, it's not done until May 9th. We can always pivot. Thank you. And I would, I would say that even on May 9th, someone, someone is going to say, hey, you missed me or you missed us or et cetera, et cetera. And, and as Mutu said, being loose, being fluid, being open and saying, even after this, we, 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 we still want, uh, we still want your input. You know, I think I've said this before, whenever you ask people, especially large groups of people for their input, they uh, psychologically, people believe that you're going to use the information they give you. And you know you cannot use all of that information, okay, ever. And so being clear that we're, that, that everybody's, even at the end, quote unquote, of this, the, even at the end of the beginning of this process, I'd say in May it's the beginning, even yeah. then to be, for people to know that you're willing to uh, review uh, their comments and their input. I mean, and that should be an ongoing thing. How, yeah. how, how people are perceiving not just the creation of this um, plan, this roadmap. I don't even like the word play it <laughs> in that context, but the creation of this roadmap, uh, but being able to comment on its implementation also. What we're how we are how we're creating um, how we are reaching these uh, goals for these students. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, colleagues, I just want to direct us to time. Um, we have two more colleagues that haven't spoken yet. And, well, three, including myself, Ms. Keys Gamara and Ms. Marin. Um, and then I will allow for one minute go backs on the calendar piece and we must then get to Mutu's finalization of his report so we can get to our general questions. Okay. So um, right now, Ms. Uh, Keys Gamara followed by Ms. Mary. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Darnett Koufax. I, I apologize. I've had to go in and out a couple of times. So I may have missed some comments, so hopefully what I'm saying isn't repetitive. I want to just kind of, I think, step back a little bit with respect to the how of what we're doing. I understand uh, we're looking into how we're dealing our strategic planning. Ms. Um, Keys Gamara, this, yes. this particular section is on calendar only and general questions will be done after um, after Mutu finishes up his entire section. So unless you have calendar specific questions, if you can hold those till later. Well, I actually think um, based on my comments and please let me know if I'm misunderstood, I may have missed a comment in here. Um, hopefully this isn't eating up my time while I try to figure out what I'm supposed to say. Um, but we're talking about getting appropriate input from the community, correct? Well, we're 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 looking at the we're looking at pages 16, 17 and 18 on on the thing and seeing uh, for input there and um, it has devolved a little bit. So if you want to quickly, I'll give you the I'll give you the time just to to do this, um, everyone, look, this is something everybody needs to get done. And I understand there's 15 ways to manage this meeting. But if we can just move forward, Ms. Keys-Gamara, go ahead and ask your questions. 
So I wanted to just kind of look at this more from an open, uh, from a one Fairfax approach, including what we can do to go to the community as opposed to inviting them to come to us. I mm. think, I think that that oftentimes is where we lose people, right? So as we're trying to, uh, first of all, have a clear purpose statement as to why we're doing this, that is clearly announced to the community, then I think we can talk about what that looks like, right? Do we need to go to places of worship as opposed to expecting them to sign up? Uh, things of that nature. Um, and I think that the process being clearly defined um, is with that level of integrity may help us on the outcome where people understand what our efforts have been. So I've, I edited my comments a bit, uh, Ms. Darnett Koufax, in light of what you said, but I wanted to just offer that other perspective uh, and would like to hear feedback on that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kiskamar. I appreciate it. Any staff would like to speak? I think the point of going to the community instead of inviting the community to us is a really key point. And I appreciate um, how carefully that's phrased. I also know that a clear purpose statement is something we do have. Um, but the fact that we have it and the community maybe doesn't is problematic. So we need to make sure that that is shared. Um, as well as our very clear why for that. So um, that will be something that the team is working on, and we'll have something for the upcoming Monday letter on, I think, a draft, clear, purpose, statement, and so forth. Um, so I think very responsive to that. Thank you, Ms. Keys Kamara. Thank you so much. Ms. Marin. Yes, just in the vein of calendar, I would love us to really see further us use our, our look to our supervisors as the champions that they, they tend to be. And so what can we give them as far as talking points and materials so that whenever they have a meeting from now until January, they're advertising it, their public meetings, their district meetings. Um, I believe I believe their budget meetings aren't until more like March, so I think that window will have passed. Um, and businesses as well, you know, the chambers of commerce. I'd love to have something when I go in to, to give them. So when we have, you know, MOUs with folks. So anyone who can be our champion, and whether it's a newsletter or speaking at a meeting or when they're out in the community. The other thing I just wanted to ask, and Ms. Lloyd, you had mentioned something about languages spoken. I would love if the board could please receive at a future time soon an update of what are the most frequent languages chosen to have be reading our materials. Um, and I would love that by magisterial district to really know, um, even for my own newsletters, just um, how often that, that is used. So thank you for that information. Thank you. And colleagues, if uh, anyone who wants a one minute go back would put your placard up. Ms. Amesh. Thank you. I didn't get the final word from staff about whether we would do that with the email about the groups. I know Kenneth said it was a good idea, but... It would, I'm sorry, would you repeat the question, Ms. Amesh, about which, about the email for groups? To send out to the entire community to give us um, group names, et cetera, that we may have missed. <clears throat> so the question is, will we do that? Yeah. <laughs> or think about it. Well, I'm trying to think of how to do it, right? Because I think one of the things you shared was what are the parameters we would list within yeah. that to define a group. So uh, I'm wondering, Dr. King, I don't know, what are your thoughts? Your... There are so many community organizations in, in Fairfax County. I think this is why it's important that we get feedback within your magisterial districts and even at large. You come across uh, groups that we don't know about that could um, be a good fit and offer us great perspective in the community. So um, we'll reach out to the ones that we know, but we're counting on you to help us reach out to the ones that we don't know. I think I you're know. asking for something even a little more, right? Like a sort of a email to the community writ large to please share any advocacy groups. Maybe we just need to kind of identify what that list of groups might define and then please let us know as we're updating our list because I think we really are updating. I don't know, Helen, what are your thoughts on kind of the mechanics of 
Because I think we want to do that. I'm trying to think of what that looks yeah, like. Yeah, because what makes us 12 omniscient? We're not, so... Well, and four months in, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. still meeting groups that I didn't know existed. So, Helen? Yeah, and I will say we're always updating our list. We have a list of 450 groups that we reach out to currently on our um, in our community engagement kind of outreach list plan. Um, but obviously, I think that's a great idea. You know, we're coming out of COVID. There are different groups that have that have formed as a result of that, and maybe groups that maybe weren't so so large or so influential before that that are. And so I think any any group that we can, I can certainly send out do a, a Google form that we can um, drop and 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 ask people to add a name and add a list if we need to. Um, I can ask the not get our team to kind of just have eyes on it and just check that to make sure they do kind of fit with what we're we're looking for for our engagement but those are lists that we share our communications with regularly because they are our key stakeholders into the community and that's how we want to do it so it's like the second touch point right so other people are sharing our messages for us that's really important um could i add just um I would, Ms. Lomish, appreciate if you, if you want to even start a draft of what you think would be a thoughtful community note that was sort of open-ended, right? Um, because you're right. I've been in divisions where mostly we have the list of groups and then we send it out, but we may not know the groups we don't know. Mm -hmm. So, but before, so let's do it. But before we do it, spend some time being thoughtful about how we anticipate the problems that will come with that. Right, because we don't <laughs> want to create a second wave of. Right. It could get hijacked. I mean, it could get political. God knows, you know. Absolutely. I think it is one way, though, of re going out to the community. I know we're thinking of physically going out to the community, but this is also another way that we can go out to the community to reach them where they are. And so it's just another way of kind of thinking about that concept. Great. And I will do that, Dr. Reed. Thank you. I did want to touch on the student piece. I wanted to learn a little bit more about you know, I don't know that I love the idea of a survey. Um, and just kind of wanted to hear, when we say principal-led conversations, how is that reflecting itself back into, you know, the decision-making circles, meaning you guys? So that would come back through the student voice champion mm -hmm. um, and the principal-led groups. Marcy, do you want to comment on kind of how those knit back together? And I'll, I'll phone a friend here for Mutu, but I... I know we talked a little bit about the qualitative data collection because with the school system with 200 you know, principals running these groups, um, so there'll be certain feedback that students are going to input into a Google form that participate in the focus group, and then that data will be summarized by MUTU's team and then brought back into the core team and brought back to those teams for analysis. What, what does that mean, right, in sharing? Mm -hmm. And that's the technical approach. Um, one of the things that I think would be a really great idea, and we've uh, met with a variety of student groups, um, and I'd look to uh, Michelle to uh, also comment. Uh, I would love to see like our SEALs at the local school level maybe facilitating groups of students too. But So I, I don't know that as a team we're necessarily invested in who does the groups, the focus groups. Um, but we think it's, it needs to be done and authentic. The reason we also want to include a survey as another layer is because every student won't be in a focus group. And if we really want to hear from everybody's voice, we want to make sure that even if you didn't get invited to a focus group, that you had an opportunity to somehow have your voice heard. But I don't know if you want to respond, Michelle, about... I should have clarified that survey being the predominant thing. But yeah, oh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, Michelle, please. Yeah, I had a few questions about that too. So for the survey aspect of it, um, will it be like something that will be pushed out from like the principals to the students at the school or would it be like, so principal B. Yeah, Michelle, so each of the principals is gonna decide the sort of time that they're gonna have students engage in the survey during the day, but likely for secondary, probably during your advisory yeah. period. Okay, okay, um, and then I kind of understand the survey aspect of it, but like as somebody who's like constantly taking those surveys, I personally don't think you can guarantee like accurate and truthful responses. It'll be more like, okay, let me check this off my list so I can go back to advisory. Um, and then for the principal-led school conversations, um, I really liked how you mentioned like having SEALs run it instead because 
personally, like when we were going on like our principal search at my school, when it was student run, I felt like you got more authentic responses mm -hmm. rather than the pressure of having an adult. I mean, you can still have an adult in the room, but if adults running something, you kind of feel the need to be more reserved about your response and your feedback. So I definitely like the idea of having either SEALs or SAC reps run that instead. Mm. Yeah. I second all of that. I, I think those are great ideas. Um, it I'd may be to, interesting mm -hmm. even to have SACs and SEALs run it and the information goes to SAC and SEALs yes. and have them consolidate it. Uh, yes. You know, just really, that I think that might up the investment that students have maybe in an authentic way. Yeah, yeah which actually brings me to kind of the other piece I had questions about, which is the objectives in these meetings, right? Like, we have to have very defined questions. I think when we send out the communication to students, it has to be really clear what a strategic plan even is, and to most of the community, you know? We're making the plan for FCPS, like in just basic, basic English, uh, you know? Um, we had end up in our own jargon. So uh, can we define what those goals are? Is that the next piece of this That's conversation? That's the next piece. Let's, okay. let's, yes, thank you. Um, I, I just have two quick things. Um, you know, when you're looking at um, the, the lists, I'm looking at the faith-based organizations, and um, there aren't any from my region. I'm ex I'm not exactly sure how um, that's that was organized or defined. It's incomplete. Thank you. And so you'll ask us to add to that. Okay. And, and then the second thing is, um, and maybe because I was touring an elementary school yesterday, very old school, particularly for um, elementary school parents who aren't engaged in the big FCPS website, everything, the folders, Tuesday folders, Monday folders, paper, paper in those folders because they look at those all the time. That is your little go-to when you're in elementary school. So, all right. Thank you all. Um, Mutu, we have a few minutes here for you to finish up so we can get to some questions. Uh, this is great. Um, I've been taking a lot of notes also. Uh, I really don't have much more to share. Just one more. Let me share my screen. One more slide and we should be done. Can you see the uh, calendar again, please? Yes? Okay. Then the, um, the last slide, it's about milestones for this month. M many of these we've covered already. The uh, student data piece will be done on the 21st. That's uh, a week from Friday. Then my team takes over and we begin to analyze and process and, and package the, the data. We've said enough already about the student voice. Uh, I really like the idea of how we can involve the SACs in the analysis of that data. And I, I'd like to discuss that further with uh, Dr. Reed and with my own team. Uh, calendar seems to be okay. The uh, one question I have, well, one um, thing we have to figure out, if we're going to do a hybrid, how do we manage a mix of hybrid and in-person at, at the same time? Uh, we've talked, touched on communications, uh, planning team. Uh, I, I think we're in pretty good shape. Yeah. I, I have no, no further questions, uh, I, nothing else. Uh, if Mathieu, I could do one. Mathieu, yes, you were going to, I think one of the things the group is interested in is kind of seeing the uh, questions you would expect at the meetings. I know we had tightly framed those in the past. Do you have a slide for that or can you speak to that, please? Uh, this is for, for the school-based conversations or the survey? The school-based or the focus group-based? Okay, yeah, I, I can do that. I, yes, let's do that now. Um, one second. Great. Okay, we, we're we going to be going through this with the uh, principals. Uh, by the way, one of the best one of these uh, student voice engagements um, was the one at North Shore School District, uh, where Michelle used to be. We got the, the students just took it over. That's why I like Michelle's comment about the engaging the SAC maybe much more deeply than we thought of until now. So I really would like to explore that some more. 
But this gives you an idea of what the uh, student-led piece is going to be all about. They, we start, we treat everyone pretty much the same way in terms of the stage setting. So some of the same slides that we've shared with you, we will share with them. Now, it's, it's always nice for folks to get a feel for how what the dream fits in. And it's just part of engaging everyone, not just at the head level, but at the heart level about what the planning is all about. So the first five slides are the same as what you've seen. The principals can decide whether they paraphrase the slides or whether they share with them with the students, but making sure the students know the context is a key part of uh, showing them respect about the process as well. So you've seen all of this before, so I'm gonna go quickly through them. Then we'll talk about the three levels of engagement or student voice. Uh, level one would be the online survey, all students in grades three through 12, it's confidential and anonymous, and it will be done by the first week in December. That's the, the timeline. Then the school level focus group discussions will be at each school led by the principal. And again, same time frame. And then finally, we have essentially a standing team, very much like the core planning team, like the alignment team, like the instructional focus team, the same group of students meeting for uh, four to six sessions and having a purview, a worldview that covers the entire division. So, and they will get to look at everything everybody else sees at the same time that we're working with the adult teams. So you can think of that third uh, phase as uh, the synthesis and the alignment of the work. Then the process, we take them through just three parts. Uh, start very broad, what are your, uh, current school experiences like, then moving a little bit, what matters most to you, and then finally, if the adults could make you one promise, what would you, what would you like the adults to promise you? And it's the last two that we will actually uh, gather in writing and in some form. Uh, different folks have different uh, stage setting or uh, icebreaker uh, exercises to do. This is one that we've, we've done successful in, in the past, just to, you know, prime the pump, so to speak. Then uh, part one would be, uh, part 1A is just to find out what's going well. And the goal is not to cover all five questions, but to have them handy. Uh, since it's a focus group, in a sense, you're leading the group and you're also being led by the group. So we'll be encouraging the principals to kind of use their own best judgment as to which one of these questions to use and when. But again, this is the very wide net. You know, how's the world going for you? What's going well? That's one A. And then one B is the flip side. What's not going as well yet? And we build just two simple prompts. What will help you learn? And what will help you feel better? What will help you learn better? What will help you feel better? So it's very loose allow the students to say what's on their mind. So that's pretty much all we do, all we ask to be done around the first part of the three-part conversation. The second part, activity number two, uh, now pulls things in a little bit. They will have a list of uh, 10 you know, attributes or um, you know, areas of focus, and we'll ask them to identify their top three individually so everyone, every student gets a chance to just do their own processing. They'll do that in a Google form. And then the facilitator will open it up. So they get to talk among themselves or talk with the facilitator about why they chose what they chose. And this part we, we will collect for, for each school and we'll play it back um, later in the process. We can write up a summary report for uh, each school. So that's part two. And that could go on for about 12 to 15 minutes, depending on how engaged the students are. Then the last, uh, there's actually a third part, which we're not doing um, with the division. And the third part, traditionally, it's about the portrait of a graduate. So we have a module for them around 
what are the qualities and attributes that they feel are important for them to acquire before they graduate from high school? What would, what would they like high school to prepare them for? But since we, we already have a budget of a graduate, it's not part of uh, what we're gonna do this time. Normally that's activity number three. And then we'll close with the, this very simple prompt. We call it the one guarantee. And if the adults could make you one promise, what would you like them to promise? And it's always very insightful. You get a, you know, a few, um, you know, partly tongue in cheek, uh, maybe even a little bit silly ones. Uh, but the, this one question really lets you know what matters most to, to the students. Then what we'll ask the, uh, so this prompt will be answered in writing in the Google form. The same thing with the activity two. All of those input will come to my team. And I have a, a, a team of four people who do nothing but to process uh, information like that, you know, four in addition to my, my core team. So we'll, we'll take, you know, hundreds of, um, you know, feedback and start to mine them, see what are some of the main ideas from it. So th that's that's really the, uh, the school-led piece. And so this is input from the students. The same way the survey is input from the students. And in the same way, when the student team processes all of that, it's all input that goes back uh, along the way to back to the core planning team to integrate. So that's a process. Uh, questions or comments, please. Bertu, do you have more to present? Because we are running up against time. If you want to just finish, that's it. That's the end. That's it. All right. Yeah. All okay. right. Thank you. Um, school Thank board you members, I ask you to uh, try to be as succinct as possible as we are trying to get um, our afternoon agenda here. We will have other opportunities to do this, but I have three colleagues um, to start off. I have um, Ms. Keys Gamara, followed by Dr. Anderson, and then Ms. McLaughlin. I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Corbett Sanders, I always call you and Karen the wrong names. <laughs> I always get my Karens mixed up. I don't know why. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and we get three minutes? You get three minutes. <laughs> OK, thank you. And I am honored to be mistaken by the honorable uh, Ms. Keys Gamara. So I have a couple of questions. One is, and it's really on um, how we communicate and what we're doing here. Um, one, we still don't have an actual budget for this process, and it is very important that we have a budget for this process. Even if it is already being covered from existing funds, it is important for the public to know. Secondly, um, in reading the project management plan, I am a little concerned in the update this past weekend of, uh, or yes, Monday, um, that there's no actual mention of workforce development or career and technical education and future aspirations, and I think that that's critical. Um, nor is there a mention of teachers in the um, a, in the update, and so I think that uh, it will be very important for us to be intentional on how we are going to engage with those constituencies. I appreciate that um, my colleague. Uh, on the Route 1 corridor uh, mentioned about the faith groups. I sent in a significant number of faith groups to be represented in the calendar process and none of them were represented. So I, would, I can dig out the old email and give you the points of contact, but it is critical that we have it. We actually have something called Ventures in Community, which is the um, interfaith alliance in that area. Um, then on the student, so, Additionally, I think it's really important on communications about this going forward that, um, Dr. Reed, if you could actually have any communications on the strategic planning process as a separate standalone communication so that it is um, everybody sees it and we can focus on it because um, I'm a kind of a a nerd when it comes to reading everything and I had to go through because of the way it comes up on my screen I didn't it didn't easily come up on my screen that this attachment was there um, 
talking about student voice, and thank you very much for um, presenting it as you did. I think that it is really important, as with all of our cohorts, that we have a consistency in the standard way of presenting the topic and the questions that are being answered. And so when I heard that we might be able to customize it at each school level, I get a little worried because um, to do our best work, we need that consistency. Um, and it's just a good research practice. Uh, additionally, I would suggest that the cohorts at the school level include not only our SEALs, but our leadership team and our students who are active in AVID. Um, so trying to broaden the group to ensure that we get as many um, student voices as possible. I was a little concerned in looking at the questions that there was not specific language on academics. And um, as a school system, I think that that is really important to be very specific about what are the aspirations of our children, uh, our students for academics and what their future plans are. And I do have more, but I know I'm out of town. Can take Ms. Keys Gamar if you like. <laughs> Any comments from staff? I just want to clarify. I've tried to, I'm toying with kind of rearranging the Monday letter. So I'm at, I have the feedback section on the top for just those items that I want feedback because I do agree it's a dense, there's a lot of material. So I want to clarify, would it be all right if I do a strategic plan update, feedback, and then all the articles, or did you want a completely separate email? So just separate within the Monday letter. Okay. No. Everybody wants, right. I'll do Everybody. both. That, I will do that both. That'll be perfect, Michelle. Thank you both. All right. All right. I'm on it. I'll do both. Um, Marcy, if you could make a note for Michelle Claude. That's not a problem. We've got it. Thank you. Um, Dr. Anderson. Thank you. Just very quickly, I'm a fan of one-stop shops, so I don't want to have duplicate information in multiple places. So I would be one who would like the the bar, you know, and part of the Monday letter. But I think we were just discussing maybe it's a Friday letter because it is pretty dense. It's nice to have some time to absorb and to ask your questions. Um, just putting it out there as we're chatting about this. Most of my questions are around um, page 14 from the presentation. But before I get there, are we going to receive a copy of what Mutu presented? Because that last piece we did not have. Yes. Or we do not have. Yes. I wasn't sure we'd range there today. But yes, we'll make sure. Mutu, if you wouldn't mind making sure we send the PowerPoint for the principal training. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So with the principal conversations that are being led at the schools, you're expecting for the principals to be the main deliverers. Uh, is this a, a space where you anticipate that they would be providing a designee to lead it, or is it they're the ones who are going to engage in those conversations? My expectation would be that they cause those conversations to happen. And um, Dr. King is smiling. We've had quite a little conversation about this. So Dr. King, would you like to share kind of our current best thinking on that, please? We wanted to allow for options, right? But you know, we want to encourage our principals to hear the voices of their kids directly um, because they're the leaders in the building. But we understand how busy times are and depending on their schedules, that if they have an assistant principal or you know, the head of counseling um, do that, it would, that would be OK as well. Uh, so my follow-up question, those individuals, are they also part of the training? Because what I worry about is the trickle theory of misinformation. I get it, and I tell you it's three, you tell her it's two, and by the time it gets to you, it's none. You didn't think of it. All right. That's why I think it's important for the principals to engage with their students. So I'm back and forth on right. this. So <laughs> I think maybe if we do allow a choice, Nardis, they have to be required to have the same training, or we don't allow the choice, one or the other, to your point. Okay. okay. So again, similarly, feedback. we're trying to get to the same information, but with a number of different groups, whether it's led by principals, you know, central office folks, superintendents, I'm sorry, um, assistant superintendents. And I kind of thought I heard you say that the school board members would be leading the school board sessions. I, I misunderstood that. Yes, you did. Okay. Oh. You, you, you didn't understand. What, Mutu? 
I think we'll like you to be champion, not necessarily facilitate. Okay, thank you. That's a great distinction because I think it's really important, again, for that message to be high and tight. In our roles, it's slightly different, mm -hmm. and I would hate yeah. for a, there to be a meandering and some tangential um, discussions because yeah. of who we are. Um, so I think I want to also echo what Karen just talked about, Ms. Corbett Sanders just talked about in terms of having that facilitation, that script to be really tight so that we are not all having different conversations and coming to the group with different responses. You will always have your parking lot of stuff. That's how life works. However, it doesn't have to be how we are facilitating um, the dialogue. And by we, I mean generally. Um, page... Uh, I didn't see on page 14 where we are going to have teacher associations. I see teachers. How are those teachers going to be selected? Is it principals? How is that going to be done? And then is there space for those leading groups, not just teacher associations, but what is happening? But bus, driver <laughs> but bus driver associations, yeah. all of those groups that typically attend the 4510s, is yeah. there a space for them? And where is that identified? So Traditionally, um, association leadership would be part of the core instruction or the core team, the core planning team. You want all of the decision making leaders really in that core planning team. Um, whereas the instructional team will likely have um, an open call for educators in some fashion to make sure different content are represented and so forth. But association leadership would be in the core planning team. And the open call for staff is that whoever wants to participate gets to, or they get vetted down to a smaller group? I have not been in those direct conversations here yet, um, so I'm not entirely sure. Once we have the champions um, identified, again, it's more a function of size. I'm comfortable traditionally with just throwing it out there, making sure regions are represented, content, grade levels, and so forth, right? There are certain... Uh, we want to make sure we have voices from all aspects of the educational setting. So I don't know if Marcy and the team, have you already discussed that at all? A little bit. I think, as Dr. Reed said, we were waiting to get some additional feedback from the board and make sure our list was as robust as it was going to be as we started to um, think about how we do a combination maybe of some tapping and some all calling. Okay, I think it's important for there to be representative that's proportionate to all of our different groups, but I'm also leaning very heavily into what Mutu said, to not have anybody be excluded if they're wanting to participate. Uh, my last question, as I see my time dwindling down, there's some here that are identified as reality checks. Can I get a little bit more information in terms of why is that a reality check rather than a general information session, which seems to be the title that I'm using in my mind for the rest? So thank you, and those are some of my favorite sessions, actually, the reality check. Maybe that's because, I, Mutu, do you want to describe those, please? We've had it's, some of our most fun in those sessions. Yeah, the, um, not everyone will be involved to the same degree in everything, and yes, we want them to sign on to whatever we come up with. So we call it a reality check as a, a means of saying, this is what some other folks have thought about, you know, what do you, what do you think? It doesn't happen too often, but it's not uncommon for one person to bring up a, a perspective that no one has thought of before and actually could change the whole trajectory. But more importantly, uh, even if it doesn't get changed, people walk away feeling like we didn't come to them with our fate complete, like, you know, some smart folks have figured it out, you just come along. So we set it up as a, a real uh, opportunity for them to say, I don't agree with that, or have you thought about something else? So that's why we call it a reality check. I I'm so sorry. Isn't that available for all of the groups to do? I just worry about the optics, because on this list, the faith committee gets reality checks, the principals get reality, schools and departments get reality checks, but the core planning team get full sessions. I know I've run out of time, but if there's time, I'd like to explore that. I, I hear you. I, I hear you. Yeah. Thank you. I have Ms. McLaughlin followed by Ms. Cohen. Okay. Um, going down the list as quickly as I can, uh, I do think that our school division and the board can benefit from talking with the board of supervisors, Chairman McKay and the county executive, on their strategic plan process. What were their participation rates? What was their lessons learned? 
Um, certainly, um, I repeatedly say this over and over again, and I don't hear it, Dr. Reed, from your division or your administration and the prior administration, the school board members are one of your key communication portals. So every time I hear everyone being talked about how we're going to reach out, SBS News this, weekly that, if I don't start hearing and the school board members in their newsletters, I'm, I'm just going to reach a breaking point because I don't know how many ways to Sunday to say that we are a team and we are one of the best ways that families open an email, read it, and will participate. So um, I'm sorry, but it's just been years and years of asking why we're not considered a key part of the communications process. Um, I, I think that uh, to what um, Ms. Corbett Sanders said, I want to make sure that whatever we put in front of our families, what we put in front of our students and every stakeholder, if we don't have academics clearly delineated, um, we're missing why so many people live in this county in the first place and send their kids to Fairfax County Schools. Um, I want to thank Mutu for showing us what you're going to do with the students. Dr. Reed, um, I'm very excited about this work, so I want to right. start there. Um, but I would like to see what is going to happen with the rest of our community engagement because um, I was actually hoping that's what we were doing today, not kind of uh, going into in depth on how we'll invite. I think it was a good conversation, but now we've run out of time. And to me, it's the meat and potatoes. What will we bring? To my colleagues, I want to emphasize more than anything, you can't have meaningful strategic plan input if we don't first inform our community on where our needs are. So I wrote, we need to have the data analysis on what are the strategic needs of our students. What is the data telling us that we need to be doing? Because the students are at the center of all of this. And going back to the very beginning, I am not comfortable with the, I think it was the uh, IF, um, T team because we added the family team. So parents are now on the family team. I think looking at our teachers being considered at the center of learning to have a principal's own, you know, team, but then we have a, again, I keep writing the, the information, whatever. Instructional focus. Instructional focus, focus? Mm -hmm. no. If we don't have a teacher bucket by the teachers alone, I think we will pay a price, and I wouldn't blame them. So there are over 15,000 of our employees. They need their own team, and then you can have school-based support staff or however you want to do it. But having a principal-only team and not a teacher-only team, I don't think that sends the right message, and I have run out of time. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Um, yeah. Ms. Ms. Cullen, were there any comments? Yes, ma'am. Yes, go ahead. Got it. I, you got I it. would say that um, we will work on all of the above and get back to you in a, an appropriate setting. I think the data analysis, we have uh, pieces of that completed, um, and I think those are good points. Thank you. Yeah, the, the big thing um, I just want to make sure and then take away from my remarks is um, when and how we can get just a draft of similar to the student um, delivery the, model, okay. what will happen with the other groups. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Cohen, followed by uh, Ms. Tolan. Uh, oh, Mutu, were you going to, I think the similar questions are across the board of all groups, are they not? That's correct. Yeah. It's just framed a little bit differently, but. Yeah. Essentially the same three groups, and then we take the data and bring it, Mutu's team brings it all together. Correct. We'll get that, you'll and, get that to and, the board. And the next time we, we, we can also take you through, walk you through the content. I, I really resonate with the uh, comment about the meta, you know, the meat we're going to cover. We can do the same thing with the, uh, the adult PowerPoint also. We'll, we'll be taking those groups through. Ellen. Yeah, and I would just add into what Ms. McLaughlin said when we talk about teachers just expanding to instructional staff, yeah. Um, I was just going to ask, when we talk about, and I, I appreciate um, Karen kind of trying to think out the box of how do we include other student groups, um, I know several of our schools have a principal's cabinet, 
instead of a student government association. So just making sure we're tapping into whatever it's called in a school. Um, but I guess my question with this survey, I feel like we have this opportunity with the students to deliver that in advisory, and but but train the teachers how to have the conversation. So not just administer the survey, ha have the advisory teachers be able to talk about what is your strategic plan, how does it impact your daily life, how does it impact my life as a teacher, how does it, because I think then those teachers, we you wind up with you know the Venn diagram of everybody over. The teachers get to bring into the conversation the student voice, and the students get to bring in the teacher voice, because in theory, <laughs> Hopefully, we're all working like a linked chain. And so I just think there's this, you know, advisory has been kind of this, um, I was going to say amorphous, but I don't want to undercut the value of it because I think it's incredibly important. But I think this is exactly the kind of thing that we, um, we should capitalize on having this time where there doesn't have to be a work product from our kids in this hour and whatever minutes, um, and morning meeting the same with our elementary schools. Like These are the time to have, what does strategic mean? What does planning mean? What does it look like? What is your, what's a strategic plan in your house? Right. You know, how does your family operate? What core values or any, like, I just think we have this, this moment in time to capture how we educate all of us into why this is important. Um, so I'm hoping maybe we'll consider that. Dr. Reed, can I insert my voice right now just for a second? Because she, yes, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> of course you can. That, she, that was a great idea. But what if we also um, had Michelle do a video that we show before the kids take the survey about why it's important for students to be serious about their feedback to us? She is the student voice on the school board, and seeing her and explaining your role and why might um, engage our students even more. Here, here. I, I love sure. that idea. Um, that's the power of team, right? Like more heads around the table, so fabulous. And I love the idea of layering the experience, right? Because we know that leaning into it and teaching it confirms how you know it, right? So it's a layered, so I love that idea. So I don't know, uh, Dr. King, I know in your shop you have folks, maybe we, not like a ginormous module, but just something so that every staff member can uh, build off of Michelle's video during that time and just have a really thoughtful conversation. That, that, think of the power of that, right? 16,000 yeah. classrooms talking about what being strategic means and how we can, that's a higher and better use of our time and space and resources. I, I love it. You in? Yeah. <laughs> Not putting you on the spot or anything, Michelle. <laughs> All right, um, you still have time. You're done, oh, I love you. Um, uh, Elaine. Okay, um, I love that idea too, and now of course my teaching brain is going um, on how we even perhaps follow up. You know, like our, people are always complaining about how we gather information, we take, they take a survey and then you don't ever hear anything. So especially with our kids, like what happened, what sort of general information came out, you know, keeping them engaged through the process. Um, you know, we have multiple meetings with all these adult groups. Maybe, you know, it's an opportunity, like you said, for 16,000 classrooms to do that. So I like that. Um, I also um, was looking, um, based on some of the things that Ms. McLaughlin said on slide eight, you know, where we have the data, the analysis, the solution. Um, you know, I think that is really important that we have that information available as we're talking to groups. I know that this is probably an iterative process in some ways too through the strategic planning process. So what, what data do we have at the beginning that we can give people and get their feedback and input and then, you know, maybe as we have further meetings we have to, you know, go back and forth. But I think that is important and, and part of the questioning that we have for people along the way. Um, I would like to get a clearer picture of um, where the board is involved. You know, some, a couple of things have come up today about you know, participation in the meetings, and you know, I just wanna make sure we're all prepared and available you know, to do the best job possible around this. So um, a little bit more delineation on that would be helpful. 
Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Mutu, do you want to share in general the um, role of the board? Uh, it's really at two levels. Uh, one would be as a uh, participant. We'll, when you are engaged, uh, first, the, expect, the hope is that each one of you will serve on at, at least one of those uh, standing teams. It could be the alignment team, it could be the core, uh, core planning team. Uh, certainly, you take the lead on the community forum. So, you know, come as a participant so that your own voice as an individual uh, really is part of the exercise. Then the second role is just to be a champion of the entire, uh, the entire process. Uh, if we could have a chance to meet with you like this every month so that we're taking you along with the evolution of the process and getting your feedback. I have, I'm on my fourth page of notes just based on what you've said uh, today. That would be really helpful to uh, me and to my team. So be a champion and also be a participant. You don't have to make any decisions about the strategic plan until it's done. That, that's a key aspect of the approach. So you don't, you don't have to feel called upon to uh, weigh in in a, in a final sense on anything until May. So and I hope that that gives you the freedom, gives you the latitude to let your own participation and your own way of processing things evolve throughout the entire, over the next six, seven months. Thank you. Um, and then qu quickly too on the student participation, um, I think we've kind of evolved from um, having the principals necessarily run the meetings or the adults run the meetings with the kids to the, the students. We talked about with Michelle, the SEALs or the SEA or the you know, Raising Student Voices, whatever the group is at the school, and, you know, those individuals. So they will need that training too. Mm. So, you know, each school may have a group of people that will be trained. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, just thinking on my feet here. That could actually be a very powerful evolution of our thinking, you know, versus where we were two hours ago. I mean, the notion of instead of calling in principal led conversation, we actually have a school team, and that team will include an, the administrator, maybe some other adults in the school, and maybe some students mm -hmm. at the school and they lead the conversation, uh, that would make for a much more inclusive approach than just mandating that the principal leads the conversation. So if that's okay with, with all of you, we can explore that as the, the model going forward. I think we can explore that with the caution that I think Ms. Corbett Sanders shared about making sure we're consistent um, site to site because we don't want to exacerbate that. So I. I think it's to explore with the understanding we want to be consistent. Yeah. And I also think that in no matter which model we use, the one thing we have to really make sure is that training is a key component to this and making sure that everyone is, is fully trained. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to make everyone aware we have three committee groups that we worked really hard to get here. So at 1245, which is 15 minutes later, I think I can get between Michelle and Abrar, we can get everybody's questions in. Please be mindful that we are not going to go beyond 1245 for this session. All right, thank you. Ms. Omesh followed by um, Ms. Tugby. Thanks. Um, before I ask my next set of questions, can I just get clarification on the additional attachments? I guess we're not discussing those today. We are not discussing those today. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Um, so I, I guess uh, thank you for the, the brief presentation, Mutu. I, I'm still struggling a little bit to see kind of what our objective is overall um, and what we're hoping to derive from the community. And I, and I point that because I think getting that kind of laser focus on what the conversations are going to look like, what we're seeking to hear about is critically important. Otherwise, we're spending all this time doing all these meetings and asking questions without clear direction on how that actually will translate in informing what we're doing. Um, I say that because I know with the superintendent search, we did a massive, you know, community outreach thing and it was, you know, tours and going around and, uh, and that was a specific question. Like, what do you want to see in a superintendent? With this, I mean, the strategic plan is so vast. What's our, 
you know, what's our plan? Like, let's think backwards. So we're, uh, you know, in the conversation post-community outreach where we're saying, okay, now how, what are we going to build? What will be useful to us to know about where the community's at to build that? I, I don't know if... I don't know that we've connected those dots quite yet. I, I didn't quite get that from the presentation, but... Mutu, do you want to respond to that? I, I, uh, if I think I, I'd like to maybe by showing you an example from another uh, district. This was actually just last week. The, with the, can you see my screen? See the Hillsborough mm -hmm. School District? Okay. With the uh, uh, community forum, the content depends on where we are with the overall process. But everything is still about those four questions. What data do we have? What does the data say? Why does the data look that way? What are we going to do about it? So the front end community forum will be focused on looking at the data. What data do we have? What does the data say? Why does the data look that way? By the time we come to the second set of community forums, we'll be much farther into the process. We'll be, we'll be asking about solutions. So this example I'm gonna show you is, this, is uh, with a district that's close to the end of the process. So the questions are around the goals and the strategies, right? So um, we will, it, was, it starts pretty much the same way. They all do, we take time to uh, set the context, so I'm going to go through very quickly. You've seen all of this before. They have their own uh, team. As you can see, they had only like uh, eight, eight circles around the core planning team. With um, uh, uh, Fairfax, we up to 10, and I, I really think that's very fresh. So uh, profile of their students, profile of students, mm -hmm. and then for this particular community forum, the deep dive was into the portrait of a graduate for them. So Ms. Omish, the content is gonna be about one or more of what's on the, in this column, depending on uh, where we are at the points we have in a community forum. So uh, with mm -hmm. this group, their first community forum was to take a deep look into the portrait of a graduate and this is some of the things we use to facilitate. We start off with a, you know, a quote or a guiding statement just to get the conversation going, you know, cast a really wide net. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get them into the uh, exercise part of a graduate, you know, what are your hopes? What will the employer look for, et cetera? And then they get to work to tell us what they think. If there's been a draft already, then we will show them the draft. We never start any group by saying, let's show you what the other folks have said. We don't start that way. We actually usually hide what's been done to date and allow each group to tell us what they think. And then you show them what's come before. And often it's very uh, affirming for them because you see the overlap. And as you can see, this group, the, uh, for this community forum, the stakeholders identified the, the qualities before we show them what the core planning team had come up with. So that's really the process. Then we do the same thing with the goals. So they will come up with the goals that they would like to see as, a, as, a, as forum participants. And then we show them the draft from the core planning team or the alignment team or the instructional focus team, depending on, again, where we are in the process. Okay, so, so this is showing them the draft. And then the uh, next part will be the strategies. And again, we lead off with questions for them to process without biasing them with what other folks have done. And then it's after that that we'll, we'll show them. So that it's, that's really the way everything uh, rolls out. Everyone is about, um, everyone is about this page. Okay, the right right side, and at each forum, they're given a chance to say what they think first. Then they're shown what's been done, and then that's where the, the process unfolds. Yeah. Okay. So, the, and this will depend on what point in time we're in. So, what you just outlined, exactly. yeah, is not happening for every group meeting. It's just for a specific point in time. 
exactly. exactly. Okay. Um, I appreciate this. I think you know we don't have this material or, or things that align with this. I think that would be helpful because uh, that's probably part of where our headspace. You know, we want to discuss or think about how to make the most of these conversations and how they'll be useful to us as we formulate the next steps. I'm mindful, I, I know Tammy's uh, pushing me on time here, so I'll, I'll leave that there, but I just I think there's a lot unexplored um, on this piece, and, and I certainly trust the team, but I think we could benefit from some conversation around those components that we didn't have to talk about today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Amesh. Um, Ms. Togby, and you'll be the last word on this. All right, so I had a few questions. I'll try to be quick. Um, so the questions on the survey, is there any chance they can kind of be phrased in a manner where it could be less, more of a discussion with the teachers? So instead of having, like, what's your main issue with X, Y, and Z, it'll be, like, the teacher kind of leading the question on the survey and making it more of, like, a classroom discussion. So that way students don't necessarily feel like this is to be completely frank, like a waste of their time. Mutu. I'm not sure if I understand the question. Can you ask that, ask that again, please? Yeah, I was wondering if there's any chance that the questions on the student survey will be phrased kind of open-ended in the sense where the teachers can be leading that discussion. And at some point, the teachers can also like explicitly state what is a strategic plan, like. Why are you taking part in this and things like that? Okay. We can do that with the uh, the shift that we've talked about today, but I, I want to check for understanding, please. The uh, These are the types of questions that we just offer as prompts. They don't necessarily have to ask all of them. Would these kinds of questions be in line with what you have in mind? So these questions would be on the survey, or is this just for the Group that the oh, no, principal... oh, oh, I got it. No, there are two separate documents. The, the survey questions are, I think they're like about 25 or 30 questions, and they're on a Likert scale, you know, from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And the students get to do those uh, privately. Those are anonymous responses. Okay. So and that's the online survey part of it. Uh, I don't know if you have the, if you've seen the questions, if you haven't, I'm sure we can share them with you. Mm -hmm. Then there are these questions that are the prompts for discussion. And this is where the, the student leaders or the principal or the teachers get to ask these types of questions. So there are really two, two concurrent activities going on when it, when it comes to feedback from the students. Okay, thank you. And then thank I you. was wondering, how are we getting the students for the principal-led discussion? Because I know there tends to be a tendency to pick just like, your leadership class and just going through the questions like that. How are we making sure that we're getting our season D students, our students who might not participate in sports and clubs and things like that? Because when I say, what is your experience like? And I hear a lot of positive things. I might not be hearing the positive things from those students. And I might be hearing the negative things that not a majority of student bodies understand or are experiencing. Um, and then I know that the I just, I'm kind of lost where at the point of the student input will they just kind of get the explicit understanding of what strategic planning is and why it's really important that they participate. Because I really think if we draw that line early on, they'll be more willing to be involved. And yeah. I think that was it for me. Yeah, that's Thank you. And I see Ms. Keys Gamar, you have your hand up, so you will be the last commenter. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I will try to keep it um, brief. Um, I, I guess as I'm listening to everyone, I'm a little concerned about the next opportunity to really understand what it is, how we're going forward. And in my previous comments, I said it's important to make sure that the community understands with a clear purpose how we're moving forward. I have not heard comments on how that's going to happen or at least perhaps I missed it with respect to how that's going to happen regarding uh, engaging in this strategic plan. Um, I'm also concerned about fidelity of implementation and making sure that our principals are engaging within our schools to achieve maximum effectiveness and efficiency and engagement of our staff time. 
Um, I would say Fidel, I'll give you an opportunity to respond. I saw your lips moving. Sir, Mr. Jones, I thought you were getting ready to say something. Well, I, you know, I was, I, I was really, that was just my brain working when you say the fidelity of, of implementation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's just something that we will need to work on after this part of the process of, of what comes out of this information. And then it's, if, if, if you're talking about after the data are collected and uh, analyzed, and then we need to look at what does that mean in terms of uh, behavior of the leadership within the district. Um, I guess I guess my question goes more to gathering the data in a in a with fidelity across the district to make sure we don't have to go back and fix stuff is more yeah. where my comments are are geared. Okay, uh, that's that's a move to question. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's always top of mind. Uh, the the best way to make sure we do a great job is upfront planning. Just really planning well and then um you know hoping that we haven't missed something in it when we have to implement uh that could still happen and if it does we just have to figure out how to fix it but it, it's it's doing due, due diligence on thinking through the planning phase and uh we call phase one is everyone ready to go and that the more people we talk to the uh more finely focused the the approaches. So we got a lot of a lot of feedback. We got to go back and change a few things. So uh, I guess as a board member, I'm wondering how this conversation shakes out, and I'm anxious for an opportunity to see how you process this information, so that board members uh, have an yeah. opportunity to give input to the final product. Um, I will say, in the past, um, when we have dealt with issues, we've relied a lot on emails and things of that nature which I do not consider to be a communications plan. And yeah. so it makes me a little nervous going forward, although I you know, appreciate your expertise. Um, if once, once we don't gather it well, then it's problematic. So I am hoping for an opportunity as one board member, whether it's two by twos or however we do it, I think there needs to be some follow-up because this is too important. Yeah. Yeah. I, will, I will hope, or I will recommend, um, you know, at least maybe one more session. I don't know if the board is meeting in, on uh, November that we come back. We've we've taken a lot of input. It's going to evolve, but the first real rollout will be early November with the survey. If there's a way to you know engage the board and say this is the plan going forward, that would be great. Now it's it's always good for us to get feedback from you know from our stakeholders, which includes the board, obviously. I, I realize we have a time concern. So I will say I'm looking forward to that because I think that's going to be the most effective way to use our time. Yeah, that's great. Just so we all know on um, the uh, 29th of November, we do have a strategic plan governance session and that is for most of the day. So Mutu, I will ask Dr. Reed to work with you directly to see if that is gonna fit into your calendar because we have worked hard to keep, and not, you know, to have this as the kind of information launch uh, and, and then have a further uh, where we're not up, up against so much a time constraint as we are today because that would be all day from 11 to four talking about strategic plan as well as governance, so. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I, oh, I did have one question about surveys. Um, it, it, are the surveys just going to be for the students or are they going to be for other stakeholder groups? Your students. Hmm. I have a little concern about that and I'm just hearing a little rumbling around the table. So um, can you can you tell us why you decided not to do that? I guess I'll go there. I don't have a good reason, actually. <laughs> we, okay. we don't always do the adults, uh, but we, we can do that, you know, also. Okay. We can do, we've done parents, we've done teachers, and uh, we've done community also. Usually most districts don't get uh, high enough response rate, but we're open to it. Uh, it, it. It's not standard, but we're open to it, absolutely. 
We will definitely revisit that. Yeah. Yeah, because it's our, it was my intent that we survey all staff, all families, okay. and all students. So I will get back with the team and we'll right. clarify and, that. And, and, and thank you um, yeah. because, Mutu, we are accustomed to that here in Fairfax County, even though maybe response rates are not always um, as high as we would like. But thank you all. Um, thank you, Mutu. Thank, thank you. you, Kenneth. Thank you, everyone around the table for your hard work in getting us um, this information today. Really appreciate it. It's really exciting work. And we yeah. will um, continue the options um, of, uh, uh, or, or continue, I, I think, uh, the colleagues who were feeling that we need to have regular updates at our Thursday meetings. I think that's a great idea. We will, though, discuss that in chairs, how that can work and what that looks like on the agenda. And we do have meetings scheduled, as I said, I mentioned the November one, but we also have a February one as well. So we have already integrated these into our calendar to ensure that we have, and if we need to rearrange things to have one in January, we will do that. So thank you thank all. You. Um, it is uh, 12.50. It's 9.50. Uh, 9.50 where you are. It's 11.50. Um, the, the intent and is to, um, to now we are uh, we are 30 minutes well uh, 20 minutes behind um, we will um, so that will give us a 120 we will start the next session and we will go accordingly we will have one hour for each of the uh, annual uh, committee reports from um, ACE uh, CTE and depending on the questions we will see if we get if we need to rearrange the last one because I I'm trying to respect everybody's timeline of having a hard stop at four today. I know I personally have to leave at that time as well. Dr. Reed. If you could, I'm going to collect back your blue folders with the attachments we didn't get to today so that we won't have to reprint them for a future presentation on them. If I have one in my binder, I'm going to keep mine there. Is that okay? That's fine. All right. We just, thank okay. You. Thanks. All right. Lunchtime, thank gang. Thank you. We will re resume at 120. Noon. I see people are trickling in. Looks like we have seven, and we have a fairly tight agenda for the rest of this afternoon. So we are going to rock and roll. I am super excited um, to present Ken Balbrena and the rest of the ACE committee. We have several members whom I hope he will introduce in his opening remarks. Oh, yes. Dr. Anderson, I would just like um, to make a note that this afternoon's agenda was modified um, because um, we will not be able to um, see today's um, agenda item number five, uh, which was the uh, advisory committee for students with disabilities that will be rescheduled. Thank you. Thank you so much for that clarification. Um, I um, see lots Madam of- Madam Chair, may I be recognized, please? Yes, Ms. Marin. Yeah, I just want to send apologies to the Advisory Committee for Student with Disabilities, one of our three state-sanctioned committees that we have not been able to hear their report. I, I think it's really, um, really awful that we haven't heard their report and prioritized hearing from them. I know scheduling is an issue, but it is really quite a shame, and I look forward to hearing the report as soon as possible. Thank you so much, Ms. Marin. I don't see any other speakers before we just jump in. Uh, and again, I just want to reiterate how excited I am to have this report uh, be provided by ACE. I was lucky enough in the last year to serve as their board liaison, and this team works hard. Uh, they keep me on my toes the entire meeting, and I'm just very grateful for all of their efforts, um, from the chair, Ken Balbuena, to every other member of that committee. So without any further delay, Mr. Balbuena, you are on. All right, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I greatly appreciate it, and I appreciate all the time that uh, Dr. Anderson has put into the committee and invested in us. And uh, thank you for the extra time to speak with the, uh, you know, the time that was allocated for the Disabilities Committee. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. So, uh, too soon. All right, well, we were very excited to be able to uh, accept our charge this year and to really put together some good work and really advance things forward to help uh, move ACE forward into a post-pandemic setting. So I believe there is a presentation that's going to be up on screen if it's not already. All right, perfect. All right, so as Dr. Anderson said, my name is Ken Balbuena, and again, I'm happy to present to you.
Okay, perfect. All right, so our charge this year was to assess how the community education, adult ESOL, and adult high school completion programs can better, uh, be better positioned to serve the lifelong learning needs of Fairfax County given the new learning environment necessitated by COVID-19. So that was a charge that we definitely wanted to you know, really look at within the frame of adult and community education. But in order to look at where we are and where we can go, we had to take a step backwards and look at where we came from. So we did a recap of FY21. And in that, we administered a survey following the spring term, and we really wanted to look at a couple of different things. Um, we wanted to look at you know, instructor preference. So if you're an instructor, do you have a preference to teach online, or do you have a preference to teach in person? Uh, what about the type of class? Does that make an impact on whether you want to teach in person, or virtual, or even hybrid? And what does student engagement look like? And what we found from the instructor survey as well as the student survey, because the two of them really mirrored each other, is that instructors definitely tend to prefer to teach in person versus completely virtual in general. But when it came to virtual versus hybrid, that's where the classroom-based and lab-based preference came in. So classes that were more classroom-based, such as um, you know, business classes, those uh, instructors and students prefer to actually have a more virtual than hybrid experience. Whereas those classes that were lab-based or tech-based, uh, there was a preference to have a hybrid model versus a fully virtual model. Uh, and, but when we looked at whether teachers um, answered that they felt like they had the necessary tools to teach online, and when we looked at the students, who said that they felt like they had the necessary tools to learn online, those who answered yes to those questions tended to rank higher in terms of whether they preferred virtual versus hybrid. So that was consistent across the entire board. So in short, we wanted to take this um, information and really wanted to look at how we can move forward. But we also wanted to look to see what actions were taken from our FY21 report. Were there things that were done that were recommendations that the school board either acted on or that staff acted on? And the answer was that we found three things. First, there were ESSER funds that were dedicated towards adult and community education for wellness and uh, for the Fairfax County Adult High School. So thank you very much to the school board for your support in those regards. We also saw that staff uh, looked at the different data that we had presented in the surveys and they really tried to figure out which classes they could schedule both virtually as well as in a hybrid format. Um, and that was supported as one of our recommendations from our FY21 report. Uh, there's also an effort to modernize and streamline the apprenticeship courses. So there definitely were some actions that were taken following our FY21 report, and we were very happy to see that. So as far as our FY22 actions, we ended up forming five different subcommittees. Um, Previously, the committee had not, the ASA advisory committee had not done any kind of subcommittees. It really was the work of individuals, and a lot of that work fell on my predecessor, um, Brian Graham. And I looked at the bylaws. The bylaws said that we were able to actually create different subcommittees. And I was like, hey, that's a great idea. Let's not have all the work follow me, but let's let the collective whole and the uh, people that you have appointed take some action and take some ownership of the committee's work as well. So the five committees that we created, there was a curriculum subcommittee, a technology subcommittee, enrollment subcommittee, completion to success subcommittee, and a marketing and outreach subcommittee. So in short, the curriculum subcommittee's role was to really look at the classes and what classes could continue to be moved online versus those that needed to be in person. The technology subcommittee wanted to see if there was enough sufficient technology to support our ACE programs, uh, both from registration as well as to execution in the classroom, so the entire student life cycle. The, yes. Oh, sorry about that. Didn't realize I was ahead a little bit. Thank you, Karen. All right, the technology subcommittee you know, really wanted to look at the technology and how do we optimizing things. The enrollment subcommittee wanted to look at, um, are, we, are our students across the county really enrolled in our ACE programs, or are there certain pockets that you know, really are the only places where ACE students register? 
Completion of success, do our programs make a difference? Is there a way to track the student output once they complete our programs? And finally, marketing and outreach. Are people aware of our programs? Are we leveraging our internal FCPS resources enough to really present ACE in a very positive way? Okay. Some of the other things that we did, there was also our um, GNR recruiting to bring Dr. Reed here. So we had a meeting with them so they were aware of ACE's programs and who we are, what we do, and how the next superintendent uh, could really be an advocate for ACE programs. We wanted to look at some of the training and, scho the training and scholarship foundation. Are students getting the resources they need and financially in terms of scholarships to be able to attend classes if they want to? And finally, if we are going to represent ACE, I thought it was important that our committee visit some of the sites. What does it look like where the classes are offered? So we ended up going to Plum Center, and we had scheduled a visit to Bryant High School, but we ended up deferring that until the fall. All right, so in terms of our recommendations, we did have five recommendations that we wanted to present to the school board. Um, all right, recommendation number one is we wanted to shift a greater amount of expenses from the ACE fund to the school operating fund in order to better support ACE's overall financial uh, stability. Recommendation number two is to support one-time funding to procure a new course management and registration system for ACE uh, and adult ESOL classes that, take that takes advantage of the latest technologies available and improves the community's experience with finding and registering for ACE classes. Recommendation number three leverage existing FCPS technologies and tools by making them available to all instructors and students, such as Schoology, to remove barriers and improve the online learning experience. Recommendation number four is to expand communication and partnership between K-12 schools and the three components of the ACE Advisory Committee. And recommendation number five is to support the marketing and outreach needs of ACE holistically through a consistent awareness of ACE programs and greater alignment with existing priorities and strategies. So first, we want to look at the first particular recommendation. That one was one that was general across the entire committee. It wasn't just one specific subcommittee's recommendation. And so for that one, shifting a greater amount of expenses from the ACE fund to the school operating fund. Um, we love our teachers. We love being able to support them. One thing that's not always considered is when there are teacher raises, there is a financial impact to ACE that's not necessarily the most positive. Since ACE is a revenue, uh, supposed to be a revenue generating program, when there are um, unfunded mandates to the operating budget via teacher raises, that is a way that the program needs to find uh, how to absorb that cost somehow, but still try and generate some sort of profit um, to support its own programs. So we thought about it long and hard, and we came up with two options that we wanted to present to the school boards for their consideration. First option is that we transfer four leadership team positions from the ACE fund to the school operating fund. Um, there are a couple of positions that currently are supported by the school operating fund, but most of the leadership positions are on the, um, on the ACE fund. So that would be a total cost of about $611,000, $670,000, which is approximately 13% of ACE's non-grant expenditures for FY22. Now, I realize that is a little bit of a sticker shock, I'm sure, for some of you. So we wanted to present a second option. And the other option was to fund some high-ticket items that are incurred by ACE, which could include driver education vehicles and some of the fuel charges that are associated with that. Uh, some uh, labs that are called dirty labs to help with um, you know, basically technology and other additional laptops and equipment as well as some marketing expenses. So those are the two options that we wanted to present in terms of a financial shift on how ACE is funded. Now, if that were to be done, staff estimates that it would be about $320,000 savings that could be passed off to the students in terms of tuition, um, tuition breaks to keep enrollment competitive and accessible. And ACE has not quite rebounded back to its, its pre-COVID enrollment levels, but we're getting there. We did have a 37.5% increase over the enrollment that we had during the full year of the pandemic. 
And I should mention that uh, one of the attachments in the annual report is the Office of the Auditor General's report from 2018. And this particular shift from finances from the school, um, from, to the school operating fund, it reinforces the recommendations that were presented in the auditor's report. Um, additionally, the ACE Advisory Committee encouraged staff to continue to look for alternative ways of funding the program, such as teacher grants, uh, or such as uh, grants. And there was a particular Department of Labor grant that I know was applied for last year. Uh, so in addition to having a general recommendation from the entire committee, each subcommittee also looked at whether they wanted to have a recommendation. Uh, the curriculum subcommittee thought that staff was doing a very good job of analyzing which classes can be moved over into a virtual format or a hybrid format. So they did not really have any recommendations for terms of purposes of the annual report. Uh, they thought a staff was doing a very, very good job with that. In terms of enrollment and how things have shifted online, you'll see that the first column all the way to the left-hand side of the graph that's on screen now, um, you'll see that there's very, very little online instruction, as you can barely see any kind of orange on screen. At the beginning of the pandemic, you'll see that there's a little bit of hybrid and, and virtual instruction that ended up taking place, and then it shifted to almost two-thirds during the full year of the pandemic. But now that FY22, last year, we had a little bit more of a quote-unquote normal year, you'll see that that allocation of online versus in-person shifted back a little bit more towards being in-person. Technology subcommittee had two different recommendations. I suppose they wanted to average out a little bit so that everybody gets one recommendation, but they had two recommendations. And one is to support one-time funding for a new course management system and for registration. And the second was to leverage existing FCPS technologies, such as Schoology, that could be made available for ACE programs. So looking at um, the, on -time, the registration, so on-time funding for a new course, man or one-time funding for a course management system is actually something that could be very beneficial. I talk about that a little bit later in the presentation, so I'm not going to talk about it right now. But there are some FCPS technologies that ACE uses that are a little bit antiquated. There's a 20-year-old um, technology for some of the, in some of the instances. Um, it's not a very good user experience, and I'll have a screen grab a little bit later where you can see what it looks like. But in terms of like aligning the K-12 system with ACE, Things like Schoology could not only reduce costs, but it makes for a very uh, fluid transition from the K-12 system into ACE. The Enrollment Subcommittee, they reinforced recommendation number two to have this new course management system. They found that it's a little difficult to see where students are registering from and very easily because there's, the registration system does not really allow for that in an easy way to pull a report to see are there enough people on the eastern side versus the western side of the county or north and south and so on and so forth. Um, there was also something that they found that is touched on in the annual report that in some cases like in plumbing, for example, there may be an employer that plays for, pays for a class, but that particular employer will only pay for one class and not pay for the entire uh, program, which might be like five classes, for example. So in cases like that, we can't tell from our current registration system whether or not a student is interested in one particular class or if they're interested in an entire program. So it makes it difficult to sort of track um, another committee's work, the Completion of Success Committee. Now in terms of what our program looks like, if a student goes to register, this is the registration system that they see. So it does look like it's a very early version of Amazon, when, back when Amazon only sold textbooks. GeoCities, exactly. So it's not necessarily the most user-friendly, um, and that's no knock on you know, ACE staff, it's the tools that they have to work with. Now, what does that compare to for other systems? What I found, interestingly enough, is that we are actually the only system in Northern Virginia that has a registration system. If you look at some of the other school systems, like Arlington, for example, you have to send an email, and then you will get like a registration packet. So if FCPS, if the school board were able to invest in some sort of registration system, we would actually be on the cutting edge and that would give us a competitive advantage that other systems in the area don't have. If you look at Virginia Beach, Virginia Beach has a very similar system that is very user friendly. You know, um, and same thing with Richmond. Richmond's is a little bit more kind of almost like PeopleSoft if you're familiar with how Nova does their registration system. So 
you know, there are precedents in Virginia where ACE programs do have a registration system, but in the Northern Virginia area, we are the only one, and our system is really not that great. As far as recommendation number four, four and five are very similar. It's a completion of success committee. Um, it's expanding the partnership between K-12 schools, and it says here the three components of ACE. I do want to make a quick clarification that's in the uh, annual, that's not in the, reflected in the annual report, is um, we mistakenly spoke and said that there are three components of ACE. Uh, what it really should say is that there are three components that the ACE Advisory Committee oversees. And they're very distinct ones, which we'll get into in the next one. But in short, it's the Adult and Community Education Advisory Committee, or sorry, Adult and Community Education, there's Adult ESOL, and then there's um, the high school completion, so Fairfax County Adult High School. So, but looking at them in, in a, an alignment from the K-12 system, let's just say that there's a student who maybe drops out of school. Um, they're an English language learner. So if you are in an English language program learning adult ESOL while you're enrolled in the Fairfax County Adult High School, there are opportunities for you to be able to transfer into an ACE program, such as construction or some of the other trades, where you can then develop a career. And I don't think that that's always a line. There's always a very big focus on uh, college readiness and getting ready and getting focused on college. But there are other alternatives. And you know, for some people who maybe college is not something that they're ready for at this time, ACE is a perfect solution for them. So we want to make sure that there's alignment in people's minds, um, not just from you know, the school board's perspective, but maybe even the administrators, even some of the college counselors. So I think having that alignment would work in the benefit of ACE, as well as for all of our students. Um, also, there are 57,000 residents that are age 25 and older who have yet to complete or attain a high school diploma. And Fairfax County Adult High School is a great opportunity for them. Uh, there are a couple other things here. There might be some barriers like access to appropriate transportation, adequate staff members. So if there is an awareness that maybe this particular site in Herndon might be a good place for um, you know, an ACE program, that could be something that is brought forward to you know, the administration's attention. But also looking at this and thinking holistically and thinking of the students, not only aligned with the portrait of a graduate model, but also aligns with the Fairfax One policy uh, or the One Fairfax policy and expands access. Okay. One thing I do want to say that um, I think I skipped over. Let me skip back one slide. It's on one of these slides, but it says over here that um, the, let me see if it's that one. Okay, um, it's recommendation number five. Let's go back to here. My apologies. Okay, so recommendation number five, supporting the marketing and outreach needs of ACE holistically through the consistent awareness ACE programs um, can greater align with some of the existing priorities and strategies. So I mentioned about the three components of ACE, adult uh, community, uh, community education, adult ESOL, Fairfax County Adult High School. So those are the three components in a very visual representation that we have here. But also, some of the things that um, really are not present, for example, is uh, the inclusion of ACE and CIP. You know, we have not, ACE facilities have not really had a renovation since 2007. And they're not included in the current list of CIP projects that are identified from FY23 to 27. Uh, although that said, ACE did benefit from some of the um, consolidation of multiple locations in the Herndon area during the FY19. But as far as a dedicated ACE facility, there has not been a renovation since 2007. So when we're thinking of things holistically, that is something that the committee is requesting that the school board, Dr. Reed, uh, considers. So just some key takeaways here. ACE enrollment is on the rise, but the deficits continue to be a challenge. And upfront funding for some of the different um, items might be a way to alleviate some of these deficits. Short-term investments in technology can reap long-term benefits. And thinking of ACE holistically as a better service to FCPS students at varying stages of their life throughout their careers, and ultimately, uh, has them make a positive influence on society. So with that said, are there any questions? 
All right, thank you very much, Mr. Balbuena. Before we get into school board member questions, and I see many placards have gone up, could you please take a moment to introduce the staff that is here from ACE as well as the rest of the committee members? Sure. All right, I'm going to turn it over to our school board liaison, sorry, our uh, ACE liaison, Karen Williams, to do the introductions. Okay, so um, we have me. I'm Karen Williams. I'm the Director of Operations and Strategic Planning for ISD, and ACE is part of my responsibility. Um, and we have Joe Thompson at the table. He's our um, non traditional schools special projects administrator, and he is the overseas of Fairfax Adult High School and other programs. I have Rich Polio, the Director of Adult ESOL here at the table, and then um, we have M Dr. Michelle Morgan, who is the administrator for the Fairfax Adult High School, Paul Steiner, the administrator for ACE um, Community Programs, Monica Skander, who's our staff assistant, and... Can you get your microphone a oh, little bit closer? Sure, Thank you. sure. Um, we have um, Shakira Alvarado. She is the administrator for our AFLA grant, and our vice chair for the ACE Advisory Committee is Lois Passman. Okay, I think I got everyone. I think I have everyone. Yes, I okay. think you did. Thank you. Um, we have several com several board members, so we'll start there. Um, Mr. Frisch, followed by Ms. McLaughlin. I am Karen. so sorry. Were yeah. you first? I saw one. Karen, I you so go ahead, Karen. Yeah. I thought he was first, so we'll go with Mr. Frisch, and then we'll go to Ms. Corbett Sanders. <clears throat> um, thank you for the presentation and the work this past year, or I guess it was <laughs> a little earlier than that. Um, so when we talk about how to save money, I'm curious how much we spend on the catalog, the printed catalog that gets mailed to folks. So that I'm gonna defer to uh, Paul. You happen to know. I don't need an exact figure, even just ballparking it. Ballpark. Uh, I believe is about $350,000 per year is what we spend for marketing. Um, and how much of that do you think is the catalog? Well, we have, if you have been a Fairfax County resident, we've made changes to the catalog to really save money on printing and distribution of the catalog. We've also executed uh, this past year an RFP uh, to modernize our marketing. And so printing of the catalog used to be four times a year, and it was fairly standard. It also drove when we offered classes and how we would inform students. So we're modernizing that. And what's really important, uh, to give you a real world example right now, um, conversations with high school seniors about what they're doing after graduation. Those happen in March, April, and May with FCPS staff. With a catalog for apprenticeship classes that didn't hit the the home of that student until August, after that student graduated and had some time to him or herself, it's not effective. So we've modernized the way that we offer classes and, and our terms set up. And then our marketing, we also need to mirror that. So having a catalog that comes out four times a year uh, is something that we are looking at uh, improving, implementing, along with social media, digital, uh, and other ways that we can uh, reach potential students. Um, so we have an RFP on printing. Uh, we also have an RFP for marketing in all things, let's say digital, social media. I am, uh, I'm deferring to those experts in marketing um, because I'm, a, you know, I'm an educational administrator. So we are getting help to modernize and really reach those students more effectively. What's the RFP in printing asking for? Cheaper printing or is it looking to move away from printing? Uh, a little bit of both. And, and what we are actually embarking on is uh, looking at all of our options, looking at what our menu is in terms of what we can do, and then using our allotted budget to really reach our students more effectively. You know, um, that's something uh, 
you know, I don't know what I don't know. That's why I'm, I'd like to utilize information from a marketing expert. So if I want to reach more students in the demographic of 16 to 24, what is the most bang for my buck? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> okay. um, I ask these questions because I've believed for many years that the catalog is a waste of money, um, by and large. I'm sure we get some people through it, but there's no way to know if it's the most effective way of doing it because it's, it's just what we're doing, right? Um, so we know the demographics of the people who sign up for our various offerings, right, for different programs or classes. There is no reason in the world why we shouldn't be able to reach those demographics specifically with messages around the programs that are most likely to appeal to them through digital advertising where we hit them over and over and over again, let alone for people that latently come to the website and check things out. We could have you know, remarketing pixels on the website to follow them with ads. All of these things, I, I will be honest, the $300,000 figure is astonishing to me. That is a massive potential marketing budget for um, digital, which I, I have no way of knowing it for sure, but I'm fairly certain you would see a giant increase in the number of students signing up for programs if we were reaching them that way. Mr. Fisher, if I may, um, just my background is also in marketing communications, and now I work as a government consultant. But um, part of it, I think, would be a bait and switch. If you were to invest in a large marketing campaign and get them to the current registration system that they have now, and they have a hard time getting through it. Oh, I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't update that. I think that goes hand in hand. I'm not even sure if the current system could even handle a remarketing pixel. I have no idea. Um, but there are a number of things, like getting them there to begin with, I think, is, is half the challenge. And then you've got the challenge of is it easy for how many clicks is it taking for them to get from visiting the website to getting registered for a class. You want to remove as many barriers as possible. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think about is you know Google search results. When somebody's looking for baseline offerings that we have that other people have too, whether it's Nova or, or other uh, programs, are we in the mix when it comes to what people are finding at the top of their Google search results? Those are the kinds of things that I would be looking for in this RFP um, and making sure that we are leaning heavily on people who know best practices, current best practices, when reviewing what we get back from that RFP. Um, so I know that we have access to, to some very smart people, and I hope that as we get those submissions back, that we are leaning heavily on them. I will tell you this, the marketing world is really good at marketing. And so if you don't have people who can see through the baloney, uh, in what they're telling, you know, this is the latest thing. We're the only ones who can do it. All lies, all lies. And you need people in that room who can see uh, fact mm -hmm. from fiction uh, so that we don't buy something that's just a, a further waste of, of resources. Um, is there any thought as to whether we could partner with Nova uh, on using their system to, to as, as the backbone for our system and maybe a cost sh saving measure? I think that might be a little difficult since it's a state institution, and so there have to be some sort of RF, um, like an MOU that's signed by the school board in Nova. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if that's. So I, I'll just uh, mention that we did look around the around the Commonwealth actually for any registration system that we could piggyback or, or use, yeah. you know, and not go go through the RFP process. Uh, we really didn't find anything no <laughs> that that gave us the full range. Um, Virginia Park or um, Fairfax County Park Authority had a pretty robust system, um, so we had been working with them a little. But we had some good lessons learned from them, so we, we feel like we're in a good position to okay. be able to purchase something that's fairly inexpensive, not too customizable at this point. <laughs> and and do those systems update over time, or are we stuck with it until we do another? So we specifically asked for a web-based um, solution in um, well, we will be asking for a web-based solution in our RFP. So we have our IT department working on the um, requirements with us, so we're making sure that it stays with best practice of where our IT department is going to, because as Ken said, this current system is about 20 years old, and it is proprietary, and it's very difficult to keep updated. So and Just to follow up on my last comment, too, I mean, when I said it's state institute, it's part of VCCS, so you'd have to go through VCCS, not just NOVA. Right. All right, one last reiteration of how important it is to be using digital in the right way. You know, 
we are leaving potential students on the table by not reaching people who have come to the website and walked away or who have taken classes previously or who have searched for classes that we're offering and not signed up. Um, so hopefully we can move that in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frisch, Ms. Corbett Sanders, and then Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, couple things. One, we are one Fairfax. And I get frustrated with this conversation almost annually because we don't talk about the close alliance and the overlap between what we do and what Parks does. And so I would like to better understand because if they have a great registration system or a better registration system than we have, and they offer similar classes, we try very hard not to rep be repetitive with the classes they offer. Why aren't we doing this as a joint venture between Parks and ACE to address especially those things that are not the core education focus, um, but are more like workforce development? So that's my first question, if you want to answer that. And then if you want to stop my, it keeps going. Five seconds. So regarding the um, park service in particular, we have annual meetings with them. We are not duplicative of their program at all. They advertise for us, we advertise for them. The one thing we don't share um, is their registration system. So it is something that we looked at and before the RFP goes out on the street and I buy anything or have Dr. Presidio buy us anything, we, I mean, we'll definitely look at that again. I think that's a really great suggestion. Um, but we, we work very closely with them on a regular basis. So there should not be any confusion in the community which programs we offer versus which programs they're offering. And again, we do advertise in each other's publications um, and our, our websites. With all respect, there is a lot of confusion. And so we do need to find a way of presenting one Fairfax as one Fairfax. And if there were a central portal for people to get to all of the courses available, then it would allow for us to even capture people that may decide, I'm looking for this, I can't quite find this in parks, but I can find something close over in ACE. So that would be my first um, advocacy. Secondly, um, when you talk about the CIP process, I'm a little surprised that you did not mention that as part of the county CIP process is the redevelopment of the original Mount Vernon High School, which I have been told multiple times ACE is going into that building. And so have you brought that to the um, ACE Advisory Committee so they better understand what that role is going to be? I think Lois has talked um, on occasion about uh, the old Mount Vernon High School. I don't know if there's anything you want to bring up, Lois, on that. It was whether, um, we've, whether we've discussed about the old Mount Vernon High School and being able to use it for ACE purposes. We discussed it was probably in passing because it's been promoted or advertised that's going to happen. Whether it's actually happening, I think it's still uh, on a going to be kind of thing. Not at all. As Lois and I have a shared um, past from the standpoint that Lois was the original chair of what they were going to do with that building in 1985. And I actually chaired that building uh, re reinvention committee um, in 2015. And then subsequent to that, and we've had multiple conversations, I know Dr. Presidio has been engaged, the county executive has been engaged, that um, ACE is going into that building. And so I think you all need to have a, a full briefing on that and some input into it because that's your CIP play right now. Because they've, they've talked about Nova and ACE yeah. all the, from the beginning, from, you know, from five years ago. Yeah, I would, I would just briefly add, I mean, I appreciate that advocacy from Ms. Corbett Sanders. Um, she and I have worked on this project for over five years now, and um, we're hoping to have more of a, a definitive affirmation of what capacity we'll be able to occupy in that building very soon. Uh, but you are correct. We've been told that there will be some ability for us uh, to offer ACE programming in that location um, once the, the refurbishing is complete. But that's still not finalized to what capacity, but we do look forward to that partnership with the county in that space. And we've both been pushing 
Well, and you know, there's confirmation. You all are getting space in that building, and it's a substantial amount of space. So I think that there has to be that conversation, because when you say you're, nobody's talking about CIP and capacity, I'm a little surprised, because that has been agreed to uh, from multiple sources. So the next piece um, that I do want to raise is um, if you could kind of give an idea of who are the two actually extra pieces. One is I fully support Schoolology, but I do think it's really important for us to also look at um, that shared registration either with parks or with the school system. We should not be doing a standalone because it increases your marketing challenges. And then the last piece is if you could address the um, four people or four leadership positions that you're thinking that the county would take over, and it would be would it be actually four, or is there a way that existing staff might take on some of that responsibility? So the positions, um, as we have detailed on page five and six of the annual report, is it would be the ACE administrator the ACE Manager of Finance and Operations, the ACE Manager of Instructional Programs, and the ACE Manager of Adult ESOL. Ms. Corbett Sanders, did you have just, did you want to wrap that up? You look like you have a follow-up. Uh, yes, I would just want to know how the, where there are synergies with existing FCPS operations um, and how, if it's, considered any duplicative, but obviously that would be something that Dr. Reed needs to look at. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. I'm going to start with my high-level uh, uh, observations first. I like to claim uh, Ken Balbueno, who is my Braddock District School representative um, on the committee. Thank you for your excellent work as chair. Um, I really did appreciate the work of ACE this year and your report and even today's presentation. Very informative. Secondly, for my colleagues, um, I have been consistent from day one when I joined this board. Um, you know, our, our funding mission where the Board of Supervisors gives us almost 75, 80% of our funds. It's considered a K-12, maybe a tiny bit of pre-K-12. Um, and so we have really, as, a, as previous boards, tried to recognize the value and the importance of ACE, but I'm not sure that we necessarily get the funding per pupil um, to run the program. And so during my entire tenure, along with Ms. Darinette Koufax, um, the board's direction was that ACE needed to be self-sustaining, financially self-sustaining. That is similar to the Fairfax County Park Authority. Um, and so it has been concerning to me over the years when ACE has struggled to meet that requirement. And so I just want that to be like my most macro level focus is I, I absolutely want ACE to be successful. I remain a huge champion that the ELL services is probably the most paramount because we know that we have a lot of people coming to our county um, that continues to grow in size and fluency in the English language is essential for, for their success. So I will never step away from that. But for the other programs, you know, again and again, year after year, we just talk about where is the data analysis that shows which, pro which courses and programs are self-sustaining and which ones are not? And when they're not, they need to go away because we, we have to be, again, efficient and effective with whatever we're running through ACE program. So I very much support the recommendation if you want to bring the courses where the community is utilizing them, but to Ms. Cor Corbett Sanders, talking again about budget, budget, budget. And Mr. Frisch, thank you for bringing up the catalogs. I think I've gotten them over the years as well and thought, you know, are we doing this in the most efficient way? And uh, knowing the financial assistance that the board year in and year out has had to do with like year end funds, if we figure this one out, um, you know, $350,000 goes a long way to help ACE meet its self sustaining. Um, efforts. So um, I guess I would say, while I am deeply grateful for our hardworking volunteers on ACE, Dr. Reed, I would bring back to you and your team to answer for me, 
they're an advisory committee. I expect the ACE program all the way up to your leadership team to start figuring this out. Like they're volunteers. I want to hear from your team. What is it going to take and what do we need to do? But I want to applaud the staff along with the volunteers because I forgot to say staff, your partnership in this work, your ability to find where we can um, really modernize ACE. I'm full in support, but you got to stay to the mission of being self-sustaining. Thanks. Thank you. Um, oh, can anyone comment on what's sure. happening with our self-sustaining and what we're like, I'll like what have been our shortfalls over the last five here. years? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Presidio, would you like to comment? You know, I'll, I'll comment briefly. I mean, I think those are great questions and certainly deserve a lot more detailed analysis. Um, some board members right, might remember a few years ago before the pandemic, the audit office um, mm -hmm. at the request of the board looked at many of those questions. And one of the things that they determined at that time is that we are um, pretty unique in the, in the programming that we provide uh, through the ACE program for a K-12 space, right? We have an over 60 year history um, of serving the community through these different types of programs. But we're very unique in the sense that we're asked to be a self uh, supporting program. Um, the audit office could not identify any other program in the country that was asked to be a self supporting program. Um, they even uh, drew distinctions between the amount of additional funding that um, the parks and recs program gets in terms of their administrative management and overhead. Um, which is what basically the board is supporting um, funding for right now. That and uh, a little bit of a match for the adult ESOL grant. That's the only amount of funding um, that the board is providing uh, to the ACE program right now. Everything else is self-supporting tuition. And when we do the analysis of, uh, and the team does a good job of this every year, of looking at programs in terms of how much revenue are they generating, are they generating profit, are they generating loss, investing in those programs that are the greatest you know, revenue generating uh, programs for future offerings and expansion. They do a good job of doing that analysis every year. It's interesting, I think sometimes, some of the classes that generate more revenue um, are those community enrichment classes, right? They're not even the ones that necessarily we would strategically say are aligned sometimes with the, with the board goals like workforce development, uh, for students who didn't graduate on time or recently graduated um, and have not gone straight into a two-year uh, or four-year college experience. So we're relying sometimes on those community enrichment classes actually to generate revenue to subsidize some of the other things that we're doing that are in alignment with our strategic goals. So it is, um, it's a very complex program um, to manage. Um, I think the discussion at the table today has been really good in terms of, you know, additional efficiencies, how can we market it better, um, and certainly the team would benefit from, you know, any of those partnerships and expertise that folks in the community have to help us with that. Um, Ken has been great, other co uh, committee members have been great at bringing some new ideas to the table. Um, so the team, the team is open to anything and everything to figure out how to continue to offer these services in the most effective and efficient ways possible. Thank you, Dr. Presidio. And just for everybody's um, information, that report is also included on board docs from the auditor's um, investigation from three years ago now, maybe even four. Thank you, 2018. Um, Ms. Um, Cohen. Thanks. Uh, we are very big fans of the ACE program in our family. I think everybody from my mother taking Italian to my um, oldest, who somehow did not kill their driving instructor, um, we are very appreciative of, of all that you do from behind the wheel to um, expanding the uh, knowledge base of some of our citizens. I think a few things I just want to say. I mean, one, we this board just keeps talking constantly about family and community engagement and how it is an impediment to the kind of information that we get back to how we develop together this strategic planning and how, I mean, this is one of the big ways that we engage with the community. And I would argue um, one of the biggest barriers we have is this communication gap. And yet we spend a lot of resources working to help um, teach family members English, which helps us and helps them be a bigger part of their kids' education and a part of our system. So I think this is hugely important, and I, I would actually argue that we've underutilized ACE um, 
We are continuing to have conversations about our SLIFE students and where they fit in, what happens when you walk into our schools and you're you know, 18 years old, but you have had two years of formal education. Where do we put you? What happens? Um, and so I know amazing folks like Joe Thompson, who I'm a huge fan of, sitting over there, um, have done amazing work at our um, alternative high schools to try to figure out how to make all of that work. But we're also having constant conversations about credit recovery and how that works and how we get kids to graduate on time. ACE is such an amazing resource for that because the things that it offers, just like Mountain View, are sometimes at different schedules, at different times, things when you're able to take courses. So I, 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 I think that this is an investment well worth um, what we get back from it. I totally agree with what Carl said that if we can, he just whispered over to me, like, if we can really capitalize on how to market those things that Sloan said are not maybe things that we're even thinking about that wind up subsidized, the things that we really, really need where we may not be getting the money, man, that's gravy. But I think it's unreasonable for us to ask ACE um, to pay for itself. I mean, we don't do that in any of our other um, other other programs, and I think if we're going to really talk about return on investment, um, I mean, what we are getting back is in spades, and maybe that's the better conversation. It isn't a dollar for dollar. It's what our responsibility is in the community um, to make sure that everybody is living with a set of information and knowledge, and we have an obligation to, to do that, and we do it in a lot of different ways. Um, so I, I really appreciate your suggestions. I did not know about the existence of the 2018 audit report, so I'm going to go back and dig into that. Um, but whatever we can do to be helpful, just know that I know there's at least a few of us on the board who are willing to help in any way we possibly can. Thank you so much, Ms. Cohen. If I can uh, just touch on one thing since you brought up about the driver's education. So that's an area where we did see a good amount of um, increase in the enrollment. And it's also been a good program to, to adapt and use our lessons learned from the virtual learning. So one thing that we've tried to do is make it a hybrid instruction. Maybe Paul can expand on this, but we've tried to make it a hybrid instruction so that the classroom portion is done virtually, whereas the, it's a little difficult to do behind the wheel virtually. But you know, we do that in person. That part we don't want to do virtually. Dr. Um, Anderson, can I super fast just say, even during my oldest navigated this during the COVID times and having the virtual instruction did great, but you guys went above and beyond during COVID to try to figure out how to make behind the wheel work. And we are, all the drivers of Northern Virginia are greatly appreciative of that. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us may have to revisit that. Um, Ms. Marin and then Ms. Omesh. Hi, thanks for all this information. I want to start by saying I think that this has parallels to some other programs, and I'm the liaison to the Career Tech Advisory Committee, and I just see a ton of connections, and I'll try and segment so that I save that for the next portion. But the, the parallels I see are this, ACE offers quality programs, just like Career Tech Ed offers quality programs, just like SAC offers quality programs. The issue is access. There just never seems to be enough access. It's you know, part of the marketing, it's part of the offering. And we have been lamenting this for years. So the remarks I want to share are really for the benefit of our new superintendent um, to understand where my advocacy has been over the years. And I had served at one point as the ACE liaison. So again, I am a fan. But I do think that it's worth assessing the role of SCPS in the adult education space. Is this our space? Our mission is to educate children. Um, I think that ACE, that CTE, that Nova Community College, Fairfax Parks, it's all siloed. And yet there's all this overlap. I think that we need to unentwine this from being, all, all, so, so that, that I'll, I'll put that out there about who's doing double duty, where can we better leverage partners, what's really adult ed and what's really student ed and how can we align our students so that they can access opportunities. If the adult ed program is about furthering our own students, I think that that's one case to be made. If it's an adult education to provide leisure opportunities, I'm not convinced with any data that that is our space. I think that's a great space for parks or for other um, local organizations, but I'd I've asked for that data. I've never received that data about what is the return on investment for offering leisure-based courses. I think also, and I've said this many times with the CTE um, committee, is I really think we need to unentwine this from being location-dependent. 
There's never going to be enough space. There's never going to be enough money to build space. We have buses. We have a lot of county buses that I see driving by empty. Not our buses, but county, um, Fairfax County buses. We have trailers that we're trying to get rid of. What a great way to house some of these not primary instructional opportunities that our students have. Can we have mobile? You know, we hear all the time about Herndon, but even just this morning, I was lamenting with our SeaTac chair, all the, the academies that we're visiting in these programs, none of them are in North County, where South Lakes High is and Madison High is. All those students are going to Chantilly, or they're going to Fairfax, or they're trying to get down to Edison. And yet, we're talking about building these facilities in Herndon. Why isn't there a more division-wide view, and why isn't it more entwined? And then, yes, absolutely modernize the marketing. But then you have to modernize the enrollment, and that gets back to, is this really our space? Is our space to be in adult education? So I hope that's um, for your consideration, Dr. Reed, and the board as well. Thank you. If anyone wanted to offer some commentary to Ms. Marin's remarks. All right, seeing none, Ms. Omesh. Yeah, I mean, I can, but I, I certainly... Uh... <laughs> That was not exactly my point, but feel no. free. It's your three minutes. No, I'm actually happy to follow both Ms. Marin and Ms. Cohen because I think this is this is where we kind of uh, make the case for ACE, where um, we understand, to, her, to Ms. Cohen's points, that we can't be successful at the endeavor of educating children without certain supplemental supports, those being family engagement, uh, English learning, uh, and just making sure our families are empowered because the idea is all families care, but families have blockers to being able to support their kids in the ways that we hope for. And so when we identify those blockers, what's the next step? They have to be able to empower themselves, and ACE allows them that avenue to do that. Uh, without it, I don't know where else they would turn, right? Um, we would expect of them to be at a certain point without giving them the tools to get there. So I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of ACE and its programs. I actually, though, in thinking about exactly what you're pointing out, uh, and saying that you don't have to be anti-ACE to perhaps be critical. Um, so to that point, I actually think we could benefit from a joint Board of Supervisors school board committee on this in the same way we've done for environment and, and facilities, uh, just to discuss programming seriously and think through you know, long-term funding, et cetera. It seems to be one of their responsibilities. So I, I put that to you all. We can discuss that maybe in the joint meeting we have coming up at some point. Um, uh, beyond that, though, I did want to speak a little bit, just asking questions about the funding pieces and whatnot. I was asking, I don't know if Ms. Burden or even Mr. Sethi can be part of this conversation, and this is where it gets a little bit frustrating because the solutions tend to be interdepartmental. On the budget side, I'd love for us to think about specifically the, the big ticket items. Like, why, why are we uh, not funding vehicles, for example? I mean, we have a separate shop for that in FCPS, right, where they have all kinds of vehicles, replacements, whatever, maintenance. It seems to make sense rather than have ACE self-manage, take economies of scale, and just have that be a part of the bigger FCPS facilities uh, or like resources. Um, um, I don't know who can Dr. answer that. Dr. Reed, would you like to comment on that? Sure. Um, I, I'm having to assume that they could avail themselves of our transportation vehicles if they're available and then still need to be revenue neutral. Is that my understanding? So, so just uh, quickly, we do, we buy okay. from the fleet. Right. We do buy the cars. So you are able to use so that can, economy we, of scale. Yes, we can use the fleet price to buy the, the cars, but we also have to, to retrofit them so that they can be, they have a um, separate break. There, there are things that have to be done to the car to make them ready are you talking for about behind, driver's ed cars? Yeah, behind the oh. driver's ed cars. But these are our kids that are using this. So I guess Correct. I'm wondering why we're not using, like, I don't know, old FCPS cars or something. They probably have to That can be retrofitted. Why are you buying your own? So, um, so we do buy them, like I said, from the fleet. There are specific cars that mm -hmm. um, are available for behind the wheel. Um, and but you're buying them? Is that we, what? We purchase those. And from FCPS? From... It's actually, I think, a Fairfax County um, contract that we, we purchased them from. And then they're serviced and everything through Fairfax County. However, our regular transportation is serviced. <laughs> However, our normal, our normal servicing happens through um, Fairfax County. But we have to also pay for that um, annual maintenance, the, mm -hmm. the registration, the little 
all the um, safety inspections, all of those types of things. But so the cars, and then when they have reached their usable life, then they're sold at auction through the county. I feel like we should be able to get a waiver on the. Yeah, it's the like taxes. a transfer of money of the same. Yeah, we just transfer the money. Okay. I mean, I, I wonder. Well, too, I wonder if your larger question, though, is, or at least the way I was interpreting it, is: could there be more cross-departmental collaboration? Right, and I think that is something that the ACE team would welcome. Um, I mean, it was part of this report to really think about the facilities issues. You know, partnering the ACE team and facilities, partnering transportation and ACE, looking at you know, are there additional opportunities for cost savings, efficiencies, mm -hmm. just better management? You know, Mr. Frisch mentioned, you know, perhaps maybe working with our own communications maybe. team more closely on the marketing side, right? Like, I think the ACE program would benefit from a lot of additional support from other departments in the division. Yeah, I think I'd like to see a follow-up meeting between the ACE committee and uh, uh, budget, our budget team. Even this one-time fund, this is an awesome idea. It's tangible, it's clear, it's limited, it's straightforward. That's something we should absorb or at least plan for in the next five years to fund. So that's something I'd like them to talk to the budget team. I'd like them to talk to Mr. Sethi also on the tech side of this and seeing what he can absorb. Um, and there was a third team. And then the comms team, obviously. But I, I say that because, uh, you know, I, I'm, this audit report, it's existed. A lot of the recommendations are the same what, or, or similar. This goes back to this like feedback loop issue where you know we get these committees they present their f findings great recommendations all this f forgive me but free you know community invested labor put into being intentional and thoughtful coming up with solutions and then where does it go where does it go I I really hope that we have some follow up meetings with them and the other departments Dr Reed I guess that's you know for you in t in terms of thinking of where that's implemented. Um, but yeah, I'm, I want to go back. <laughs> no, I got it. Thank you for, for stopping. Um, Dr. Reed, did you want to jump in? I think I'll wait till I hear a little more feedback. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Before I go to Ms. Tolan, I do want to go back to a question that Ms. Uh, McLaughlin asked that was not responded to. It was a question regarding the per people funding. And I am not sure if we have the right people in the room for that. But if we do, it, and if you want to take a crack at it, Ms. Williams and staff, please do. But if we don't, we can add that as a follow-up for Ms. Burden to provide a response to, unless you have some information. If I could hear the question one more time from Ms. McLaughlin. Ms. McLaughlin, please repeat the question. And what I was saying is in terms of our mission and our funding oh. partners, you know, the Board of Supervisors you know, plan to fund us based on you know, our, our annual needs, but I don't know that there was ever a conversation of our responsibility and delivery to the county population of adult community education. So if that's not considered part of the pie that they have thought for the longest time is part of our funding mission, and if we're not getting anything from the state um, and we're not getting anything federal, then I, I, I think it goes to Ms. Marin's question of, you know, realizing that the community expectation is we are delivering a K-12 education first and foremost. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Yeah, thanks, Ms. McLaughlin. I had an opportunity to have this presentation, um, sort of a one-on-one -on -one tutorial to engineer success in my understanding, which I appreciated. <laughs> and it is a unique program, I will say, to educate adult learners, and it's really a thoughtful, visionary idea. I, in terms of traditional P-12 program dollars that might come from traditional sources, that's not what we're talking about here. I believe it's tuition-based programming with the understanding originally that it would be revenue neutral. And so now the question to me was, I, after I listened to the presentation the first time and listening again today, is if we, the, the committee's asking for more resources and then the question is then that's no longer revenue neutral so that's a really a conversation the board has to have because I don't believe we're accessing state or federal dollars on a per pupil basis like we do in P12. So fundamentally, that's how I read it. But I would defer to the administrative leadership of the ACE program uh, to clarify that. But that's my understanding after speaking to Ken on, uh, I think, several weeks ago when we talked about it. Yeah, and if I can just chime in on that one, too, I think that's why we had the recommendation to fund the staff so that way the operations um, piece 
can still be intact and the operations can be revenue neutral, whereas the staffing side would be shifted more to the school operating fund. Thank you. I am mindful of the time, but we still have several school board members to speak. So I do want to move on to Ms. Tolan, followed by Ms. Keys Gamara. Thank you. Um, I am appreciating all the sort of the big picture partnership you know, improvements that can be made. I think that is something we should definitely be looking at. But I have a couple of very specific questions. Uh, one is on, on Schoology. Like, uh, did we use a different system in ACE? Like, why is there any difficulty in using Schoology? We actually don't use Schoology on a regular basis. Our um, course management system, um, it, mainly because it's a uh, the K-12 um, contract has just been difficult for external users that don't have um, student IDs in Fairfax County Public Schools through SIS. That's how things are um, authenticated in Schoology. So we do have a few programs, um, a few of our teachers who are also FCPS teachers who can leverage Schoology, but the students are Fairfax um, adult and community education students, not Fairfax County Public School students. So for right now, that provisioning is the piece we're working with IT on. But we are working towards a solution so that we'll be able to use Schoology as our course management system as well, particularly for our long-form classes that might um, last throughout the semester. Yeah. It'd be very um, you know, interesting for our teachers to have access to those, um, those tools. So we're, we're working on it. So I do have a staff response related to Schoology. Um, and the IT department's very supportive. It's just trying to figure out a, the best way to do, to do it for the community members. Okay, thank you. I'm glad to hear you're working on it and there may be a solution. Um, my, my other question, and I'm not, I don't necessarily even have enough information to ask the question in a smart way, but I think I need to talk to um, the high school, adult high school administrators. Um, it's my understanding, um, just working with some of the, my folks out in Herndon, is that sometimes we'll have a high school student that uh, maybe ages out or needs to take advantage of things at the adult high school, um, but they have special education needs. And when they go to the adult high school, they can no longer work with even the, the, their high, the regular high school for the special education needs. Can you give me a little more information on that? I think uh, Dr. Morgan's here. Gotcha. Right? Oh, no, sorry. Sure, I can answer that. Um, the adult high school uh, that Fairfax County runs, once a student um, makes the decision as an adult to step into that high school setting, then they are, uh, at, traditionally they have, um, at that point, uh, been released from the special education programming that that we provide in our K through 12 uh, programs otherwise so we're working really hard right now uh, in, in this new position to align some of those concerns that our students and community have with the programs that we do the existing programs we do have and in many ways um, we're pretty lucky in that there are so many different programs out there that students can access that are non-traditional like the adult high school, but also still provide the special education services. There are some recommendations coming down the road about <clears throat> how we might be able to make that more accessible um, as we continue to meet with some stakeholders. But uh, for right now, that is the case that once you enter into the adult high school setting as an 18 plus um, student, those special education services are, are not available um, because you're making an elective choice to in, enter into an adult high school setting. But there are other alternative settings within our county that do offer the set special ed supports um, that students might need and the same type of flexible scheduling and uh, unique needs that um, some of our students who are uh, uh, older and special ed could access. All right, and those are programs run by Fairfax County? Yes, ma'am. And they're readily available? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for the information. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Keys Gamara, and then Ms. Bakarski. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I, I do want to thank our advisory committee for all the years they've really uh, kept things going and made um, offerings to our community. Um, you know, really always having a conversation about whether this is something we can continue 
uh, to support. Um, and I'm I'm looking at their their recommendations. Uh, which are good um, for co coming from an advisory committee. I'm wondering if uh, perhaps this is an opportunity, uh, Dr. Reed, to really uh, take a look at this particular program and how we might transform it in order to address um, not, I'll say, non-traditional needs, right, um, from our system. Uh, as I've had my regional meetings. Um, I've noted and had several conversations about the student that is, you know, perhaps not fitting in any category, right? Is ACE an option that we might be able to f use to provide various offerings? So I, I think what I'm saying is, is there a way to step back at this point? Um, maybe this is a good time with the new superintendent to look at this program Um not just as, oh, it should be self-sustaining, but is it a way to perhaps uh, address some of the concerns we know uh, we may not be meeting as well because we have students that don't meet the traditional sense? I'll stop there uh, to see if Dr. Reed has any comments. Thank you, Ms. keys Gamara. We actually, <clears throat> I was speaking to one of our regional assistant superintendents a few weeks ago about some of our like 17 and 18 year old newcomers who are coming in maybe who haven't been in school, formal school in a while, and thinking about what was possible with ACE um, in terms of versus maybe a more traditional high school, particularly if they were working or had some type of a, um, a job. And we also have been sort of, not sort of, we've also been discussing where does night school fit in for Fairfax County Public Schools in terms of students who do need to work? Um, so I think it, I'm excited about that opportunity. I just want to make sure that, um, you know, that we're thoughtful in terms of all the funding pieces as I'm, <laughs> it's my first fall to go through the budget process too and um, reviewing a lot of uh, department requests as well at this time. But I think to your point, um, this is really a unique program, and I think the mm -hmm. thought around being um, perhaps innovative in how we approach students who might access the program, and I'll want to talk a little more with uh, Joe Thompson about this IEP separation. I'm not sure I understand that and whether that's local or, you know, where that regulation comes from, because I think that we might also think about imagining it. I was thinking about our AIR recent uh, audit on special education and sort of the conversation around transitions, right? And wondering if there's a space here for that, but need to learn more about the IEP restrictions, if we can mod moderate that. So I, I appreciate your thoughts and your nudge on that, Ms. Kieskamar. I think it is an opportunity. Okay. Um, I, this may not be the time, for it, but I I do think before we, I don't necessarily hear a um, agreement on the board of, of which direction to go on, but I I do I would like to have an opportunity for uh, brainstorming to serve perhaps some of those non traditional students that you've mentioned, those that have, um, you know, may have interrupted education. We have students coming into our schools in high school. Um, and they need to work. And so uh, I wonder if this is just that opportunity to identify what those specific needs are, both in our schools and in our community, um, by reaching out, first of all, to the business community with respect to perhaps there are, you know, there are students that are college bound, and then there are students that need to work, and perhaps this can fill that gap. Um, so I, I, I look forward to having that discussion and reimagining this program, um, I think is perhaps the way that I see us moving forward. Um, I think that ACE has done some valuable things in the past, but I, I think that it can, um, in a one Fairfax way, address a number of concerns, but we have to step back and reimagine the program. So I think that's what I'd like to offer today. Thank you very much. Oops. I just had one thing to add to uh, what uh, Ms. Keys Gamara was uh, talking about. We uh, we have started to have these conversations now that my uh, position is um, is started this year 
<clears throat> around some of the ways that we might be able to take advantage of the things that all three of our different programs do. For instance, if there is a, um, an, an adult ESOL language program that is taught by a, um, a, uh, a certified teacher, can that become a concurrent uh, credit for a student that might want to then approach adult high school because now they, you're right, they do come in, uh, Ms. Kiskumar, they do come into our community needing to work and they're desperate for work and that makes sometimes makes the second, the schedule that we have secondary to what their needs are. So if we can leverage what adult ed is able to do outside of what our K through 12 model looks like, but still give them credit so that they are gaining some educational momentum towards a diploma uh, program, then we want to be able to do that. The same thing is true with our ACE programming. Um, are there ways to uh, provide um, the types of uh, uh, educational opportunities that ACE has to engage our students in a more hands-on um, type of education that we know uh, prevents the dropout, that what dropout risk with the hands-on education is a, is a great way to um, keep our students enrolled and keep them focused on a more post-secondary mindset. So we've talked about how we might be able to not only uh, bring the, enmesh those two prior to a student graduating, but also then how we can hand those students off a little more smoothly post-secondarily as well. So of the three programs that are represented here, we are actually now starting that conversation in order to um, be a little bit more efficient and effective with our service delivery. Thank you very much. Uh, your time did expire, Ms. Um, Keys Gamara, unless you have something quick to share. Oh, are you no, I just look forward to that discussion. I think it's necessary. Thank you. Ms. Pekarski, mm -hmm. followed by Ms. Yeah. Nona Kovacs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this report. And I'm glad to be going after Ms. Keys Gamara because I actually wanted to make some of the same points. And we have talked, Dr. Reed, I think you and I, in our many conversations about the need for something different for some of our kids. And, you know, the pressures that they have and the things that they have to do doesn't always lend itself to being successful in that, you know, 8 to 3, 8 to 4 PM model. So I would be very interested to see what your thoughts are on this. It seems like the board needs to have the conversation because we are all over the place. And once the board has the conversation, I know we've been kind of hobbling along for years, um, but we have the conversation. Um, and, you know, part of the strategic, it is the time right now to do this. And then I loved your idea, Ms. Omesh, about talking to the Board of Supervisors and trying to see where do we overlap, where can we be more efficient, how can we, um, you know, use resources in a more impactful way. And actually when the... Um, Board of Supervisors did, the county did their strategic plan. One of their priorities was lifelong learning. So there is space, and I think it is the time. Uh, so I thank you, and I just lastly totally and fully agree that we've got to modernize, and, um, and it's a chicken and an egg kind of thing, right? Like, it, do people get on there? I've gotten on there. It is very difficult to use. It is not user-friendly, and I think about, you know, that's me. What about people who do not even speak English? Um, how do they access uh, this site, and do they give up and say, you know, forget about it? So. Um, I think that's an investment that you will see return for. So thank you. Thank Dr. You. Reed, did you just want to offer any more commentary? I just agree with Ms. Pekarski, and we have had that conversation on several occasions. And I also wonder, I want to put something in this space for a minute, and I don't know if it's a fit or not a fit, but we're really wrestling with um, outpatient treatment availability also for our students with the current opioid issue. And I'm wondering, you know, I come from a division where we had outpatient services available on site. And I wonder in terms of where that's available within the division, and we've been talking about that. And I don't know if this is a space that also um, could include sort of a programming around that topic, because it's really, it's, a, I believe, a serious community concern right now. So I just think about that modernization and expansion of possibilities um, that are really important for the health and safety of our young people. So. Thank you. We have two more speakers and then opportunity for go-backs. Ms. Anna Koufax. 
Yes, um, uh, uh, Dr. Reed, that's an interesting um, uh, proposition for allowing th that kind of programming in here because there is a crisis in Fairfax County as far as drug abuse in our schools, and that has to be noted and stated and um, can't be brushed under the rug. And so if this is... You know, but I, I'm just following your thought process there. What I do want to thank is all of you. I have always been a big fan of the ACE programming. I appreciate um, all of you spending your time and energy on um, looking at this program holistically. One of the benefits or detriments of being here on the board for as long as I have is some of these things are Groundhog Day all over again. Um, we have met with or asked for our Board of Supervisors to meet with this in the past. There were other priorities that took, took precedent over ACE, but that doesn't mean we can't start again. Um, we do have a wide variety of unmeet needs of our families, and particularly we talk about, um, as many of my colleagues have and I often have, is uh, the, those newcomer families who could use this programming to help their children. Their, and, and when we use parents as partners, they need every tool in the box. And so ACE programming can help there. Um, as far as newcomers and how we can reimagine this programming, I will say several years ago we were not ready for that. We wanted most newcomers to come through our traditional path, but that doesn't mean we haven't changed or wouldn't like that and wouldn't welcome that right now because of what you just said. Because many years ago, several years ago, we didn't even have ESOL programming, adequate ESOL programming in our schools. And so we wanted to get them into their schools. But now that we're seeing that, and you're saying this as, you, as the head, that you know they need to work. They need an alternative to that come into school at 8.30 and leave at 2.30 if you're in a high school situation. So I think there are lots of things here that we all um, have talked about before but can put a new lens on because it is a new time and I do think that this has to be part of our strategic initiative as we move forward we talked this morning about that particularly though when you look for those who think that because it's adult education it really isn't for our kids I just ask you to rethink that based upon some of the comments that I made about new families to our community, what we can do, the tools we can give our families, as well as what we can do for those kids who are in that high school range, or maybe a little older in some cases, but still striving to get their diploma. Thank you, Mr. Koufax. Just quick question for you in terms of time check. I have not had a chance to have my turn, which I would like to have, and then we have probably about three go-backs. How are we doing with time with the next committee? Um, well, we budgeted an hour for each. So, where did when did we start? We started, we started at about one twenty. One twenty. So we're a little bit so behind. A little bit behind. Um, so should my, we? My only concern is the amount of people who said they had a hard stop at four. Right. So let's see what we can do, and um, keep proceeding with this, and then so go. Be, be, because you'd be we okay not, with us doing the go backs? Um, one minute. Okay, done. I'd like to be recognized, please. Ms. Marin. I'd like to not have us go go backs. This is not fair. We have our constituents here. It is not fair to do business this way. People are waiting and they've arranged our days. We have an hour left. We've talked for an hour and 20 minutes about ACE. Please let's have everyone go one turn. We've all spoken passionately and let's move on to the next topic that we're already late for. And if I, I don't know if I need to make a motion or whatever, but we have got to be respectful of people's time, including our own. Dr. Anderson, if you want to take a pulse of the board, I think that's okay. Whatever. Well, how about I have my turn before we get into all of that, and okay. then we'll see you the timing, because I there, do have some go. questions you that not, I want to get out there. You have your turn yet. Yeah, everybody gets one turn, turn, and then we could take a pulse of the board. Thank you. If we could start my three minutes. First of all, I do want to say I, I'm really supportive of Ms. Omesha's idea of having some sort of joint effort to communicate with the Board of Supervisors, you know, for parks, for all of these other ventures, where there's a lot of overlap. I think there's some space there for us to do much good. Um, one of the things that I also want to say is um, I, I, I'm, I'm very interested in the report that the um, Auditor General put, to, uh, put together, because if we're the only jurisdiction where ACE has to be self-sustaining, I think we need to spend some time in that. 
Um, the strategic plan that we just talked about this morning, this really just begs the question is, are we inviting this space to participate? And is there a feedback loop for students and community members who do participate in ACE? We talked about a bunch of groups earlier. I see opportunity for us to bring in that group because whether they're community members or students, it's something I think makes sense for us right now. Um, in terms of FCPS's role for in adult education, Dr. Presidio, this may be a question for you. Can you expand a little bit on what our parent resource center's work is? Because that's directly with our parent community, because that's not just K-12. I'm not sure I totally understand your, your question. Could you restate that for me? The I'm parent sorry. resource center, mm -hmm. what is it that they provide to us? The, what is it that we provide to them? What, are, what, is, what is our programming for them? So the Parent Resource Center is not actually under my area of supervision, oh, but okay. we do provide a lot of outreach services to parents. So we help them uh, with early literacy, for example, supporting early literacy. Uh, we help them with programs just around like parent um, engagement and understanding like how to access services in the school system. Um, whether it's counseling services, whether it's social services, obviously if it's academic instructional services that they need. Um, so it's really kind of like, I guess what I would say, like a whole child approach to helping parents really understand how to best support and advocate for, for their students and get the supports that they need. Sure, I just wanted to raise that because we're already in that space where we are providing some additional support, supports past the, the K-12 environment to our parent community. If someone on, um, on staff can speak to, for our students who currently participate in the adult high school um, component of ACE, where do they come from? That's the first part of that question. And secondarily, what conversations do we have with the high schools? And I'm not necessarily going to use the term recruit because I think it doesn't really lend there. But how do we collaborate and facilitate our students who may otherwise drop out in offering them this opportunity instead right now as it stands? Or are there no conversations? And Joe, before you answer that, could you make sure to try to draw the distinction between our alternative programs and the adult high school? Mm -hmm. I think that, that distinction is pretty important. Sure, thank you. Um, so in terms of uh, drawing the distinction uh, that <clears throat> Dr. Presidio is talking about, we have alternative programs within our uh, uh, K through 12 setting that uh, Bryant High School and Mountain View High School are probably the most um, uh, easily describable in terms of the alternative programming that we have in that those, those schools provide flexible scheduling for uh, students. Mountain View takes one half of the county and Bryant takes the other. And those programs have um, uh, direct special ed services, they have direct ESOL services, that, and then they have the flexible scheduling. They do not have evening classes. They have transportation, meals, clinical staff. Um, they have uh, uh, counseling, uh, ESOL counseling. We have uh, school nurses, uh, all those things there. So it looks, it has very, very, uh, uh, many of the traditional school elements that you would expect to see. And then we have the adult high school, which um, is, is uh, part of uh, one of our state mandates that we have uh, available for our community. And in that setting, that high school setting, we do offer students the opportunity to earn a high school diploma. Um, and, and that we serve, the, the high school, uh, the Fairfax County Adult High School has three different locations throughout the county right now. And we, uh, so we serve all of our schools, all, all of our high schools. And on top of that, any student who is of school age who registers into Fairfax County Central Registration past the age of 18 also has the opportunity to pursue the adult education model. So we communicate that to the new coming families over the age of 18 at, as, as one of their choices they do, they do get to, to have some choices because uh, they're school aged. Uh, so they have their community school as a choice and they have adult education as a choice as well. So one, one additional distinction to think about, the students in the adult high school are over 18. Those are students who have left FCPS without completing a high school diploma, earning a high school diploma, that are now coming back to try to either get a diploma, certificate of completion, or a GED. We do have students over age 18 in our alternative schools that are still FCPS students working towards completion of their diploma, 
Um, and many of those students get ESOL services, special education services um, in, that, in that alternative setting. Sure. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to wrap up my comments because I get to work with this committee every month. I, I just think there's an opportunity. There's a lot of opportunities here um, in terms of addressing some of the things that we have talked about. It sounds as if you're having the same conversations with multiple school board members about our students who are newcomers, who do need to work. There's I think the environment here is ripe for us to reimagine um, ACE in a way that we have not done before in addition to what everyone has said. So I will yield my 35 seconds back to the group and then we'll ask for the pulse of the board as required um, by one of our school board members. Can we, who would be okay with a one minute go back and we have three people for that and who thinks we need to just wrap this up and move on? So those are the two choices. So choice A, one minute go backs, please raise your hands. One, two, thank you. Choice B, let's wrap this up. One, two, three, four, five, six. Where, what did you say? Staying okay. courteously. Well, the bulk of the people who have voted think we need to wrap it up. So having said that, Mr. Balbuena, I will ask you to just kind of close out because you had a comment that you wanted to make, and then I will offer my thanks after sure. you're done. I just want to say thank you very much again for the opportunity. I love being able to present to all of you. I love the questions, and thank you for challenging us a little bit. And We've definitely got some work ahead of us. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Reed as well. So the, it's great to hear you talking about ACE. I will say when we met one on one, she had a you know so a me meager level of understanding of ACE, but she left the meeting saying that she felt like an expert. So when proved on your grade, that's a great but, thing. Yeah. Yes. And so. I, I will say that um, to to Miss Marin's point, um, we have been talking about uh, discussing overlaps with CTE and what kind of opportunities for collaboration there are. So that actually is a priority for us this year. And I love the idea, Ms. Omesh. Um, thank you for um, suggesting that about meeting with the Board of Supervisors. All right. Um, I'm looking forward to our meeting, which is tomorrow. Yes. Because since I'm continuing to work with this committee, there's a lot of opportunity here in terms of the next charge that I've heard in the conversation in this room. So thank you all for your assistance, and thank you for your questions, and thank you all for all of your work. Big job to ACE. Advance the slides when we are about to start there. Yes, Ms. Glazer, Mr. Parker, you're in communication there. Yes, one, two, six, seven. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started with our Career Tech and Advisory Committee. Thank you to Mr. Parker, our chair here, for taking time out to be with us, and Ms. Glazer also. Ketledge, sorry, Whitney Ketledge, uh, to be here. Um, I also want to thank our vice chair and past chair, Irv Arconi, um, who's worked really hard. I'm going to turn it over to you and um, save all my praise about how much I enjoy bringing on this committee in my second year. So please take it away. I want to thank you for giving us some time today to.
to report these findings that we have from our recommendations. Uh, it's been a, uh, a great year for us this year for moving, moving forward, and I wanted to be able to share some of our recommendations with you. I'm trying to see, is this thing behind us? Okay, there we go, okay. So um, uh, this, this has been, a, um, this has been a, um, a great year for us. We, uh, we come together and we get a lot done in just a small amount of time. But we have a lot of support, that, a lot of support from both Ms. Marin and, and from uh, the staff here at Fairfax County Public Schools as well that help us a lot in, uh, in being able to move forward. So we had, a, we had a charge last year to step into things that were maybe a little bit new into looking at, at how we might improve the, um, the, act, the, uh, the, the overall um, equitable awareness and access and participation in CTE programs. A lot of CTE programs just wanted to make sure that, that we would have the message out soon enough for, for the young people and the parents to take, to take advantage of them. And, um, and we've been looking at things like the, the change in the workplace, the change in jobs and those kind of things and what it means for our CTE programs as well. And um, this year we were able to uh, take that charge. Uh, I want to thank Urban Varconi who's, uh, uh, who helped me a lot this year as my vice chair and had to step in a few times when I wasn't available to do that. But um, we worked very well together again and I couldn't have done it without him. Uh, this is, these are our next one slide which should show our, uh, our committee members and, and, uh, and those who support us as well. Um, Dr. Ketchlidge, uh, Jen, and uh, Sabi never get mentioned for most of these things, but uh, they make this possible. I just want to say that. And, I, and we give Dr. We give uh, Ms. Maring a hard time a lot of times, but she, but she's, uh, she, they all very, um, uh, they all do all they can to help us move up, move forward, and we thank them for that as well. And I'm very appreciative because it made my term there very, very simple. Next slide. Now, yeah, this, this year's activities, we had a few new people who, who haven't been around. I've been doing this for a few years just as a, uh, a, a community, uh, community volunteer, and I love it. It's one of the things that I, I, I love the program. I watched my son go through it when he was in school, and, uh, and he's in public health today because of Chantilly High School's uh, program. Um, he's, he's, um, and he loves what he does and, and wouldn't do anything else, even after running the he ran the Loudon Free Clinic for about six years and loved it. But this program brought that around. But in a couple, because of these things, we, have, we wanted to make sure new members could see the power of what the program was bringing. And so we had a little bit of orientation for them. We, um, we looked at our business partners differently this year to, to see how they could, they could uh, help us with volunteers to make sure we had our, our teachers had the right things in mind when they were working, working their programs this year. And, um, we did a lot of, lot, of, lot of updates and information coming from the, the, the staff on uh, what's going on now. But also, again, Ms. Marin and I helped with the school board, helped a bunch as well. We put together uh, four subcommittees this year. And the subcommittees worked on a, a few initiatives and came up with some recommendations in each area. Uh, uh, we have our diversity of students and instructors uh, subcommittee, uh, the career cluster subcommittee, and the business and in industry partner outreach subcommittee. And then the outreach to students and parents, because uh, we know how important, how important that is as well. Each of them um, put together a set of recommendations that they thought that we, we might want to bring forth, and these are all in the report that came to you. But uh, we'll start with the diversity of students and instructors as we go along. So here we had, um, uh, we wanted to provide opportunities for kids with disabilities, English language learners, and those kind of things to understand what the CTE program and the academy programs could do for them and, and make this available to them uh, because as we look at the demographics for what we have in terms of numbers and graduates and that kind of thing, this is an area we thought you might be able to improve uh, there as well. And then making sure we could get this to parents and, and, uh, and the students early enough for, the, for, the have, for them to have an impact. So this, this set of recommendations were, well, one something we'll be, we'll be continuing to work on this year as well. Okay. The other committee, the um, Career Cluster Review, is again looking to see how, how are we keeping up with uh, the changing of the workforce and, and what the workforce may be doing and how we might be able to uh, look at new CTE programs, revamping CTE programs to be able to adapt to uh, how that workforce is changing in the, in the coming years, and even a recommendation to do some things by the summer of 2023 so we can make some serious changes there. 
The business and industry partner outreach was again uh, looking for industry partners that would help us to be able to give the teachers and the, uh, and the students a, another look at what the changing workforce might bring with us. And also um, so that we can, we can speak, we can speak uh, business enough to be able to help the, the young people understand where, where they have a part in this. And uh, we think that, that that was another recommendation that we can work with uh, again some more on this year as well. And lastly, the one with the outreach to students and parents. Um, I think all of us talk about what would, how, would the, how would CTE change if we could get, it, get them to see this sooner rather than making a decision when you're a freshman in high school. Uh, for me, uh, people, I just bring a point of, point of, point of uh, example, um, it's difficult to see a six foot five engineer everywhere you go. And, uh, but who's not a basketball player? And, uh, and so people didn't see me as a basketball player. My fourth grade, when I was much shorter, my fourth grade science teacher was the one that got me into engineering. And she gave me the opportunity to do some things. And when, by the time I got to high school, I had a, a CTE-like program in engineering that helped me to become an electric, electrical engineer. And, uh, and, been a, and then it also made me a lifetime learner. I'm still in school doing things I shouldn't be doing for a guy my age. But uh, I, uh, I love it. And watching my son benefit from it, my wife, who's a physicist, benefit from it, benefited from it. So we know the power that this has for, uh, for young people to make a decision. But again, my fourth grade science teacher captured me for science, not, not when I was in high school. And so if we can get this in front of them sooner, we think we have a much greater impact on them. And that's what we were going to try to do this year, and again, try to continue that, that, that talk. Uh, we have a new chair this year with Alexa Kressel, and she's a um, um, dynamic uh, young, uh, young, new young chair uh, that I, I get the opportunity to work with again and work with the staff again. Uh, and she's, um, she's keeping us following these recommendations, but at the same time looking at other things that we might be able to do for the coming year. And um, that's where we are this year, and that's what we uh, like to present to you. I try to make it, I know you're running behind, I try to make it as fast as I can, but I also want to be able to answer all your questions if you have any. Sorry, with that, I was just reading the document. <laughs> uh, with that, I believe I had Ms. Frisch first, uh, followed by Ms. Cohen. Thank you. Um, let's talk about getting in front of our students when they're younger. How do you see that playing? I mean, I agree completely, um, you know, and it says a lot that young people are much more open to a variety of different possible career paths, uh, you know, as they're kind of exploring the world around them. Um, how do we get in front of them in elementary school, in middle school, to make sure that they know, not only that they know these are options for them in our system, but that their parents are aware of why these are great options for them. Right. Um, and that not every uh, student will find success doing, um, you know, the four-year path. Yes, we've um, uh, we have the, the, you know, trying to trying to look at where people are offering it now. And now we see it in middle. First time I think exposure is in middle school, and uh, we're trying to take, look. What does it look like if we could get them to see it uh, see it sooner? And, and the committee this year has a um, a work stream that we'll be working with that to be sure that we can do that. I'm not sure if I know exactly how we can do that, but we've been working with the staff to help us with that. Yeah, we've made a, a concerted focus for middle school this year, focused on some after school enrichment opportunities, pushing into the middle schools, especially in the career cluster areas that we don't have middle school courses. Um, also, a lot of promotional efforts around career clusters, so looking at that cluster as a group instead of our traditional program areas the way we have promoted before. So a student has exposure to all of the opportunities in that cluster, not just what's available at the school they attend or what's available at the high school they might attend. In elementary school, we've made a lot of efforts with STEAM and computer science, and our programs have been able to push all the way down to preschool, which is helping us. Our STEAM team has done a lot of training with teachers and teacher cohorts and teacher leaders to get those um, the robots and all the fun things, all the fun little kits to elementary students sooner and get teachers more comfortable with that. And then we're, our next step after middle school is reaching down to fifth and sixth grade with those after school opportunities and exposure early to what those careers are. And so we're, we're gradually moving lower and lower, but right now we're focused on getting into every middle school because that is still 
a big effort needed. Are we, are we bringing our middle school students to see these programs in action? Yes. Each of our programs has a, especially with the academies, but the high schools offer it as well. They have days where the students are not able to come in with open house days. Mm -hmm. They have days where students come on buses to see the high school programs. They have videos and a number of different um, offerings to help them see all of the activities that happen in the different classes in the high schools and what's available to them. And we're working on including that more. So our communications office has been fabulous this year. They've created seven new videos for us already, and it really helps to have the video content so students can see what it's like in the classroom. And then they get to come visit as well. Well, I, I fully support efforts to increase communications to parents and students um, and would look forward to anything that CT, the CTA team can work up with our OCCR folks to make that happen. Um, I think the sales pitch starts young. And the, the earlier we can get it started, the more successful we'll be in rounding out these programs. And I have other questions too that are not necessarily part of this about uh, our ability to offer, you know, um, programming to students with you know English language learners and others so um, but I can hold those for another time since that's not part of this discussion thank you mr. Frisch next we'll have miss Cohen followed by miss Corbett Sanders thank you uh, I was really lucky before I was even on the school board to be uh, miss keys Gamara's liaison to um, the CTAC committee so this is certainly near and dear to my heart and um, and has been really important in, in my own family. Um, you know, a few things just to piggyback a little bit on what Mr. Frisch said. You're making these kinds of decisions, though, for middle school in the spring of sixth grade. And so we got to figure out a way to get into our elementary schools and work with counselors to know um, what's possible, since kind of the mishmash, how you come up with what you take. Um, in middle school is kind of a strange process and very school dependent um, and really relies on the people who um, know the offerings to know them and then know that your kid would be a good fit for them. I've had this conversation um, with my colleagues a few times about having um, a student with disabilities and having a teacher who said, I think AVID is a, is a better fit for this kid um, than strategies. We just got lucky that there was a teacher who was familiar with AVID and it absolutely played to helping a kid who really struggles with executive function. So I think, I don't know how we do it in our world of like we're trying to train our teachers all the time to know everything about everything. Um, so I do recognize that as a problem, but I think if we could partner with FCC PTA, I mean, these are the kind of things that I think having a PTA night, and when you're a PTA president, you're struggling for programming ideas sometimes. And so having a night that, that parents can come in and learn about these, because I think we would have made very different choices as a family if we had known some of these opportunities were out there because they're amazing and vast. Um, but that said, I really do look forward to the CTE report um, because I do think we need to expand programming, but we really need to expand access to programming. So having kids at Lake Braddock, it's the same at West Springfield High School, to give up three class periods to go take an academy um, course, it's just, it's not possible for kids who are striving, um, especially who are working to get an advanced diploma. So this, this path sometimes feels very much at odds, and, and it's part and parcel of educating our parents about what even an advanced diploma is. I, I, I know I, I go away from some of my colleagues by saying I just think it's sort of a silly um, thing that we do. So I would like us to have a lot more opportunities in kids' schedules to take advantage of these opportunities, um, especially when you're looking at college that can range anywhere from 26,000 in state to 70,000, 80,000. I mean, our kids have to have some sense, which we did not have to when we walked into, um, into a four-year program to know what even, area, what even interests us. 
So I think this is an opportunity not just for kids who are going to a career path or certification, but being prepared for what they like and taking college courses that way. Um, so thank you for what you're doing. I know I'm over time, and um, I really appreciated the report and that you all have continued to build um, over the last few years and really working to make sure you're getting back and have your goals been met each year um, as a committee. So thank you for that work. Thanks, Ms. Cohen. Uh, next speaker is Ms. Karen Corbett-Sanders, followed by Elaine Tolan. So pleased to be able to follow you, Ms. Cohen, because the whole concept of um, or high school planning really has to start no later than fourth grade. And that seems really young, but it is the reality in which we face life because it goes to whether or not a child takes advanced math early on to be able to take algebra, which then allows them to go um, get all of their math completed at an earlier stage, frees up parts of their, um, their schedule. The other thing that is so important is exactly what Ms. Cohen said about um, people not necessarily knowing everything about our school system. And I'm a bit unique in that I've been affiliated with the school system for 53 years, 54 years, um, as a student and then as a parent and as an advocate. Um, and so, and I don't know everything about the school system. But one thing that is really important is that we need to, when we hire people, to have something like an FCPS boot camp, which introduces people to our school system and talks about all of the different opportunities, but also um, it, it empowers our staff to better understand how they can best support kids and that our kids aren't widgets. They each have unique needs, and there are unique programs in this system to allow them to meet those needs. Now, I'm going to pivot a little because um, I'm also worried about our own workforce for tomorrow. And many of us have heard that there have been some funding cuts and some challenges with our workforce um, for tomorrow, the trades for tomorrow, and our teachers for tomorrow. And I would like to understand um, how we are going to address those unique needs because for selfish reasons, I feel like we just need to have a fully staffed and functioning um, school system that allows everybody to flourish. Um, and then secondly, I would like, I was so glad you mentioned your um, son's pathway because you went beyond STEAM. And so often we have this, oh, everything's cyber, everything's IT. And it's not. What we need is to introduce kids early on to the abundance of careers. When I was a kid, we used to have um, career day in elementary school so people could imagine where they would be. Um, by the way, there was nobody who actually said canon law, which is what I ended up wanting to be. Um, but we need to reimagine how we introduce kids early on and then ha give them the confidence to know that even if they pursue one career path, they will probably have four to six career paths during their lifespan. Anyone want to comment on anything I said? Well, real briefly, I, I would just say before Whitney maybe comments that um, we did learn earlier this week, and board members brought it to our attention, so we appreciate that, that there were some challenges with the Trades for Tomorrow program funding, and um, so we're working to get that addressed. Staff was not aware of that. Um, that's in the facilities department, so Marty is working on that. Um, I'm working with him on that as well, and I would say to your larger point, though, it's interesting that I think there's a lot of synergies between uh, the ACE report that we just had in, the, in this report in that ACE actually is working on developing an accelerated workforce um, development program that would increase the amount of opportunities that students have, current FCPS students, um, to try to um, widen that pipeline um, in terms of career opportunities within FCPS that might exist. So they're really working to create more, trying to create more of those apprenticeship opportunities, those internship opportunities, um, outside of even just the trades program. So um, we do have ideas and um, we're working on trying to get some of that new programming in place for next year. Yeah, and I can just add, and we 
late breaking news while I was sitting over there. They did figure out a, a short-term funding solution for Trades for Tomorrow. Our, we never had any intention of closing the program. What happened was actually the result of a good thing is that our enrollment jumped so quickly that we weren't prepared for that amount of students to participate in a paid apprenticeship for that amount of time. So it is being addressed and it is a program that we definitely want to continue to grow and increase our partnership with facilities and help fill those positions along with our Teachers for Tomorrow program as well. Great, thank you, that's exciting news. Uh, Ms. Tolan. Thank you, great news. Thanks for the breaking news. Um, a couple of things, I, um, I have a son who became an engineer despite not participating in um, CTE programs available at, in our case, Marshall High School. Um, for exactly what Ms. Cohen was talking about, it, his you know counselor talked him out of doing it because he would miss so much time you know at his home high school Langley. So um, I think it would have been an amazing opportunity for him. Um, so I'm really interested in just you know conversations around how do we make some of these things more available for students at some of these farther away high schools? Do we do mini academies? I, you know, I know they take a lot of space depending upon um, what kind of program it is, but you know, how can we get um, students that are in sort of in these far corners of the county, not close to where any academies are right now, how do we have things available for them? So very interested in that. And then um, I know we have a like a review of the CTE program that was done. Um, and so I'm wondering, will your committee be, is that part of your charge this year is to really look at that? <laughs> Dance, get some music. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if your committee will be looking at that report and reviewing it and the recommendations out of that report. So the uh, consultant is still finalizing that report and you know, um, once that's available, obviously we'll be scheduling a work session at the board's convenience to review that. But yeah, the committee will have an opportunity to review those recommendations, give additional feedback um, to really inform our policy, you know, decisions moving forward about, you know, how we might make programmatic changes. Great. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Ms. Yarna Kofax? Yes, thank you for this report. I, I appreciate it. I. I guess I have a question, and I know it wasn't really on your agenda this year, but as far, because what, what caught my eye when you talked about career cluster review, um, can you talk to me a little bit about what that, that looks like when you talk about career clusters? Because I was thinking something else, and then I want to follow up on, a, on, I have a question based upon my thought process as far as, but tell me how you're defining that right now. So nationally and within Virginia, we have 17 recognized career clusters, or maybe at my conference last week they said we're changing it to 12, or annually it, it varies which they're grouping and which they're not, but um, we have the career clusters that are recognized. So all of our programs fall under a career cluster, like it could be the trades, it could be energy, um, information, technology, various education and training. So there are nationally recognized career clusters and then all of our courses fall under them. And some courses fall under multiple career clusters. Um, so looking at, on a, a very macro level, what clusters do we currently offer? What clusters do we offer very little of? And what do we not offer at all that we need to really start integrating? Um, like we've talked a lot about energy and sustainability and transportation and logistics, which we have pieces of, but we don't have full pathways in yet. So the committee has spent a lot of time discussing and reviewing and bringing their business and industry focus to that conversation. And then we will be able to take that along with the pathways report to determine which pathways do we want to put forward as new opportunities in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, so the ones you mentioned, and that's what I was thinking, um, and I know we have lots of robust art programming, arts programming within the school, but the arts programming in the academies and that type of thing, I, where are you, I guess, because if you look at the career and technical training and the space that they take, 
How are you working with the with with any of the arts pathways? I guess that's yeah, so there's a career cluster that includes a lot of fine and performing arts classes, and we find that there are a lot of overlap. We both um, teach and operate in the same way and have a lot of the same goals is to help students have those transferable skills, help them to problem solve and think creatively and all of the things we want a student to do. So looking at where do those classes fit into a pathway is important. So it's not just a CTE class, it's what out of all of the courses available and the the pathway the student wants to take, what courses make the most sense. So for instance, STEAM has a lot of art elements built in, same with um, health and medical. You'll see it on the news, and I just tweeted it, a health, the new mobile lab was at West Potomac Academy this morning, which has all this virtual reality avail ability for students to go in and play with and learn from. And that takes a lot of graphic designing and art and creative thinking. So all of these pathways work together so finding ways to integrate that into our career pathways is important as well. I, I, I appreciate that because I, and my thought process though is what Ms. Tolan had just spoke about. There are only certain, there, I, I guess what we, what I would like to, when I thought, oh, career clusters, they're gonna ensure, and I think at some point, we have to look at, at what is, that there is something attainable in each, as many of the career clusters as you can or in multiple of the career clusters for each of our students because as another colleague mentioned, sometimes you can't afford to take three periods away from your class to get there. And that has been a perennial problem with us. We all believe in this so much. And as these skill sets, these, these more fine-tuned skill sets become important, I think, Dr. Reed, this is something that's going to be important for us to look at strategically as to how we can, because it, in the overall talk of equity, programming in this area is not equitable, never has been, and needs to be. Um, I'm not saying it's going to happen all at once, but it has to it's been languishing for a long time. You can't get to certain things from certain parts of the county, no matter how hard you try. So, and it's, it, it's important. So, but, so that's a way to say thank you for all that you do. We needed you to do more and we need to find a way for you to do more, but thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Great. Um, I, I really do, again, appreciate uh, the service of the committee volunteers and uh, the report, the recommendations that were brought. Um, I think they're all um, extremely important and reflect certainly what I've seen during my tenure and uh, what we continue to hear from our families. I can't emphasize enough, Dr. Reed, that I think um, a, a weak link over the years has been that we haven't done with intent really tying in our middle school guidance counselors to helping students be aware of the breadth of the CTE offerings and how that can actually introduce students to um, just high demand careers that their parents, you know, family members, friends don't have and they don't even know they exist. Uh, I know that happened for me with my parents both being first generation college um, my dad was a teacher and my mom didn't start working until I was in high school. So I didn't have much career guidance at all, except for what I could maybe watch on television or hear from other friends and their parents. So I think we underestimate how much that affects kids. Um, you know, the, the other thing that I noted from this report, I'm really glad you included in there, was recommendation three from your prior report, the year prior, about the Four Points Educational Partners and how they were doing a review of our career pathways and making recommendations for equity and access to these career pathways. It says in here that the board was going to be presented that in August 22. I don't know if that hasn't happened yet. Right, so that's the report that I was referring to earlier. There were some issues that the consultants uh, ran into, so that report was delayed and, and we're working with them on that and I uh, hope to have that finished up this fall. Wonderful. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, as board members, we sometimes have so much coming at us. I thought, how did I miss that one? Um, 
You know, I really will say as well that I hope maybe CTE can continue to help us leverage again um, the fact that Fairfax County is home to some of the largest com corporations in the United States. And uh, we know that there is, uh, especially in the tech world, so many hard to fill positions. And uh, not all of them require that you go on to get a bachelor's degree, but you can have an amazing lifelong career. Um, and so I would really like to see us, you know, think about that going forward for next year, a, a, a very you know, intentional focus on how we're going to bring in our business community to do more of that. Um, I know Ms. Corbett Sanders had to leave, and so I want, really want to emphasize what she's been saying all day long, which is, you know, workforce development is enormously important when we're talking about educating the whole child. And so I see CTE is playing a critical role. And in my final few seconds, I'll say anything we can do to, again, identify our most um, high demand CT courses and get them back in our base schools. My children's, um, you know, extracurricular, um, or what am I thinking of? Their electives. Their elective choices were kind of limited. And I think it's because they're off in academies and a lot of our high performing kids can't take up that time. Ms. Amish. Yeah, I just have three questions. Um, one, I'm wondering, I guess you guys were in the audience when the ACE conversation was happening, and I'm wondering if you saw any natural connections or potential overlaps, because I know some of my colleagues were sharing that we should be thinking of them in parallel. Absolutely, we're talking about that, and uh, we, we know they, they may, why they may serve a, um, um, a different section or something, or age group, and those kind of things. It gives them exposure to things that they may not see otherwise. And so sometimes you, if we could give them that exposure before they win a position when they would be outside of the school system and have to come back in, uh, then they, there may be a, an attraction that holds them there. But also, but these, these, just, the, just being exposed to the availability of these courses may be uh, something that might be an attraction. And even for those who are, um, uh, we, we talked a little bit about the, um, the small percentage of people that do not graduate sometime. And how do we, how do we is there a way that CTE can be, a, can be a, a way to capture those folks, those young people as well, and just give them an alternative to, before you decide to quit, take a look at this and, uh, and see, so they can see themselves in doing something that they love to do and don't know about it yet. I'll let you take a look at that. Yeah, and I'll just add, we do collaborate with ACE in our alternative programs frequently. We offer CTE courses in our alternative programs. Um, and ACE and, and Paul and I, our, our kids do scouts together. We know each other. We sit at oh. meetings at night talking about these things. But um, That's we, awesome. <laughs> we collaborate on having students exposed to what opportunities ACE can help them continue. If you started a program in high school, you can continue that with ACE. Um, we also have worked to collaborate on sharing space and sharing instructors who can be incredibly difficult to find um, and equipment. And we're working on trying to do more of that. And there's certainly a lot of room for us to collaborate more frequently. But we have been engaging in those conversations. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know, Sloan, is that something we've considered in the past or what, the overlaps between ACE and CTE as instructional opportunities or opportunities for these kids? Yeah, so, I mean, again, I think it's an area of, of opportunity for us for sure. So like I was sharing earlier, you know, the teams, and, and Whitney was just saying it as well, right? The teams have been working together and we've done some collaboration, but I think there's room for us to grow a lot. So one example is the ACE team right now has developed this proposal for next year for accelerated workforce development to take some of our students who are in alternative programs or even in base schools but maybe are a little bit at risk, need some additional exposure to you know career opportunities, not just the coursework, but internships or paid work-based learning, right? Um, to help them keep that connection and that motivation to finish and complete their you know high school degree with us. So, you know, we're trying to look at more opportunities like that. And, you know, having Joe Thompson, um, and I don't know if you'd 
met Joe before or worked with Joe before, but you know, he's coming out of um, Mountain View Alternative High School as the principal, and he's in a special projects administrative position that we created this year to really look at restructuring what we're doing in our alternative um, high school space to provide um, you know, accelerated opportunities to, to earn your high school diploma, as well as a real focus on career um, development opportunities. So we're positioned, I think, well at this point to do a lot more collaboration than we've done in the past. Doesn't mean that we weren't collaborating in the past, but we've got some new opportunities, I would say, now to do some, some interesting things. Yeah, no, that's the shift in his role, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I am aware of that, yeah. 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 I met him when we visited Mountain View and then heard from Mark Greenfelder that this is what's happening, so right. that's great. Right. Um, so that's encouraging. Hopefully we'll see where that goes, and then you all, in overseeing that, can recommend something next year depending on where it goes. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Thank you. And uh, on that note, um, I'm curious if from your perspectives you can immediately identify possible biases that we should be aware of and, and take into consideration in how we think about programming around this. Uh, and I'll tell you why I'm asking. I mean, my hunch has kind of been that, you know, we, for certain segments of the population, we kind of just have this idea in our minds that rather than the traditional route, they have certain other opportunities that are better for them, that work better for a certain type of people. Um, and I have a problem with that, because it, it implies that they're not able to succeed in the other you know, opportunities that we have in normal school, quote unquote, normal school. Um, so I just, I kind of want to give you guys the opportunity to just give us some reflections around that to help us try to deconstruct our own assumptions around this population. And keep it real, I'm giving you the chance. <laughs> Okay, I was, going to hope, I was hoping that Whitney would ask that question because uh, it is something that we talk about a lot and, 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 and just how do we do that? Uh, you know, um, in my other job, even though I own a company, my other job, I'm a high school Sunday school teacher. That's what I do for a living. And uh, so I end up talking to parents and students about what they're doing all the time. And um, uh, so I see parents who, who look away from CTE courses because they are not there they are not on the college realm. They're not. Mm -hmm. They don't allow them to. They think about. They do. I have to do the IB, IB uh, intellectual backlog diploma, advanced diploma, whatever those things are. Those are more important than giving your child a chance to be able to see what a career path looks like. I don't think there. I don't think there should be a distinction for him. I mean, I think every child would benefit from knowing what it, mean, what it means to be an engineer before you, before you get to college. When you get to college, you're not going to learn until you're a sophomore. And the rest of the time, you can be doing a bunch of math that you don't have any idea what it means. But as soon as you see that, but if you've done that before someplace where you applied physics to a problem, all of a sudden the engineering becomes simple for you. That's my, that was me. And, uh, and it became, became something I could see, and, uh, and I, I know that other students are having the same issues. Uh, I've, I've watched the automotive uh, young people who have taken automotive classes. She wanted, to be a, she wanted to be a repair person. She didn't want to go to college. Well, she's an automotive engineer now because she had the chance to work on um, engines and those kind of things, understood what it meant, and now she's doing that because she took that, that experience in the CTE. So, for, so when we talk about these things, we know that there, it's not contrary to None of this is contrary to, advance, to further education in any way. As a matter of fact, it, it gives you a chance to see what you need in order to do that. And um, so I think we, having been able to share that with them was a better idea than, than having this separation because the people look a little bit different or come from a little bit different space. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we know it's important for students to understand the, the context of the content. And so when they're interested in a career pathway, they're suddenly able to understand, oh, this is why I needed to learn geometry, because I'm building a house, and, and that matters. Um, so that can be really helpful, and a lot of the CTE classes will teach very rigorous, high-level content. Um, but the students always don't always see that, hey, I'm doing math right now, or they, they just know they're doing something they're interested in. And so we have examples of where CTE and other elective teachers have paired um, with core content teachers for 
project-based learning opportunities for a variety of different elements, and we'd like to increase that. We also know that some of our pathways do require some college or full degrees after high school. Um, some students will leave with industry credentials where they could go straight to work. It's about those multiple entry and exit points and making sure that a student is prepared for whatever choice they would like to make after high school. So there are certainly barriers that we're working to, to open up those opportunities for students, but we want students and sometimes more importantly, their parents to understand that having all of the options available, the student's eventually gonna go to work, whether they go to college or not. Um, so we want them to be prepared and make informed choices. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that. And you know, Dr. Reed, I know you, you talk a lot about schools of the future and, and, and reimagining, innovating. I think this is a, an area where we can really think of, be creative, uh, you know, I mean, and to your point, when a kid, motivation itself can be engineered, right? A kid isn't just bored because they just don't know how to learn. Uh, and so showing them why it's relevant and practical uh, could help with that. So, I, you know, go ahead. So one of the things we talked about in cabinet, actually leadership team last week, was at the elementary level, a school-wide enrichment model. And it comes from Len Rizzulli's research. And one of the things that I think is so powerful at the elementary is my experience, we had young engineers that was a part of that, young aviators, um, young welders, right? Like there, there's a way, I think we don't explicitly fund CTE at elementary, which is what often has kept CTE at high school. And if we don't think about it as an explicit funding stream, but rather a seeding of mm -hmm. ideas and opportunity, it absolutely fits at elementary. There's just no question. And when I think about um, secondary and our access, I think we really need to think the most fundamental resource we need to think about using differently is time. And as I'm looking at how we schedule, right, and we have such different schedules even across the division, and when you think about it, every student, honestly, there's, CTE is like fabulous, right? Like the opportunity to look at um, the plumbing, or I, I met the young woman at the Fate House with Ms. Keys Gamara um, and several of the others of you I know that were there, uh, Ms. Darnett Kovacs, we were, I mean, she took us around the house and showed us how the tile worked in the bathroom, right, and how they laid out the, uh, I mean, how they made the turn of the hardwood on the stairs. I mean, it's not unlike physics, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I love physics as math, poetry, and motion, right? <laughs> so I love physics. Um, so those opportunities are in every experience we have, right? We just, um, so I think as we reimagine those schools of the future, we have to think about how we use time differently. It's not just always money, it's our time. And then how do we have those opportunities to independently practice the knowledge we've learned and demonstrate that in a way that demonstrates understanding of the core knowledge that we're learning. And it's, um, those are the powerful performance-based activities that um, I think we're poised, I think, right now to talk about in our strategic planning process. I believe our community will come around that and we can align our efforts to get there. So I'm excited about it. Okay, great. So we'll see where that unfolds in the strategic plan process and hope that CTEC is part of those town halls and you know community collaborations that are going to unfold. We were just talking about this in the morning. Um, so y'all watch out for that schedule to just be a voice in that conversation. Um, great. And then the last set of questions, I mean, just one question I had was, relatedly, so what have been the biggest blockers and barriers? So right now we're imagining the strategic plan. We're trying to build it. You know, Sloan shared with us that we have uh, Joe Thompson, who's going to be kind of looking at the overlaps. But I, you had a long list of recommendations in every different dimension. Um, you know, uh, it's w God help us to get there. But <laughs> assuming, you know, knowing how the pace of our system, I, I am I am wondering what you guys have identified to be maybe the top one to three blockers in doing this work that we can help try to address. Okay, I I, th I think I would I would need a minute to really prioritize, mm -hmm. but immediately finding teachers in such really specific professional certification areas, career switchers, trades, health and medical, IT, finding people that have that level of skill that we can credential them, mm -hmm. who will come teach, is is a huge challenge. 
Um, the schedule and the time, as Dr. Reed just spoke about, is certainly a challenge getting the right student. But then it's, it's access, and, and we certainly want equity of that access, but it's also making sure we're getting the right students in the seats that we have um, so that students are there because they're interested in that career. And it's okay if they find out this isn't what I thought it was. But making sure they're there for the right reasons and we're using those resources wisely. And then our, our big initiative is expanding work-based learning um, and making sure that all students get work-based learning experiences during high school, whether it's an internship or apprenticeship or, or something like that, um, we think is also critical. Again, help them with that context. Mm -hmm. Can you just elaborate on that one last, the, the piece you said about getting the right kids? Do you mean as opposed to kids who just want to... I mean, Take. I was an academy <laughs> administrator, yeah. right? So just examples. I mean, we would have kids that were, were sent to us um, for various reasons. We would have kids who, I don't really care about this. I'm just here because my friend's here. I'm here because my boyfriend's here. Or, I took culinary because I heard you get to eat every day. And, <laughs> you know, life skills, important sure. classes to take at your base school. Our highest level classes, we need to make sure that, you know, the credential ending, licensure ending courses, that students are there because they want to pursue that path so that we're using our seats. And it's not a matter of can a, a student, an English language learner or a student with disabilities do this? Absolutely. We just want to make sure they have the support they need and they're in the right courses to pursue, proceed along that pathway. Mm -hmm. And can you just remind us what that vetting process is right now? There is there not one. one. It's just a wait list? Correct. They, it's open access, open registration, and it's a lottery. Something to think about, yeah. Dr. Reed? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And again, for it's, that, it's that yeah. exposure, I think. I think having, giving the kids an opportunity to just know what's available and, and, and being able to convince the parents that this is a, a good track for them at the same time. No matter where they, don't, don't assume because it's something that doesn't look like you that it's something different. It is something that, that they may have developed a passion for. If they see another person, whether it's a business person or a teacher, with a similar passion, you may be there, maybe to get them that way. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was saying. Thank you so much. Okay, seeing no other first-time comments, I'll take my comment, and that will leave us just about at the end of the meeting. So I think it would be really helpful for our career and tech ed um, staff and committee to help us redefine what career preparedness and success means. And so a lot of times, you know, we're talking about the diplomas and those career pathways. And this is something, you know, that you were talking about, Dr. Reed, when you first came on board is what are the, like, can we back map what it takes to get to that end point? And how are we educating our students and families about that pathway? So I think if you could really educate us around, you know, what is it going to take to get a student to a certain diploma and that all the diplomas are valid and have value, that would be really great. I think it's interesting that we're talking about getting earlier exposure. I would argue that we do some of that in different ways. I mean, honestly, even testing for our advanced academic programs in second grade is a way that we are creating pathways for some students and some not for some students. So I think that that practice is already there. It's just how can we make it more open and expanded. I think the trades for tomorrow, I would love to see us prioritize that. I mean, there are jobs available right here where students live. So how can we, I mean, it sounds like we're on the way with Teach for Tomorrow, which is great. But um, one idea that I'll share too I've had is, can, and this is a question in conjunction for our assistant soup for facilities, could we issue our RFPs for renovations and construction to include space for hands-on student learning? that is OSHA compliant and all the other stuff to keep it safe. But we are just, I think, you know, Dr. Rita, a mantra you've said is, you know, plan for the future and stop planning for the past. We're never gonna have enough space. We're never gonna have enough money. We have construction sites where our students are. Let's bring the instructor or, or something and make that part of the competitive RFP process. Um, and then we're not also figuring out how to transport these students and how to make it fit into that three period time um, crunch. I also wanna say, I just found this amazing resource about dyslexia and since it's Dyslexia Awareness Month there's an um, initiative called Made for Dyslexia and it positions dyslexia as having the skills for the jobs of the future. Um, so much so that LinkedIn actually now has a, a, a skill you can choose for dyslexic thinking. 
So I sent um, the link to, to some folks, but I think also how can we, you know, talk to our students with different abilities about how their jobs can be fulfilled with their strengths. Um, I would love, you know, the committee did a great, um, included with the previous report, the breadth of all the programs, and that, that chart was so helpful because it did show the disparities in access, so um, I hope that Dr. Reed, you can look at that again. And the last thing I just want to mention is, you know, the partnerships. We have such great partnerships, but I do wonder, is it like so many, and there's like so many to, to manage and make sure, you know, they're fully fleshed out? Like, do we get a better bang for that investment buck of, of, of um, relationship development if we had bigger partnerships um, in some places. And finally, oh, this is the last thing I'll say. It's like, this is the whole thing. All the career preparedness workforce development, this is the thing. So as much as we can unsilo it, like this is the answer. So I hope that we can do some of that in, with the strategic plan coming in and other, other things. Thank you. So I don't know if you have any other comments you want to respond, and you could even just give us some closing remarks if you want. <laughs> Ms. Ms. Mayor, and I don't know if you saw oh, my hand. I didn't. I saw it when I, before I started talking. I didn't see it up. Um, Mr. Parker, did you have a response before we? I, no, I, I, um, I, we, we look for innovative ideas to try to, to, try to do things like you, that you said. And, uh, and some of the things that, that you, you spoke about are certainly things I think we, we should that are, how can I say this, that are uh, budget friendly, that we could do and still, and still achieve these things. I think that was the comment someone gave me one time. Think about budget friendly things, Joe. And, uh, and, but I think in, in doing the things that we are, we are talking about, some of those things are truly budget, budget friendly with volunteers could be involved to do some of those things. And that's what I, what I see about those, I'm sorry. No, thank you. And Dr. Reed? And I, one of the things I, I'm learning as I get to know the community is we actually had um, business partners that like Bo or not well Boeing was a significant one but Microsoft also that matched volunteer hours of their workers right as part of a charitable contribution so they were actually looking for spaces to be part of a volunteer culture so I would be excited to explore that possibility in the Northern Virginia region as well there may be corporations that actually encourage and incentivize uh, staff to be out doing the type of work we actually would love to see them do. We actually worked with Microsoft engineers K-12 in classrooms and um, it was incentivized by Microsoft and same with Boeing. So I, I just think, I bet there are those opportunities maybe that, um, and the other thing I just wanted to put a pin in, I'm learning that new term, it must be in Northern Virginia or a fine point too. <laughs> is this idea of, I really, while I enjoy the idea of after school activities, I don't know if they're as accessible for all students um, if they're not in the school day. So that's why when I shared about the school-wide enrichment model, those activities actually happen bell to bell so that there's not a bus or some kind of other transportation requirement. Does that make sense? Like I just really would encourage us to think about that as a priority. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Yep. Okay, it seems that our last comment will be from Ms. Keys Gamara. Thank you, and I actually will be brief. I absolutely love these programs. My uh, two of my sons very got several certifications in um, for computer skills, etc. I highly love these things. The greatest problem or um, obstacle that I see is equitable access. Um, and when we look at the fact that these programs are not available in every corner of Fairfax, then we're looking at students that have to uh, count in travel time. So I'm saying this, Dr. Reed, so that perhaps we can put on our radar uh, thinking about how we can make these programs available more widely. Um, it does depend on where you live right now. Um, and I know that there are limits to what we can do and, and, and there's nothing intentional about the placement that we have had with these programs, but going forward, um, I'd, I'd like for us to really look at how that might be expanded. And perhaps this is a great time to talk about it since, uh, we're looking at the strategic plan as well. So that is my primary concern. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure that that was on our radar. Thank you, Ms. Kiskamara. 
Okay, with that, we have, we'd really, I'd really like to stick with our, our plan agenda. Um, well, I need to leave, so would someone else please like to take over to finish managing the meeting? Yeah, that was the reason why we had planned to be at 345, so I do need to leave as other people have as well. Uh, yes, at 345. So um, with that, I would like to, I would like to thank you for, for being here and for sharing this update, and um, do we have seven? Okay, great. Would someone like to take over? Thank you, Ms. Omesha. I appreciate it. Excuse me? Oh, okay. Oh, do you oh. want to just, do you want to just do, I, well, I, fine, clean up. I just need a minute to clean oh, up. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank so, you. Um, Thank on. you. Thanks. Um, you know, yeah, we do have the time left that we published for the public, and I'm glad we've got quorum. Um, you know, Dr. Reed, when we hired you, one of the things that you really emphasized was how do we reimagine a 21st century education, and I, I think about it as all of us have been sharing our feedback to the CTE report, I really, and Ms. Keith Kamara talked about um, the strategic plan, I just think it's really important to put that emphasis here right now as we're closing up this portion of the work session. Um, I mentioned it, others have mentioned it, um, I don't know when we as a division have really examined all of our electives. I think we've just continued to kind of offer them and it's sort of like field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. So right now, as Dr. Presidio and many others know, and even all of us who've been parents and even students who have registered um, for Fairfax County course offerings, if it's not offered, they're not gonna take it. But we're not going to offer it if we don't think students are going to take it. So it becomes this kind of, you know, chicken and the egg dilemma of, you know, when, how do we maybe start engaging with our students? Maybe we pilot at certain base schools where they, as Ms. Keys Gamar noted, um, many of our schools are not near these amazing academies. And so maybe start piloting at some of those where principals are saying, I think there'd be demand for a course in pre-engineering or in you know cybersecurity and coding, things that we just really haven't built out. So I, I wanted to kind of just put that out for you all as we engage in this work that this is where we can knit together sometimes our siloed conversations and they actually all do come together. But if we really are intentful in reimagining education, I will say I think that my three sons, not to cite a film or a TV show from what the 1950s, but um, you know, they, they received an incredibly rigorous education level, uh, our education here in Fairfax High Schools, but the course offerings looked almost no different than when my husband and I were in school, which then I would venture to guess may not have been too much, too different from what our grandparents had and so on, so. Time, Ms. McLaughlin. Yeah, Good. thank you. Thanks. All right, Ms. Cohen. I just wanted to add, I think it is like, you're exactly right. In my brain, we've come full circle back to strategic planning conversation from this morning. Um, that this is all portrait of a graduate. Like, what do we want our kids to walk out of here? And using the business community to say, here's what your graduates are lacking, and here's what we need. This is like the perfect thing. But two areas that I think make it super difficult. One is that I think we don't have as much SPED support in these CTEs offerings. And there are some kids for whom this is so life-changing to feel successful at school, but we don't have the supports built in to allow them to participate, um, just, like, just like the advanced courses. The other I would say about the room and the schedule and trying to rethink what that looks like, right now, some of the ways that kids, like m my own child could only participate in the CTEs they have because we paid $380 in the summer to take online French yep. so that they could free up a whole year's worth of course. So like, do we, again, that's part and parcel, like, do we offer more robust summer planning, summer courses that allows kids to get some of those out of the way, but not charge 380, that is a huge barrier even for our family. So all of that ties in access and, you know, room, and again, what's the ultimate goal? And for a long time it's been, you know, the peak of academic performance, which is awesome for so many kids and not awesome for a lot of other kids. Want a response? One of the things that uh, 
in my experience I have been a party to is adding a class period to the high school day. Um, because often you're able then to take a CTE course or that advance the fourth year French course and your music course. Um, because sometimes if you have a forced choice, um, students don't always get to take their passion course, if that makes sense. And I think if we're talking about well-rounded students and we're talking about the opportunity within Bell to Bell to take those um, elective courses that really feed their soul and have um, an experience that really influences their life course. And um, we found adding just a course in the school schedule um, actually doubled our enrollment in electives, particularly CTE and music, because um, students were able to take that without getting there at ODARC 30 for jazz band or um, early choir or, um, you know, let me think, what were the other, some of the uh, world languages are having um, avid courses outside the school day. Uh, really, if there was that extra period, you could take care of those things bell to bell because we saw a huge inequity. Students weren't able to take a leadership class during the day if they couldn't afford to take a required in the summer, which cost money, right? So if you didn't have the money to pay for that course, you were kind of locked out of certain courses within the academic year. And so I think when we think about um, equitable access, we have to look at kind of back the camera up, if that makes sense, and what is it about how we spend our day that is getting in the way and our location, right? Where are the courses offered? But really, it's how do we spend our time during the day? Because a lot of kids can't add more time either early or late to their day. Um, so I, I think that those are all things that as we go through the strategic plan, if those are values that begin to surface, then we're going to have to think about, because um, there's a cost attached to that in terms of adding staff, um, and there's a cost to not doing it in terms of who gets to access program. Anyone else for a go back? Okay. Um, okay, don't hate me. I'm gonna take less than the two minutes, but I, I, so on a related note, I was gonna ask earlier too, what, have we had road, I mean, is there any room for making some of this credit eligible, uh, Sloan? I don't know if you guys have ever looked into whether it's CTE opportunities or um, even ACE classes for kids to be able to satisfy certain requirements for their diplomas? Well, CTE courses taken in the high school, students are obviously earning credits for those. Additional courses that a student might take, like if we were to do something through ACE, mm -hmm. yeah, that would be the goal is to try to make those experiences, have more flexibility to make more of those experiences credit eligible. Just like work-based learning, Right, again, experiential learning, trying to get students real world hands on experience and giving students, you know, course credit for that. But I'm even thinking like say that a kid takes an engineering CTE opportunity, mm -hmm. could that satisfy like a science requirement? It would depend on the level of course. So I mean there's a whole like set of criteria that we have to go through um, to make sure based on the state standards of quality that we can assign graduation credit requirements to courses okay. based on what's taught, course content. But yes, for some courses it could. Okay, but we don't, right? Like it, a, across disciplines like that? For, for example, if a kid wants to earn the advanced diploma and they're in this bind that was just being described, right? I, I mean, Yes, we do have some classes like that. I mean, I'd have to, Yeah. I, I wasn't following necessarily the specific example, so I don't know off the top of my head if, if you know, no we could fix, yeah. if we could fix that particular problem, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that might be another area just to look at mm -hmm. what's the furthest, more, you know, for, for the, furthest most point we can reach that right. is inclusive of these opportunities. Right, right, yeah, no, we want to provide as much flexibility for students as possible to meet graduation requirements based on courses that they're interested in taking. Right. Yeah, and then what's the barrier to the ACE courses counting for credit? Well, it's going to be seat time hours is going to be one of the issues, right? So, yeah, licensed staff, so. Okay, I think that's something to explore to the points that were just raised. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys, I'll leave you. That's it. So we're three minutes <laughs> until four. Uh, thank you, guys. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you, Abrar. Thank you, everyone.